World of Warcraft, Rise of the Horde, written by Christy Golden, narrated by Jay Linder. Prologue. The power the stranger radiated swirled in glorious hues and vibrations, flowing like a cape behind him, encircling his mighty head with light like a crown. The voice was audible in both the ears and the mind, and raced along the blood like a sweet song long forgotten and now suddenly recalled. What he offered was tempting, was exciting, and made the heart ache with yearning, but still, but still, there was something. When he had gone, the leaders of the Eridar turned to one another and spoke softly, the words intended for their minds alone. It is little enough to ask for what he offers us, said the first. He stretched in the physical world and in the metaphysical one, sending forth echoes of his strength. Such power, murmured the second, lost in thought. He was the elegant one, the beautiful one, and his essence was glorious and radiant, and he speaks the truth. What he showed us will come to pass. No one can lie in such a telling. The third was silent. What the second had said was true. The method by which this powerful being had demonstrated the truth of what he offered could not be falsified. They all knew that. Still, this entity, this Sargeris, there was something about him that Velen misliked. Velen's fellow leaders were also his friends. He was particularly close to Kil'jaeden, the most powerful and decisive of the three. Friends they had been down the years that had slipped by unnoticed by beings beyond the reach of time. That Kil Jaden was inclined to accept the offer carried more weight with Velen than Archimond's opinion, which, though usually sound, could occasionally be swayed by appeals to his vanity. Velen thought again of the image shown to them by Sargeras, worlds for them to conquer, and more importantly, to explore and investigate. For above all, the Eridar were curious. For being so powerful, knowledge was what meat and drink were to the lesser beings, and Sargeras offered them a tantalizing glimpse into what could be theirs if they would only, only swear their loyalty to him, only pledge the same for their people. As usual, our Velen is the cautious one, said Archimond. The words could have been a compliment. Instead, they struck Velen as condescending. He knew what Archimond wanted, and Velen knew the other viewed his hesitancy as nothing more than an obstacle to what he, Archimond, craved at this moment. Velen smiled. Yes, I am the cautious one, and sometimes my caution has saved us as much as your decisiveness, Kil'jaeden, and your instinctive impetuosity, Archimond. Both of them laughed, and for a moment, Velen was warmed by their affection. Then they quieted, and he sensed that they, at least, had already made up their minds. Velen felt his heart sink as he watched them go, hoping that he would make the right decision. The three of them had always worked well together, their diverse personalities serving to balance one another. The result was harmony and peace for their people. He knew that Kil'jaeden and Archimon truly wanted what was best not only for themselves, but for those they led. He shared that sentiment, and always before, they had reached an agreement on such things. Velen frowned. Why did the confident, appealing Sargeras unsettle him so? The others were obviously inclined to accept the offer. Sargeras had told them that the Eridar were exactly what he had been searching for, a strong, passionate, proud people who would serve him and advance a cause that would bring all worlds everywhere together. He would enhance them, he said. He would change them, he would make them better, give them gifts that the universe had never seen before, for indeed, the universe had never before brought together the powers that Sargeras claimed and the uniqueness that was the Eridar, and what Sargeras had told them would indeed come to pass. And yet, and yet, Velen went to the temple, where he had often gone before when troubled. Others were there this night, sitting in a circle around the single pillar in the room that bore the precious Adamal crystal. The artifact was ancient, so ancient that none among the Eridar could remember its origins any more than they could remember their own. Legend had it that it was a gift bestowed upon them long ago. The crystal had enabled them to expand both their mental abilities and their knowledge of the universe's mysteries. 
It had been used in the past for healing, for conjuration, and, as Velen hoped to use it this night, for visions. Respectfully, he went forward and touched the triangular crystal. The warmth of it, like a small animal nestled in his hand, calmed him. He breathed deeply, letting the familiar power penetrate him, then dropped his hand and returned to the circle. Velen closed his eyes. He opened every part of him that he could receive, body and mind and magical intuition. At first, what he saw seemed to only confirm what Sir Jairus had promised. He saw himself standing with Archimonde and Kil Jaden, lords not only of their own noble and proud people, but of countless other worlds. Power shimmered around them, power that Velen knew would be as intoxicating as any liquor he might sip. Shining cities were theirs, along with the inhabitants of those cities, prostrating themselves before the three with cheers and cries of adoration and loyalty. Technology such as Velen had never dreamed of awaited his exploration. Tomes and strange tongues were translated for him, revealing magic hitherto unimagined and untold. It was glorious, and his heart swelled. He turned to look at Kil Jaden, and his old friend smiled. Archimonde put a friendly hand on his shoulder, then Valen looked down at himself and cried out in horror. His body was now gargantuan, but twisted and distorted. Smooth blue skin was now black and brown and gnarled, like some once noble tree, disfigured and diseased. Light radiated from him, true, but not the pure light of powerful positive energy, but a sickly green. Frantically, he turned to behold his friends, his fellow leaders of the Eridar. They, too, had been transformed. They, too, retained nothing of what they had been, but were now Minari. The Eridar word for something horrifically wrong, Something twisted and unnatural and defiled slammed into his mind with the force of a shining sword. He cried out again, and his knees buckled. Velen pulled his gaze away from his tormented body, searching for the peace and prosperity and knowledge Sargeras had promised him. He beheld only atrocities. Where before him had been an adoring crowd, now he saw only mutilated corpses or bodies that, like his, like Kiljadens, like Archimon, had been transformed into monsters. Among the dead and the distorted capered beings that Velen had never before seen, strange dogs with tentacles sprouting from their backs, tiny, twisted figures that danced and capered and laughed at the carnage, deceptively beautiful creatures, their wings outstretched behind them, who surveyed what had been wrought with delight and pride. Where their cloven hooves fell, the earth died. Not just the grass, but the soil itself. All that gave life was obliterated, sucked dry. This, then, was what Sargeras planned to do with the Eridar. This was the enhancement he had spoken of so glowingly. If Velen's people allied with Sargeras, they would become these monstrous things, these Minari. And somehow, Velen understood that what he was witnessing was not a single incident. It was not just this one world that would fall. It wasn't even a dozen, or a hundred, or a thousand. If he threw his support behind Sargeras, everything would be destroyed. This legion of Minari would keep moving forward, aided by Kil Jaden and Archimonde, and, may all that was good and pure help him, Velen. They would not stop until everything in existence was scoured and blackened as this patch of ground that Velen viewed through blurred vision. Was Sargeras insane? Or worse, did he understand this and still crave it? Blood and liquid fire poured over everything, rained down upon him, burning him and spattering him until he fell to the earth and wept. The vision mercifully vanished, and Velen blinked, trembling. He was now alone in the temple, and the crystal glowed comfortingly. He was grateful for that balm. It had not happened, not yet. What Sargeras had told them was indeed true. The Eridar would be transformed, and their three leaders would be offered power, knowledge, domination, near godhood, and they would lose everything they held dear, would betray those that they had vowed to protect, to do it. Velen ran a hand across his face, relieved to find it damp only with sweat and tears and not the fire and blood of his vision. Not yet, anyway. Was it even possible to halt this, or to mitigate the destruction the Legion wrought in any way? The answer floated back to him, as reviving and sweet as a draft of dear water in a desert. Yes. 
They came at once, responding to the emotion and his mental plea. It was but the matter of a few moments to brush their minds and let them see what he had seen, feel what he had felt. For a brief instant, he knew they shared his sentiments, and hope swelled within him. There was yet a chance. Archimonde frowned. This is not a glimpse into the future that we can verify. It is only your hunch. Velen stared at his old friend, then turned his eyes to kill Jaden. Kill Jaden was not bound by his vanity as Archimonde was. He was decisive and wise. Archimond is right, Kill Jaden said smoothly. There is no veracity here, only an image in your own mind. Velen looked at him, pain welling inside him. Gently, sorrowfully, he detached his thoughts from theirs. Now, what was in his mind and heart stayed there. He would never again share it with these two, who had once been like extensions of his own soul. Kill Jaden took the withdrawal as surrender, which was as Velen intended, and smiled as he placed a hand on Velen's shoulder. I do not want to give up what I know to be positive and good and true for what I fear might be unpleasant, he said. Nor, I think, do you. Velen could not risk a lie. He merely looked down inside. Once, Kiljaden and even Archimonde would have seen through such a feeble facade, but now their thoughts were not on him. They were thinking about the apparently limitless power about to be bestowed upon them. It was too late to sway them. These two once great beings were Sargeras's playthings. They were on their way to becoming Minari. Velen knew with terrifying certainty that if they guessed that he was not with them, they would turn upon him with deadly consequences. He had to survive, if only to do what precious little he could to save his people from damnation and destruction. So he nodded, but spoke nothing, and it was decided that the three leaders of the Eridar would ally with the great Sargeras. Archimond and Kiljaden departed quickly to make the necessary preparations to welcome their new lord. Velen grieved over his impotence. He wanted to save all of his people, as he had sworn to do, but he knew that was impossible. Most would trust in Kiljaden and Archimond and follow them to their doom. But there were a few who thought, as he did, who would forsake everything merely upon his word. They would need to. Their home of Argus would shortly be destroyed, devoured by the madness of a demonic legion. Those who would survive would have to flee. But flee where? Velen stared at the Adamok crystal, despair flooding through him. Sargeras was coming. There was no place on this world to hide from such a being. How, then, would he escape? Tears blurred his vision as he gazed at the crystal. Surely it was his tears that made it seem to shimmer and pulse. Velen blinked. No, it was no trick of the light seen through tears. The crystal was glowing, and before his shocked gaze, it rose slowly from its pedestal and floated until it was directly before him. Touch it, a voice in his head said softly. Trembling, awestruck, Velen reached out a strong blue hand, expecting to feel the familiar warmth of the quiescent prism. Energy raced through him, and he gasped. In intensity, it was almost as powerful as the dark energy that had surged through him in the vision. But this was as pure as that had been foul, as light as that had been dark, and Velen suddenly felt hope and strength well inside him. The strange glowing field about the Adamot crystal grew, stretched upward, assumed a shape. Velen blinked, almost blinded by the radiance, but not wanting to look away. You are not alone, Velen of the Eridar, the voice whispered to him. It was soothing, sweet, like the sound of flowing water and the rush of a summer wind. The radiance faded slightly, and hovering before Velen was a being unlike any he had ever seen. It seemed to be comprised of living light. Its center was a soft golden hue, the outer radius a glowing, soothing violet, Strange metallic-looking glyphs swirled around the center, calming and hypnotic in a spiral dance of color and light. It continued to speak inside his mind, a sound that seemed to Velen to be the light itself given voice. We, too, have sensed the impending horrors about to befall this and other worlds. We strive to keep the balance, and what Sargeras is planning will rip apart everything. Utter chaos and ruination will descend and the things that are good and true and pure and holy will be lost beyond recovery. Who, what, Velen could not even form the question in his mind, 
so swept away was he by the being's glory. We are the Naru, the radiant entity said. You may call me Kaur. Velen's lips curved around the words, and as he whispered them aloud, Naru, Kaur, he tasted the sweetness of them, as if speaking the names granted him some of their very essence. This is where it all begins, Kaur continued. We cannot stop it, for your friends have free will, but you have reached out with an anguished heart to say what you can, and therefore we will do what we can. We will save those of you whose hearts reject the horror of what Sargeras offers. What do I do? Again tears filled Velen's eyes, tears of relief and joy this time. Gather those who will listen to your wisdom. Go to the highest mountain in the land on the longest day of the year. Take the Adamok crystal with you. Long, long ago did we give it to you. It is how we will find you again. We will come and bear you away. For a moment, a flicker of doubt, like a shadow flame, burned in Velen's heart. He had never even heard of such beings, of light as the Naru. And now this entity, this Kaior, was asking him to steal his people's most sacred object. They even claimed that it was they who had given it to the Eridar in the first place. Perhaps Kil'jaeden and Archimon had the right of it. Perhaps Velen's vision was nothing more than his fear manifesting itself. But even as the twisting thoughts raced through his mind, he knew them to be the last vestiges of a broken-hearted yearning for everything to be as it once was. Before things had changed so horribly. Before Sargeras. He knew what he had to do and he bowed his head before the glorious, dancing being of light. The first and most trusted ally that Velen summoned was Talgoth, an old friend and one who had aided him in the past. All rested upon this friend, who would be able to move unwatched where Velen could not. Talgoth was skeptical at first, but when Velen linked their minds and showed him the dark vision he had been granted, Talgoth quickly agreed. Velen said nothing of the Naru and their offer of aid, as he himself did not know what form that aid would take. He only assured Talgoth that there was a way to escape that destiny if Talgoth trusted him. The longest day of the year was drawing close. With all the discretion he could muster while Akraman and Kil'jaeden were obsessing over Sargeras, Velen sent out tendrils of thought to those he trusted. Others were gathered by Talgoth, coming to Velen's side in defense of themselves and their people. Velen then turned his attention to weaving the subtlest of magic webs about the two traitors he once held as dear friends so that their attention was not caught by the frantic activity occurring just beyond their vision. With startling speed and yet an agonizing slowness, an intricate web was created. When at last the day came, the Eridar, who had chosen to follow Velen, assembled atop the tallest mountain of their ancient world. Velen saw that their number was sickeningly small. They numbered only in the hundreds, these who were the only ones Velen truly trusted. He did not dare risk all by contacting those he thought would possibly turn against him. Only a short time ago, Velen had taken the Adamok crystal from its place. He had spent the last few days fabricating a false one so that no alarm would be sounded when it was discovered missing. He had carved it from a simple rock crystal with the utmost care, casting a glamour upon it so that it would glow. But it remained dead to the touch. If someone brushed this false crystal with his or her fingers, the theft would be revealed. The true Adamal crystal he now held close to his heart as he watched his people climbing the mountain, their strong legs and sure hooves finding easy purchase. Many had already arrived and looked at him expectantly, the question clear in their eyes if not on their lips, how they were wondering, would they escape? How indeed, Velen thought. For a moment he despaired, but then he recalled the radiant beings who had linked its thoughts with his. They would come, he knew it. In the meantime, every moment that passed meant that they were closer to being discovered, and so many were not here yet, not even Talgoth. Restalon, another old and trusted friend, smiled at Velen. They will be here soon, he said reassuringly. Velen nodded. More than likely, Restalon was right. There had been no sign that his old friends and now enemies, Kil'jaeden and Archimon, had been alerted to his outrageously bold plan. They had been far too consumed with anticipating their future power. And yet, and yet, the same deep instinct that had warned him to mistrust Sargeras now nagged at his mind. Something was not right. He realized he was pacing, and there they were. Talgoth and several others had cleared a rise, smiling and waving, and Velen exhaled in relief. He started down to meet them when the crystal he held sent a powerful surge through his body. 
His blue fingers clenched tightly around the gem as his mind opened to its warning. Velen's knees buckled as the mental stench assaulted him. Sargeras had already begun. He had already started creating his hideous legion, taking Eridar, who had been foolish or trusty enough to listen to Kil'jaeden and Archimonde, and distorting them into the Minari Velen had seen in his vision. There were thousands of Minari, of every physical description and ability, lying just beyond his sight and sensing. He turned a shocked gaze to Talgoth, suddenly aware that the taint was emanating from his old friend as well as from the multitude, the legion, of monsters who lurked beyond his sight. A prayer wrenched from the utter depths of his despairing soul shivered up in his mind. Kior, help us. The Minari were scrambling up the mountain now, sensing that they had been exposed and closing in like hungry predators for the kill. Except Velen knew that death would be preferable to what these distorted Eridar would do to him and those who followed him. At wit's end, Velen gripped the Adamal crystal and thrust it upward to the sky. As if the heavens themselves were cracking open, a pure shaft of radiant white light appeared. Its glory shone directly onto the crystalline prism, and before Velen's stunned gaze splintered the white light into seven distinct rays of various hues. Pain stung Velen as the crystal he held shattered. The sharp edges sliced his fingers. He gasped and instinctively released the fractured crystal, watching enraptured as the pieces hovered in the air, each transforming itself into a perfect sphere and taking on seven radiant hues of the light that had once been a single perfect shaft of pure white radiance. At that precise instant, Togoth raced toward him, naked loathing in his gaze. He slammed into the crystal of multicolored lights as if into a stone wall and tumbled backwards. Velen whirled and saw the Minari descend, snarling, drooling, their claws scrabbling on a wall made of only light, which yet protected Velen and his people. A deep, thrumming sound raced along Velen's nerves, more felt than heard. He looked upward and on this day of wonder saw something that surpassed even the miracle of the seven stones of light. He beheld what looked at first like a descending star, so bright he could almost not bear looking upon it. As it drew closer, he saw that it was nothing so elusive as a star in the night skies, but a solid structure, its center as soft and round as the orbs, adorned with jutting, crystalline triangles. Velen wept openly as a mental touch brushed his mind. I am here, as I promised I would be. Prepare to abandon this world, Prophet Velen. Velen extended his arms upward, almost like a child begging a loving parent to be swept up into an affectionate embrace. The orb above him pulsed, and then Velen felt himself being lifted gently into the air. He floated upward, and saw that the others too were rising toward the vessel, for such Velen now understood to be though it also vibrated with a living essence that he could not yet comprehend. In the midst of the quiet joy, Velen heard the shrieks and screams and bellows of the Minari as their prey escaped. The base of the ship opened, and a few seconds later, Velen found himself standing on something solid. He knelt on the floor, if such it could be called, and watched as the rest of his people floated toward safety. When the last one had arrived, Velen expected the door to close and the ship the ship that was made of metal that was not metal, flesh that was not flesh, and what Velen suspected was the very essence of Kior to depart. Instead, he felt a whisper in his mind, the crystals, where there was one, there are seven. Recover them, for you will need them. Velen leaned over the opening and extended his hands. With shocking speed, the seven crystals surged upward toward him, striking his palms so hard he gasped. He gathered them close, ignoring the incredible heat they emanated, and threw himself backward. At once, the door disappeared as if it had never been present. Clutching the seven Adamal crystals, his mind stretched so far he felt as he was brushing the edge of madness. Velen hung suspended for an endless instant between hope and despair. Had they done it? Had they escaped? From his position at the head of the army, Kill Jaden had an unobstructed view as the mountain was sworn by his slaves. For a glorious moment, he tasted victory, almost as sweet as the hunger Sargeras had planted in his mind. Talgath had done his dumb well. It had only been pure luck that Velen had been holding the crystal at the moment of the onslaught. Had he not, his body would be lying on the ground, torn into a handful of fleshy bits. But Velen had been holding the Adamot crystal, and he had been warned.
something had happened. Some strange lights had sprung up protectively around the traitor, and something had come for them. Now as Kiljaden watched, the peculiar vessel shimmered and disappeared. He had escaped. Curse him. Damn him. Felon had escaped. The Minari, whose delight had filled Kiljaden just seconds earlier, were now full of consternation and disappointment. He touched all of their minds. They knew nothing. What was this thing that had come to snatch Velen from Kiljaden's very grasp? Fear now shuddered through Kiljaden. His master would not be pleased with these developments. What now? asked Archimon. Kiljaden turned to look at his ally. We find them, growled Kiljaden. We find them and destroy them, even if it takes a thousand years. Chapter 1 My name is Thrall. The word means slave in the human tongue. And the story behind the naming is a long one, best left for another time. By the grace of the spirits and the blood of heroes before me that runs in my veins, I have become war chief of my people, the orcs, and leader of a group of races known as the Horde. How this came to be too is another tale. The one I wish to set to parchment now, before those who lived it passed to dwell with the honorable ancestors, is a story of my father and those who believed in him and of those who betrayed him, and indeed, all our people. What might have become of us had these events not unfolded? Not even the wise shaman Drek'thar can say. The seeds of fate are many and varied, and no sane being should ever venture down the deceptively pleasant one of, if only. What happened, happened. My people must shoulder both the shame and glories of our choices. This is the tale not of the Horde as it exists today, a loose organization of Orc, Torrent, Forsaken, Troll, and Blood Elf, but of the rise of the very first Horde, its birth, like that of any infant, was marked by blood and pain, and its harsh cries for life meant death to its enemies. For such a grim and violent tale, it begins peacefully enough amid the rolling hills and valleys of the verdant land called Draenor. The heartbeat rhythm of the drums lulled the younger orcs to sleep, but Duartan of the Frostwolf clan was wide awake. He lay with the others on the hard-packed dirt floor of the sleeping tent. A generous padding of straw and a thick cleft of pelt protected him from the chill of the bone-cold earth. Even so, he felt the vibrations of the drumming travel up through the earth and into his own body as his ears were caressed by the ancient sound. How he longed to go out and join them. Duratan would have another summer before he would be able to participate in the Om Rigor, the rite of adulthood. Until that much anticipated event, he would have to accept being shunted off with the children into this large group tent, while the adults sat around the fire and talked of things that were doubtless mysteries and significant. He sighed and shifted on the pelt. It was not fair. The orcs did not fight among themselves, but neither were they particularly sociable. Each clan kept to itself, with its own traditions, styles, and manner of dress, stories, and shaman. There were even variations of dialect that differed so much that some of the orc could not understand one another unless they spoke in the common tongue. They almost seemed as different to one another as the other sentinel race who shared the bounty of the field, forest, and streams, the blue-skinned mysterious Drenai. Only twice a year, spring and autumn, did all the orc clans come together as they were doing now to honor that time when day and night were the same length. The festival had officially started last night at moonrise. The orcs had been gathering at the spot for several days now. The Koshharg celebration had been held on this sacred spot in the land of the orcs called Nagron, Land of Winds, which lie in the benevolent shadow of the Mountain of Spirits, Ashugarn, for as long as anyone could remember. While ritual challenges in combat were not unusual during the festival, true anger or violence had never erupted here. When tempers flared, as they sometimes did when so many were gathered together, the shaman encouraged the parties involved to work it out peaceably, or else they were to leave the whole area. The land in this place was lush and fertile and calming. Duratan sometimes wondered if the land was tranquil because of the willingness of the orcs to bring peace to it, or if the orcs were peaceful because the land was so serene. He often wondered such things, and kept them to himself, for he heard no one else voicing such odd ideas. Duratan sighed quietly, his thoughts racing, his heart thumping an answering rhythm to the voice of the drums outside. Last night had been wonderful, stirring Duratan's soul. 
when the pale lady cleared the dark line of trees, in her waning face but still bright enough to cast a powerful light that was reflected on the blankets of white snow. A cheer had gone up from the throat of every one of the thousands of orcs assembled. Wise elders, warriors in their prime, even children held in their mother's strong arms. The wolves, both companions and mounts to the orcs, had joined in with exultant howls. Then had come feasting. Dozens of beasts had been slain earlier in the season, before the winter had set in, and dried and smoked in preparation for the event. Bonfires had been kindled, their warm light merging with the fey white glow of the lady, and the drumming had begun and had not stopped since. He, like all other children, lying on his cleft hoof pelt, Duratan sniffed dismissively at the term, had been permitted to stay up until he had eaten his fill and the shaman had departed. The shaman of every clan left, once the opening feast had been consumed, to climb Ashugan, which stood careful watch over the festivities, enter its caverns, and be advised by the spirits and their ancestors. Ashugan was impressive, even from a distance. Unlike other mountains, which were irregular and rough in their shape, Ashugan erupted from the ground with the precision and sharp point of a spearhead. It looked like a giant crystal set in the earth. So clean were its lines, and so brightly did it glisten in the sun and moonlight. Some legends told that it had fallen from the sky hundreds of years ago, and it was so unusual that Duratan thought those tales might be right. Interesting though Ashugan might be, Duratan always thought it a bit unfair that the shaman had to stay there for the entire Kosharg festival. The poor shaman, he thought, missed all the fun, but then again he suspected, so did the children. During the day, there were hunts and game playing and retelling of the heroics of the ancestors. Each clan had its own stories. And so in addition to the familiar tales Duratan had heard as a youngling, there were new and exciting adventures to listen to. Entertaining as these were, and as much as Duratan enjoyed them, he burned to know what the adults discussed after the children were drowsing in the sleeping tent, after their bellies were stretched full of good food, and pipes had been smoked and various brews had been shared. He could stand it no longer. Quietly, Duratan sat up, his ears straining for any sounds to indicate that anyone else was awake. He heard nothing and after a long minute, he got to his feet and began to move slowly toward the entrance. It was a long, slow progression in the darkened tent. Sleeping children of all ages and sizes were sprawled everywhere in the tent, and one wrong move could awaken them. His heart racing with excitement at his daring, Duratan stepped carefully between the only faintly glimpsed shapes, placing each large foot with the delicacy of the long-legged marsh bird. It seemed to take an eternity before Duratan finally reached the flat. He stood trying to calm his breathing, reached out, and touched a large, smooth-skinned body standing right beside him. He jerked his hand back with a surprised hiss. What are you doing? Durantan whispered. What are you doing? The other orc shot back. Abruptly, Durantan grinned at how foolish they sounded. Same thing you are, Durantan replied, his voice still soft. All about them, the other slept on. We can either keep talking about it or do it. Duratan could tell by the size of the faint shape in front of him that the orc was a large male, probably close to his own age. He couldn't place the scent or the voice, so it wasn't one of the Frostwolf clan. It was a daring thought, not only to do something so forbidden as to leave the sleeping tent without permission, but to do so in the company of an orc, not of his own clan. The other orc hesitated, the same thoughts no doubt running through his head. Very well, he said at last. Let's do it. Duratan reached out again in the darkness, his fingers brushing the hide of the flap and curling around its edge. The two orc youths pulled back the flap and stepped out into the frosty night. Duratan turned to look at his companion. The other orc was brawnier than he, and stood a bit taller. Duratan was the largest of his age in his clan, and unused to others being taller than he. It was a bit disquieting. His ally in mischief turned to look at him, and Duratan felt himself being assessed. The other nodded, apparently satisfied with what he saw. They did not risk words. Duratan pointed to a tree close to the tent, and silently the two headed for it. For a moment that was probably not as long as it felt, they were in the open, exposed to any adult who chose that instant to turn his head and see them, but they were not spotted. Duratan felt as exposed as if he were in bright sunlight. So powerful was the moon's glow reflected off the crystalline snow and surely the sound of the snow squeaking beneath their feet was as loud as the bellow of an enraged ogre. At last they reached the tree and sank down behind it. Duratan's breath misted as he finally exhaled. 
The other orc turned to him and grinned. I am Orgrim, line of Telkar Doomhammer, of the Blackrock clan, the youth said in a proud whisper. Durotan was impressed. While the Doomhammer line was not the line of a chieftain, it was well known and honored. I am Durotan, line of Garad, of the Frostwolf clan, Durotan replied. Now it was Orgrim's turn to react to the fact that he was sitting with the heir to another clan. He nodded approvingly. For a moment they simply sat, revealing in the glory of their daring. Duratan began to feel the cold and wetness seep through his thick hide cape and got to his feet. Again he pointed at the gathering, and Orgrim nodded. They carefully peered around the tree, straining to listen. Surely now they would hear the mysteries for which they both hungered. Over the crackling sound of the huge bonfire and the deep, steady beating of drums, voices floated to them. The shaman had been kept busy this winter with the fever, Duratan's father Garad said. He reached down and petted the huge white wolf who was drowsing by the fire. The beast, its white coat distinguishing it as a frost wolf, made a soft crooning sound of pleasure. Soon as one of the younglings gets cured, another falls ill. I am ready for spring myself, another male said, standing and tossing another log on the fire. It's been harsh with the animals, too. When we were preparing for the festival, we had a hard time finding kleptos. Klaga makes a delicious soup from the bones, but she refuses to tell us what herb she uses, a third said, glaring at a female who was nursing an infant. The female in question, presumably Klaga, chuckled. The only one who'll get that recipe is this little one when she comes of age, Klaga replied and grinned. Duratan's jaw dropped. He turned his head to stare at Orgrim, who wore a similar expression of stunned dismay. This was what was so important so secret that the children were forbidden to leave the tent to listen to it. Discussions of fevers and soups. In the bright light of the moon, Duratan had no trouble seeing Orgrim's face clearly. The other youth's brows drew together in a frown. You and I could come up with something more interesting than this, Duratan, he said in a low, gruff voice. Duratan grinned and nodded. He was certain of it. The festival lasted for two more days. During the daytime and at night, when the two would sneak out together, they challenged each other to different contests of skill. Racing, climbing, strength, sure-footedness, everything they could think of. And each defeated the other almost as if they had planned on taking turns. When, on the last day, Orgrim loudly called for a fifth challenge to break the stalemate. Something inside Duratan made him speak. Let us not perform common, ordinary challenges, Duratan said, wondering where the words came from even as he uttered them. Let us do something truly different in the history of our people. Orgrim's bright gray eyes gleamed as he leaned forward. What do you suggest? Let us be friends, you and I. Orgrim's heavily muscled jaw dropped. But we are not of the same clan, he said, in a voice that indicated that Duratan might have proposed a friendship between the great black wolf and the mild Talbot. Duratan waved a dismissive hand. We are not enemies, he said. Look around you. The clans come together twice a year, and there is no harm in it. But, my father said it is precisely because we come together so seldom that the peace is kept, Ogrim continued. His brow nodded with concern. Disappointment colored Duratan's words with bitterness. Very well. I thought you braver than the others, Ogrim of the Doomhammer line. But you are no better than they, timid and shy and unwilling to see beyond what has always been done to what is possible. The words had come from his heart, but had Duratan calculated them and honed them for weeks, he could not have chosen better. Orgrim's brown face flushed, and his eyes snapped. I am no coward, he snarled. I back down from no challenge, you upstart frostwolf. He sprang on Duratan then, knocking the smaller orc off his feet, and the two pummeled each other until the shaman needed to be brought in for healing and lecturing on the inappropriateness of fighting in a sacred space. Impetuous boy, scolded the head shaman of the frost wolves, an ancient orc female they called Mother Kashur. You are not too old to be beaten as a disobedient child, young Duratan. The shaman who tended Orgrim muttered similar displeased sounds, but even as blood streamed freely from his nose, and as he watched the shaman heal a wicked gash on Orgrim's brown torso, Duratan grinned. Orgrim caught his gaze and grinned back. The challenge had begun. The final challenge so much more important than races or lifting stones, and neither was willing to admit defeat, to say that a friendship between two youths of different clans was strong. 
Dern had a feeling that this particular challenge would end only when one of them was dead, and perhaps not even then. Chapter 2 I remember when we first encountered the Torn. I remember Karen Bloodhoof's deep voice and calm face. I remember sitting on the ground in a tent that could be broken down and erected with startling speed, and feeling oddly at home. We smoked pipes, shared food and drink, felt the drumming in our bones, and talked. The torrents seemed to me bestial at first, but there was wisdom and humor in them, and by the time the first round of negotiations had been conducted, I knew that the orcs had a rare ally in these half-bovine beings. Night had fallen while we spoke, a soft night befitting of this beautiful land. We left the tent and gazed up at the stars, too numerous to count, a sweet wind caressing our faces. I turned to Drek Thar to ask for his wisdom. To my astonishment, I saw tears on his face glinting in the moon's light. This is how we used to be, my chieftain, he said in a broken voice. He lifted his arms and tilted his head back, calling the wind to embrace him and dry the tears on his strong green face. Close to the earth, close to the spirits, strong in the hunt, gentle with the younglings, knowing our place in the world to be right and just, understanding the balance of taking and giving. The only magic that Torrum practice is the good, clean magic of the earth, and the land reflects that, the way Drenar once reflected our connection. I thought of the Torn's request for aid in fighting their enemy, the vile, filthy centaur. Yes, I feel for them. It will be good to be able to help them, I said. Drekthar laughed, turning his blind eyes to me and seeing more clearly than anyone with sight could. Oh, my young thrall, he said, chuckling still. You do not yet understand. They will help us. Duratan ran as fast as his powerful legs could carry him. His breath came fast and sweat dappled his reddish-brown skin, but he forced himself to keep going. It was summer, and his large, flat feet were bare. The grass was soft beneath him as he ran, and occasionally he would step on the bright purple blossom of a Dasan flower. The scent from the bruised plant, traditionally cultivated for healing, wafted up like a blessing, inspiring him to run even further and faster. Now he was on the fringe of the Terracar forest, pushing forward into its cool, gray-green depths. He had to watch out for the twining roots of the elegant trees, lest he trip over them, and his pace perforce slowed. Soft lights glowed in the green heart of this forest, and the calm it excluded was at a sharp odds with Duratan's need for triumph. He increased his pace, leaping over fallen tree trunks covered with moss, ducking under low-slung branches with the grace of a talbot. His black hair, long and thick and spilling all the way into the middle of his back, flew behind him. His lungs burned and his legs cried out for him to cease, but he ground his teeth and ignored the pleas from his body. He was a frost wolf, the heir to clan chieftaincy, and no black rock would possibly. Duratan heard a fair approximation of a war cry behind him and his heart sank. Orgrim's voice, like Duratan's, was still sinking toward the deep bellow that marked an adult male but even Duratan had to admit it was already impressive. He willed his legs to pump even harder, but they felt as heavy and unmoving as if they had been carved of stone. He watched in dismay out of the corner of his eyes as Ogrim came into his field of vision and then, with a final spurt of energy, raced past him. The black rock orc extended his arm and lunged, managing to hit the tree trunk in the clearing that they had decided represented the goal of the race right before Duratan did. Orgrim kept going for several more strides, as if his powerful legs, once put into motion, were reluctant to stop. Duratan's legs had no such problems, and the heir to the Frostwolf clan fell forward, barely catching himself. He lay face down in the cool, sweet-smelling mossy earth, gasping for air, knowing he should sit up, knowing he should challenge Orgrim again, but too exhausted to do anything other than lie on the forest floor and recover. Beside him, he heard Orgrim doing likewise, and then the other orc youth rolled over on his back and began to laugh. Duratan joined in. The birds and small animals that inhabited the Terracor forest were silent as the two orcs muttered sounds of mirth that, Duratan thought as his lips curled past his still-forming tusks, probably sounded more than a little like the fierce war cries that presaged a hunt. Ha! grunted Orgrim, 
sitting up and punching Duratan in a playful manner. It is little effort to beat a stripling like you, Duratan. You have so much muscle, your brain is starved, Duratan retorted. Skill as is as important as power, but the Blackrock clan wouldn't know about such things. There was no malice in their banter. Their clans had been troubled at first by the friendship between the two youths, but Duratan's stubborn argument that just because something had never been done before did not mean it could not be done amused and impressed the leaders of both clans. It helped that both the Frostwolves and the Blackrocks were traditionally even-tempered orc clans. Had Duratan proposed such a friendship with a Warsong clan member, or a Bone Chewer, for example, known for their intense clan pride and distrust of others, the little flame of friendship would have died quickly. So the elders watched and waited for the novelty to fade and for each youth to return to his rightful place and keep the familiar order that had been established for as long as anyone could recall. They were disappointed. The frost of late winter had given way to spring and now the full blousy warmth of summer and the friendship continued. Duratan knew that they were watched, but as long as no one interfered, he did not object. Duratan closed his eyes and let his fingers spread over the moss. The shaman said that all things had a life, a power, a spirit. They were deeply involved with the spirits of the elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and the spirits of the wilds, and they claimed they could sense the life force in earth and even seemingly dead stone. All Duratan could feel was the cool, slightly moist sensation of moss and the soil beneath his palms. The earth shuddered, his eyes snapped open. He bolted upright, his hand automatically going for the spike club that he constantly carried. Orgrim preferred a heavy metal and wood hammer, the traditional weapon of the Black Rocks, and a simplified version of the legendary hammer that would one day come to him. The two boys exchanged glances. They did not need to speak to communicate. Was the thing that made the earth shake an enormous cleft hoof? With its shaggy pelt that made magnificent blankets and rich red flesh that could feed almost the whole clan? Or was it something more dangerous? What did live in the Terracor forest anyway? They had been here only once before. They got to their feet in unison, their small dark eyes peering into the now ominous seeming dark corners of the close growing trees, searching for whatever had made the noise. Boom. The earth shuddered again. Duratan's heart started to beat faster. If it was a small cleft hoof, maybe they could take it down together and share the spoils with both clans. He glanced over at Orgrim and saw the other's eyes gleam with excitement. Boom. Boom. Crash. Both youths gasped, and then retreated as the noise came closer. A tree only a few yards away from them seemed to splinter before their eyes. The thing that made the noise and so casually dispatched an ancient tree suddenly came into view. It was enormous. It carried a club as big as they were, and it was most definitely not a cleft hoof. And it had seen them. It opened its mouth and bellowed something that was vaguely intelligible, but Duratan wasn't about to waste time figuring out what it had said. Their thoughts as one, the two boys turned and fled. Now Duratan wished desperately that they had not decided to challenge one another to a race earlier, for his legs had not fully recovered. Yet still they moved when he asked it of them, the need for survival lending him energy. How had they wandered so far into ogre territory? And where were the Gron? Duratan imagined one of the ogre's masters forcing its way through the trees as the ogre had towering over ordinary ogres as ogres towered over the orcs. Even more hideous than an ogre, more of the earth than of flesh, and yet so terribly wrong. Its one eye bloodshot and staring as it pointed at Duratan and Ogrim and directed the ogre toward it. He and Ogrim were not yet of the season where they could be initiated into adulthood and permitted to go with the warriors of the clans to hunt the ogres and, on rare occasions, the Gron themselves. They had gone on hunts that their clans had perceived as less dangerous for Talbooks and other easy prey, but Durantan had always yearned for the day when he would be allowed to tackle these fearsome creatures, winning honor for himself and his clan. Now, he wasn't so sure. The earth continued to tremble, and the shouts of the ogre were coming more clearly now. Crush little orcs. Me smash. The roar that followed this almost made his ears bleed. The thing was gaining on them. Despite his brain's panicked orders to his body to run faster, faster, curse you, he could not put any distance between him and the monstrous being that loomed so close 
that its vast shadow almost blotted out what little light filtered through the tree branches. The trees thinned and the light grew brighter. They were close to the edge of the forest now. Duratan kept running and burst into an open space of the meadow, his feet falling again on soft grass. Orgrim was ahead of him, but not by much. Despair washed through Duratan, followed hard by a black wave of fury. They were not yet adults. They had not gone on their first real hunt. They had not danced by the fire with the females. They had not bathed their faces in the steaming blood of their first solo kills. There was so much they had not done. To die a glorious death in battle was one thing, but they were so overpowered by the hideous creature as to make their deaths humorous rather than honorable. Knowing it could cost him precious seconds, but unable to resist the impulse, Duratan turned his head to scream a curse at the ogre before it smashed him as flat as a grain cake with its club. What he saw made his jaw drop. Their rescuers did not utter a sound. They moved in silence, a quiet tide of blue, white, and silver that seemingly sprang out of the very air. Duratan heard the familiar whine of arrows shrieking through the air, and a heartbeat later the ogre's cries that were tinged not with rage, but with pain. Dozens of arrows, tiny things on that massive pale body, sprouted from it, and it halted its deadly progress. It yelled and tried to brush the irritations from its skin. A clear voice rang out. Even though he did not understand the language, Duratan recognized words of power when he heard them, and his skin prickled. Suddenly the sky was filled with lightning, but this was unlike any lightning Duratan had seen, invoked by a shaman. Blue and white and silver energy crackled around the ogre, swirling about it and closing in on it like a net. The monster bellowed again and fell. The earth shook. Now the Drenai, their bodies covered in some sort of metallic plating that reflected the cool hues of magical energies in a display that dazzled Duratan's eyes, dismounted and descended upon the fallen ogre. Blades flashed, more words of power and command were uttered, and Duratan was forced to shut his eyes or be driven mad by the display. At last silence fell. Duratan opened his eyes again to see that the ogre was dead. Its eyes still stared, its tongue protruded from its parted lips, and its body was covered with red blood and black burn marks. So great was the silence that Duratan could hear his own ragged breathing and that of Ogrim. The two looked at each other, stunned by what they had just witnessed. Both had seen the Drenai before, of course, but only at a distance. They came now and then to each clan, ready to trade their carefully crafted tools and weapons and decorative pieces of carved stone in exchange for the thick pelts of forest animals, brightly woven blankets, and raw materials the orcs culled from the land and stone. It had always been an occasion of interest in the clans, but the exchanges only lasted a few hours. The Drenai, blue-skinned, soft-spoken, eerily arresting, did not invite closeness, and no clan leader had ever asked them to stay and share their hospitality. Relationships are cordial, but aloof, and everyone involved seemed to want it that way. Now the leader of the group that had arrived so unexpectedly strode over to Duratan. From his position on the earth, Duratan saw what he had never noticed when he had regarded the Drenai from a distance. Their legs did not go straight from their torsos to the earth. They curved backward like, like a talbuk's, and ended in cloven hooves that were encased in metal from the shiny blue hoof upward. And, yes, it was most definitely a thick, hairless tail that swished back and forth. Now their owner was bending over him, offering a strong blue hand. Duratan blinked, staring a moment longer at the unexpected shape of the Drenai's feet and the reptilian tail, then got to his feet unaided. He looked into a face that bore strange plating on its head, like armor that had grown there. Black hair and a beard flowed over a colorful tavern, and the piercing, glowing eyes were the color of a winter lake. You are injured? The Drenna asked in halting common orcish, his tongue obviously having trouble wrapping itself around the guttural syllables. Only my pride, Duratan heard Ogrim mutter in his clan dialect. He too was somewhat stung. The Drenai had obviously saved both their lives and he was grateful, of course. But they had seen two proud orc youths running from danger. Granted, that danger had been very real. One blow from that gigantic club would have squashed him and Ogrim into two small, crumpled piles. But still, the Drenai may or may not have heard or understood Ogrim. 
Duratan thought he saw the lips curve in a smile. The Drenai glanced skyward, and to his dismay, Duratan realized that the sun was low on the horizon. You too have wandered far from home, and the sun settles to sleep, he said. Which clan do you hail from? I am Duratan of the Frostwolf clan, and this is Orgrim of the Blackrock clan. The Drenai looked startled. Two different clans. Were you challenging one another that you wandered so far from your respective homes? Duratan and Ogrim exchanged glances. Yes and no, Duratan said. We are friends. The Drenai's eyes widened. Friends? From two different clans? Orgrim nodded. Yes, he added, somewhat defensively. It is not traditional, but it is not forbidden. The Drenai nodded, but still looked surprised. He regarded both of them for a moment, then turned to two of his companions and murmured something in his native tongue. Duratan thought the language profoundly musical, like the sound of a stream meandering over stone, or a bird's call. The two Draenei listened intently, then nodded. One took a water skin from his belt, drank deeply, and then began to run with a gait nearly as smooth and swift as a Talbuk's, heading southwest where the Frostwolf glands were. The second raced toward the east, to the Blackrock clan. The Drenai who had been speaking with them turned. They will notify your families that you are well and safe. You will return home tomorrow. In the meantime, I am happy to offer you the hospitality of the Drenai. My name is Restalon. I am the leader of the Guards of Telmor, the town with which both your clans regularly trade. I regret to say I do not remember either of you. But then, the Orc younglings seem a bit leery of us when we come to your territory. Ogrim bristled. I am afraid of no one, and nothing. Restalon smiled a bit. You ran from the ogre. Orgrim's brown face darkened, and his eyes glinted angrily. Duratan lowered his head slightly. As he had feared, Restalon and the others had borne witness to their shame. And now they would be mocked. That, Restalon continued calmly, as if he had not noticed the effects of his words had had on the two, is wisdom. If you had not fled, we would be sending two corpses home to your families tomorrow instead of two healthy, strong orc youths. There is no shame in fear, Ogrim and Duratan, only in letting fear prevent you from doing the right thing, and in your case, running was definitely the right thing. Duratan stuck out his chin. One day, we will be strong and our full size. Then, it will be the ogres who will fear us. Restalon turned a mild face toward him. And to Duratan's surprise, he nodded. I completely agree, he said. Orcs are powerful hunters. Orgrim narrowed his eyes, looking for the taunt, but there was none. Come, Restalon said. There are dangers in the Terracar forest at night that not even the guards of Telmor would willingly face. Let us go. Though exhausted, Duratan found the strength to keep up a steady running pace. He would not twice be shamed in one day. They ran for some time, and the sun eventually dipped below the horizon in a glorious display of crimson, gold, and finally purple. He glanced up now and then, trying not to appear rude, but curious indeed at seeing these strangers at more than just several yards distance. He kept waiting for the signs of a city, roads made by countless feet traveling the same path, fire cairns lighting a path, the shadow of buildings against the darkening sky. He saw nothing. And as they continued, he felt a quick stab of fear. What if the Drenai were not planning to help him and Ogrim after all? What if they were going to capture them, to hold them for ransom? What if they were going to do something worse, sacrifice them to some dark god, or... Here we are, Restalon said. He dismounted and knelt on the ground, moving aside some leaves and pine needles. Orgrim and Duratan exchanged confused glances. They were still in the middle of a forest, no city, no roads, nothing at all. Both orcs gathered themselves. They were severely outnumbered, but they would not die without a fight. Still kneeling on the pine needle carpet, Restalon uncovered a beautiful green crystal. It had been carefully hidden beneath the everyday detritus of the forest. Duratan stared, enraptured at the beauty of the thing. It had fit into the palm of his hand, and he ached to touch it, to feel that smoothness that strange pulsing against his skin. Somehow he knew it would exude a calm the likes of which he had never experienced. 
Rest on uttered a string of syllables that branded themselves on Duratan's brain. Kella men Samir. Sole ama ka. The forest began to shimmer, as if it were a reflection caught by a once still lake into which a stone had been tossed. Despite himself, Duratan gasped. The shimmering increased, and then suddenly there was no forest, no trees, only a large paved road that led up the side of the mountain to a place that contained images Duratan had never even conceived. We are in the heart of ogre country. Though it was not so when the city was built so long ago, Restwan said, rising. If the ogres cannot see us, they cannot attack us. Duratan found his tongue. But how? A simple illusion, nothing more. A trick of the light. There was something in the way he said this that made Duratan's skin prickle. Seeing the orc's confused expression, Restlon continued. The eye cannot always be trusted. We think what we see is always real, that the light always reveals what is there the same way at all times. But light and shadow can be manipulated, directed, by those that understand it. In the speaking of these words and the touching of the crystal, I have altered how the light falls on the rocks, the trees, the landscape. And so your eye perceives something entirely different from what you thought was there. Duratan knew he still stared stupidly. Restalon chuckled slightly. Come, my new friends. Come where none of your people have ever been before. Walk down the roads of my home. Chapter 3 Drek Thar had not seen the cities of the Drenai when they were at peace. He only saw them when, well, I am getting ahead of myself. But he told me that my father had walked the shining roads of the Drenai, had eaten their food, slept in their buildings, spoken with them fairly, had caught a glimpse of a world so unlike our own that even today it is hard to wrap one's mind around it. Even the lands of the Kaldorai are not so alien to me as what I have learned of the Drenai. Drek'thar said that Duratan did not have the words to describe what he saw. Perhaps today, living in this land that bears his name, and seeing what I have seen, he would. Regret is a bitter taste. Duratan couldn't move. It was as if the mysterious net of shining energy had flung itself about him as it had the ogre, and he was as helpless to resist. He stared, his mouth slightly open, trying to make sense of what his eyes showed him. The Drenai city was glorious, woven into the side of the mountain as if it had sprung from it. To Duratan's eyes, it was a union of stone and metal, of nature and artifice. He did not know exactly what he was seeing, but he knew it to be harmonious. With its concealing spell dissolved, the city was revealed in its tranquil magnificence. Everything he saw drew the eye upward. Massive stone steps, wide and blunt at the base and tapering toward the top, led to spherical dwellings. One reminded Duratan of a snail shell, another of a mushroom. The combination was striking. Bathed in the hues of the setting sun, the bold lines of the steps were softened, and the dome seemed even more invitingly rounded. He turned to see a similar expression of awe on Orgrim's face, and then saw the slight smile curving Restalon's blue lips. You are welcome here, Duratan and Orgrim, Restalon said. The words seemed to break the spell, and Duratan moved forward awkwardly. The stone of the roads had been smoothed. By time or Drenai hands, he could not say. As they drew closer, Duratan could see the city continued up the mountain. The architectural pattern of a wide, bold steps leading to a softly curved structure was repeated here. There were long roads, made of the same white stone that somehow did not seem to get dirty, although at least ten generations of orcs had lived and died since the Drenai had arrived. Instead of the skins and horns of animals slain in the hunt, the Drenai seemingly utilized the gifts of the earth. Gleaming gems were everywhere and there was that curious overabundance of light brown metal unlike Duratan had ever seen. The orcs knew metal. They worked it to serve them. Duratan himself had helped in the hunt with axe and sword. But this... What is your city made of? Olgrim asked. It was the first thing he had said since the two begun their odd journey in the company of the Drenai. Many things, Restlon said amiably. They were passing through the gates now and receiving curious but not hostile looks from the denizens of this place. We are travelers, fairly new to your world. New, Duratan said. It was over 200 summers ago that your people came here. We were not as we are now. 
No, you are not, Preston agreed smoothly. We have watched the orcs grow in strength and skill and talent. You have impressed us. Duratan knew it was meant as a compliment, but somehow the comment stung, as if, as if the Drenai thought they were somehow better than the orcs. The thought came and went, fleeting as a brush from a butterfly's wing. He kept looking around, and to his shame, wondered if that was not indeed the case. No orc dwelling was this ornate, this complicated, but then, the orcs were not Drenai. They did not need or choose to live like the Drenai. To answer your question, Ogram, when we arrived here, we utilized everything we had brought with us. I know your people build boats to travel the rivers and lakes. Well, we came on a boat that could travel in the sky, a boat that brought us here. It was made of metal and other things. Once we realized that this was to be our new home, we took part of the boat and used it in our own architecture. So that was the giant, muted, swirling metal that seemed at once to be made of copper and skin. Duratan's breath caught. Beside him, Ogram scowled. You lie. Metal cannot float. An orc would have growled and boxed Ogram's ears, hard, for such insolence. The Drenai merely chuckled. So one would think. But one would think that it would not be possible to summon the elements to fight an ogre if one did not know better. That is different, sniffed Ogram. That is magic. So is this, of a sort, Restalon said. He beckoned to one of his men and said something in his native tongue. The other Drenai nodded and hurried ahead. There is someone I would like you to meet, if he is not too busy, Restalon said, then fell silent. Duratan had a thousand questions, but did not dare voice them, fearing that he would only make himself look foolish. Ogrim seemed to have accepted Restalon's comment about magic, but both youths still craned their necks looking around. They passed many Drenai in the street, and one saw a female who looked about their age. She was delicately built, but tall, and when Duratan met her gaze, she seemed startled. Then a soft smile curved her lips, and she ducked her head shyly. Duratan felt himself smiling in return. Without thinking, he said, In our encampment, you would find many children. Where are the Drenai children? We do not have many, Prestlon said. Our people are very long-lived and because of that we do not often have children. How long lived? asked Ogram. Very, was all Restaurant would say. Suffice it to say that I remember our arrival here. Ogram stared openly at their companion. Duratan wanted to elbow him, but he was too far away. He suddenly realized that the young seeming female they had just seen was probably nowhere near his age after all. At that moment, the scout that Restaurant had dispatched returned and spoke quickly. Reston looked pleased at whatever the scout had to say, then turned, smiling, to the two orcs. The one who brought us to this world, our prophet, Velen, is staying here for several days. I thought he might wish to see you. It is not often we get such visitors. Reston's smile widened. I am very pleased to say that not only has Velen agreed to meet you, he has invited you to stay with him this evening. You are to dine with him and sleep in the magister's house. This is a very high honor indeed. Both boys were struck dumb. Dinner with the Prophet, the leader of all the Drenai. Duratan was beginning to think it might have been better if he had been squashed flat by the Ogre's Club. They followed dutifully as Restalon led them down the winding climbing streets, up through the foothills and to the large building that sat highest on the mountain. The steps, perfectly square and solid, seemed to go on forever, and Duratan's breath came quickly as they climbed. He reached the top and was regarding the snail shell structure with interest when Restalon said, Look back. Duratan and Ogram obeyed, and Duratan's breath was caught in his throat. Below them, spread out like jewels on a meadow, was the Drenai city. The last bit of sunset painted them in flaming colors. Then the sun settled over the horizon and all was bathed in shades of purple and gray. Lights came on in the houses, and Duratan thought of the stars in the sky settling on the earth. I do not mean to brag. But I am proud of my people and our city, Restalon said. We have worked hard here. We love Drenor, and I never thought to have the chance to share it with an orc. The ways of destiny are strange indeed. As he said this, a deep, almost ancient sorrow seemed to settle on his strong blue features. He shook off the mood and smiled. Come in, and you will be attended to. Silent. 
shocked almost beyond the ability to speak, their young minds wide open to all the sights and sounds and smells of this thoroughly alien place, Duratan and Ogram entered the Magister's home. They were shown into rooms that, while ornate and beautiful, made them feel oddly penned in. The curving walls, so attractive from the outside and no less lovely here, seemed to confine rather than embrace them. Fruit sat in bowls ready for consumption. Strange clothes were set out for them to wear, and a tub of water so hot that its steam sat in the middle of the room. That water is too hot to drink, and it's too much for steeping leaves, Duratan said. It is for bathing, the Drenai replied. Bathing? To wash the dirt from one's body, Restalon said. Orgrim shot him a look, but Restalon seemed to be quite serious. We do not bathe, Orgrim growled. We swim in the rivers in summer, Duratan said. Perhaps this is similar. You do not need to do anything you feel uncomfortable with, said Restalon. The bath, the food, the clothes are here for your pleasure. Prophet Valent will expect to see you in an hour. I will come for you then. Is there anything you need? They shook their heads. Restalon nodded and closed the door. Duratan turned to Orgrim. Do you think we are in danger? Orgrim eyed the strange materials in the hot water. No, he said. But I feel like I am in a cave. I would rather be in a tent. Me too. Duratan went to the wall, intentively touched the curving surface. It felt cool and smooth beneath his fingers. He realized that he had expected it to feel warm and somehow alive. Duratan turned and pointed at the water. Do you want to try it? No, Orgrim said. Both orcs started laughing, and both eventually splashed their faces and found the warm water to be more pleasant than anticipated. They ate the fruit, drank the water, and decided that the cloth vests laid out for their use were acceptable to wear in place of their soiled, sweat-stiff tunics, but that they would keep their leather breeches. The time passed more swiftly than they had anticipated, and they were engaged in a challenge to bend one of the metal legs of a chair when there came a soft knock on the door. They jumped guiltily. Orgrim had managed to twist the chair leg somewhat, and it stood a bit crookedly now. The prophet is ready to see you now, said Restalon. He is an elder was the first thing Duratan thought as his eyes met those of Prophet Valen. Seeing the other Draenei up close had been startling enough. To behold Valen was something else again. The Draenei Prophet was half a head taller than the tallest of the city guards Duratan had seen, but not as powerful seeming physically. His body, clad in soft, swirling, light tan robes, seemed less muscular than theirs, and his skin, it was a warm alabaster hue. His eyes, deep-set and wise, glowed a brilliant blue, and were encircled by deeply etched wrinkles, speaking of one who was not just an elder, but possibly even ancient. His silver hair did not flow down his back, as was the case with the others, but was ornately braided and looped, exposing his pale skull. His beard flowed like a silver wave almost to his waist. Not elder, not even ancient, Duratan thought as the intense blue glowing eyes settled upon him and seemed to bore into his very soul almost, outside of time altogether. He thought about Restalon's comment, that he himself was over two hundred summers. Velen was a good deal older than that. Welcome, Velen said in a mellow voice as he rose and inclined his head. The braids danced with the movement. I am Velen. I am glad that my people found you today, though I doubt not that in a few years you would be more than capable of handling an ogre, and even a grom or two, by yourselves. Again, Duratan did not know how he knew this, but this was no idle compliment. Olgrim sensed it too, for he stood up even straighter and met the Draenei's eyes evenly. Velen waved them to sit, and they did so. Duratan felt awkward and ungainly, sitting at the lavish table in the ornately carved chairs. When the food came out, he relaxed inwardly. Haunch of Talbuk, roasted white feathers, large rounds of bread, and plates heaped high with vegetables. This was food he knew and understood. Somehow, he had expected something entirely different, but why? Their buildings and way of life might be vastly different from that of the orcs, but like the orcs, the Drenai lived off what the land could provide. The preparation was slightly unusual. The orcs tended to either boil their food or cook it over an open flame when they cooked it at all. Frequently, flesh was eaten raw, but overall, food was food, and this food was delicious. Velen was an excellent host. He asked questions and seemed genuinely interested in the responses. How old would the boys be before they could hunt ogres? 
choose a mate? What was their favorite thing to eat? Their favorite weapon? Olgrim, even more than Duratan, warmed to the conversation and began talking of his prowess. To his credit, he did not need to embellish his stories. When my father passes, I will inherit the Doomhammer, Olgrim said proudly. It is an old and honorable weapon passed down from father to eldest child. You will swing it well, Olgrim, said Balin, but I trust that it will be many years before you take on the name of Doomhammer. The fact that his father would have to die before he would become Olgrim Doomhammer seemed to have momentarily escaped the young orc, and he abruptly grew solemn. Balin smiled with. Duritan thought, a hint of sorrow. At the moment, fine cracks appeared in Velen's face, the subtlest of spiderwebs on that smooth white surface. But describe this hammer to me. It must be a mighty weapon. Orgrim brightened again. It is enormous. The stone is black and blunt and powerful, and the shaft is made of carefully crafted wood. Over the years, the shaft has had to be replaced, but the stone itself has not a chip on it. It is called the Doom Hammer because when its owner takes it into battle, it spells doom for the enemy. I see, said Valen, still smiling. Orgrim was warming to his task. But there is also another prophecy, he continued. It is said that the last of the Doomhammer line will use it to bring first salvation and then doom to the orc people. Then it will pass into the hands of the one who is not of the Blackrock clan. All will change again, and it will once again be used in the cause of justice. That is a powerful prophecy, said Valen. He said no more, but Duratan felt a shiver. This man was dubbed prophet by his people. Did he know if the Doomhammer prophecy would come true? Did Duratan dare to ask? Orgrim continued, describing the Doomhammer in loving detail. Duratan, who had seen the weapon in question, ceased listening to Orgrim's chatter and focused on Velen. Why was this being so interested in them? Duratan was a sensitive youth, he knew. He had overheard some snippets of conversation from his parents who worried about such sensitivity, and from Mother Kashur, who scoffed at them and told them not to worry about important things and to leave the boy to his fate. Duratan knew feigned interest when he saw it, and felt that he recognized it even at a Drenai. But Velen's brilliant blue eyes were bright and focused, his kind if ugly face open, his question sincere. He wanted to hear about the orcs, and the more he heard, the sadder he seemed to become. I wish Mother Kashur could be here instead of me, Duratan thought suddenly. She would appreciate this opportunity more than Ogrim or I could. When Ogrim had finished describing the Doomhammer, Duratan asked, Can you tell us of your people, Prophet? We know so little. In the last few hours I have learned more than any of my people have over the last hundred years, I think. Velen turned glowing blue eyes to Duratan. Duratan wanted to quail from that gaze, not because he was afraid of it, but because he had never before felt so... seen. The Drenai have never withheld information, young Duratan, but I believe you may be the first one who has ever asked. What do you wish to know? Everything, Duratan wanted to say, but instead focused his question. The orcs had never met the Drenai until two hundred summers passed. Restalon said you came here in a great vessel that could travel the skies. Tell me more of this. Velen took a sip of the beverage that tasted like summer to Duratan and smiled. To begin with, Drenai is not our true name. It is a term that means exiled ones, Duratan Gate. We disagreed with others in our world. We chose not to sell our people into slavery, and for that we were exiled. We have spent much time finding a suitable place to dwell, a place to call our own. We fell in love with this land, and we call it Draenor. Duratan nodded. He had heard the term before. He liked how it sat on his tongue when he spoke it, and the orcs did not have a name for this place other than World. It is our term. We have not the arrogance to think that the orcs would use it as well, but such we have dubbed it, and we love Draenor deeply. It is a beautiful world, and we have seen many. Ogrim gasped. You have seen other worlds? Indeed we have and we have met many people. People like the orcs? Velen smiled gently. There is no one like the orcs, he said, respect resonant in his voice. You are unique in our travels. Duratan and Ogrim looked at each other and sat up a little straighter in their chairs. But yes, we had been traveling for some time before we found this land. Here we are, and here we will stay. 
Duratan burned to ask more, to ask how long they had been traveling, what their homeland had been like, why they had left it. But there was something in Velen's timeless face that told him that, although he had been invited to inquire, the Drenai leader would not tell him that particular tale. So instead he asked about how they had tamed the nature of their weapons and magic. Our magic comes from the earth, said Duratan, from the shaman and the ancestors. Our magic comes from a different source, Velen said. I do not think you will understand it if I explain it. Ogram said indignantly, We are not stupid. Forgive me, I did not mean to imply that, Velen said at once. It was a graceful and sincere apology, and again Duratan was impressed. Your people are wise, and you two are obviously bright. But I am not sure I have the words in your language. I have no doubt that if I had the time and vocabulary, you would understand. Even in the explanation, he seemed to grope for the words. Duratan thought of the sort of magic that could disguise a city, thought of the soft, uncanny metal somehow melded with gems of the earth and solid stone, and realized that Velen was right. There did not breathe an orc who could have grasped all of this in a single evening, though he suspected Mother Kershur would have an intrinsic comprehension, and he again wondered why it was the two races did not interact more. The conversation turned to more mundane topics. The two youths learned that deep in the Terracar forest was a spot sacred to the Drenai called Pachendome. Here, the dead were laid to rest, placed in the ground instead of being burned on pyres. Privately, Duratan thought this odd, but held his tongue. Telmore was the closest town to this city of the dead, and Velen had come on a sad mission to lay to rest some who had died fighting the same ogre that had almost claimed Ogrim and Duratan earlier that day. Normally, Velen explained, he lived in a beautiful place called the Temple of Karabor. There were other Drenai towns, but the largest was to the north, a place called Shatrath. At last, the meal was over. Velen sighed, and his eyes rested on his empty plate, but Duratan felt certain the prophet did not see it. You will excuse me, Velen said, rising. It has been a long day, and I must meditate before I sleep. It has been an honor to meet you, Duratan of the Frostwolf Clan, and Ogram of the Blackrock Clan. I trust you will sleep well and deeply, safe within these walls, where none of your people have been before. Duratan and Ogram rose with the others and bowed. Velen smiled with, Duratan thought, a hint of that strange sorrow he had glimpsed in the Drenai leader earlier. We will meet again, young ones. Good night. The two orcs left shortly afterward. They were escorted to their rooms and indeed slept well, though Duratan had a dream of an old orc sitting quietly by his side and wondered what it meant. Bring him, the old orc said to Mother Kashur. Mother Kashur, the eldest shaman of the Frostwolf clan, slept deeply. Because of her high position of honor, her tent was second in lavishness only to that of Garad, the clan leader. Thick rugs of cleft hoof fur kept her old bones from the cold earth, and a loyal and loving granddaughter tended to her needs, cooking and cleaning and keeping the fire stoked on cold days for the clan's mother. Mother Kashur's duty was to listen to the wind and water and fire and grass and drink the bitter herbal beverage each night that opened her mind to visits from the ancestors. She gathered information for her clan the way the others gathered fruits and firewood, and this gift nourished them as deeply. The old orc was not present, and yet she knew he was real. He was in her dream, and that was enough for her. In this dream state, she was young and vibrant, could see her ruddy skin glowing with health, knew her form to be sleek and knotted with muscle. The old orc was at the age which he had died, the age at which his wisdom had been at its height. His name had been Talcra in life, but now, although he was many generations distant from her, she called him only Grandfather. He received the message, Grandfather told the young, vibrant dream, Kashur. She nodded, her dark hair flowing with the movement. He and the Blackrock boy are with the Drenai, she said. They will be safe. I can feel it. Grandfather Talkron nodded, his thick jowl shaking with the movement. His tusks were yellowed with age, and one had been broken off in a battle long since forgotten. Yes, they are safe. Bring him. It was the second time he had said this, and Gashur was not certain as to what he meant. He will come to the mountain in a few months. When the trees shed their leaves asleep, she said, so yes, I will bring him. Talcross shook his head fiercely. His brown eyes narrowed in annoyance. 
Kashur smothered a smile. Of all the spirits that honored her with their presence, Grandfather Talkra was one of the least patient. No, no, Talkra growled. Bring him to us. Bring him to the caverns of Ashugan. I would look upon him there. Kashur inhaled swiftly. You wish me to take him to meet the ancestors? Is that not what I just said? Foolish girl. What has happened to the shaman these days? It was a rant he went on frequently, and it troubled Kashur not in the slightest. She was too stunned by the import of what he had just said. Sometimes the ancestors had wanted to see a child before. It was infrequent, but it had occurred. Usually it meant that the child in question was destined for the shamanic path. She had not thought Duratan's feet would walk that road. It was rare that a shaman led a clan. There would be too much pulling him in each direction for him to be an effective leader. To both listen to and honor the spirits and to guide one's people well or more than most orcs could manage. One who could do both would be a remarkable orc indeed. When Kashur did not reply, Grandfather growled and slammed his staff and on the ground. Kashur jumped slightly. I will bring him on his initiation day, Kashur assured her ancestor. At last you understand, Talkra said, shaking his staff at her. And if you fail me, I will take my staff to your head instead of the innocent earth. He could not completely hide a smile as he said it, and Kashur smiled back as her dream self closed her eyes. For all his bluster and short temper, Talkra was wise and kind, and loved her deeply. She wished she had known him when he was alive, but he had died almost a hundred years ago. Kashur's eyelids fluttered open, and she sighed as her spirit returned to her current, real body. As old as Talkra had been when he died, hands and feet curled up with joint pain, body weak, hair stark white. She knew in her heart that her time would soon come, when she would be able to leave this body, this shell, for the final time and be with the ancestors in the sacred mountain. Drek'thar, her apprentice, would then be the advisor to Garad and the rest of the Frostwolf clan. She had every confidence in him, and actually looked forward to the day when she would be pure spiritual energy. Although, she mused as the sunlight trickled in and the birdsong caressed her ears. She would miss the things that being alive granted her, the simple things like birdsong and hot food and the loving touch of her granddaughter. Bring him, Grandfather had said, and so she would. Chapter 4 Last night, with the full moon overhead and the stars gleaming as if in approval, a young male was initiated into adulthood. It was the first time I have had the chance to be a part of this ritual, the Om Rigor. In my earlier years, I was cut off from the rites and traditions of my people, and truth be told, all orcs had been cut off from such rites for too long. And once I had set my feet on my destiny's path, I had become embroiled in battle. War consumed me. Ironically, the need to protect my people from the burning legion and to give them a place where our traditions could again flourish took me far away from these things. But now, Duratar and Ogrimmar are established. Now there is a peace, tenuous though it might be. Now there are shaman reclaiming the ancient ways. Young males and females coming of age who, if the spirits will, may never know the ashy taste of war. Last night, I participated in a timeless ritual that had been denied an entire generation. Last night, my heart was filled with joy and the sense of connection for which I had always longed. Duratan's heart hammered in his chest as he stared at the Talbuk. It was a mighty beast, worthy prey. Its horns were not mere decoration, but sharp and dangerous. Duratan had seen at least one warrior gored to death, and paled upon the twelve prongs as surely as if upon a spear. And he was to take it down with only a single weapon and no armor. There had been whispers, of course. Any mature Talbuk would do to satisfy the needs of the ritual, he had heard someone murmur in his ear as he sat blindfolded in the waiting tent. They are all fierce fighters. But at this season, the males have shed their horns. Other whispers. You may only carry one weapon, Duratan, son of Garad, but you could hide armor in the wilderness where no one would know. And, most shameful of all, the shaman will determine if you are successful by tasting the blood upon your face. The blood from a long-dead Talbuk tastes exactly like that of one freshly slain. He ignored all the temptations. Perhaps there had been other orcs who had succumbed to them. 
but he would not be among them. Duratan would seek out a female, who was quite well equipped with horns at this time of the year. He would take the one weapon he was permitted, and it would be the blood of a beast he killed, steaming in the cold air that would anoint his cheeks. And now, standing in the early, unexpected fall of snow, his axe growing ever heavier in his hand, Duratan shivered, but he never faltered. He had been tracking the Talbuk herd for two days now, surviving only on what he could gather, creating meager fires in the twilight that bathed the snow in a rich, lavender hue, and sleeping in what shelter he stumbled upon. Orgrim had already completed his rite of passage. Duratan envied the fact that his friend had been born in summer. He had thought it would still not be too difficult in early autumn, but winter had decided to come ahead of time, and the weather was bitter. It seemed as if the Talbak herd, too, was taunting him. He could come upon their tracks and droppings easily enough, see where they had scraped the snow for dried grass or pulled bark from the trees, but they always seemed to elude him. It was late afternoon on the third day when it appeared as though the ancestors had decided to reward his determination. Twilight was coming, and Duratan had thought with a sinking heart that he would have to again seek shelter to mark the end of a fruitless day. Then he realized that the small pellets of dung were not frozen hard, but fresh. They were close. He began to run, the snow squeaking beneath his fur boots, a new warmth filling him. He followed the tracks as he had been taught, clear to rise, and beheld a herd of the glorious creatures. Immediately, he crouched behind a large boulder and peered around to gaze at the beasts. They were still dark brown against the white snow, their winter coats not yet upon them. There were at least two dozen, maybe more, mostly females. It was good that he had found the herd, but now he had another problem. How would he take down just one? Talbuk, unlike many prey animals, would protect others in their herd. If he attacked one, the rest would come to defend it. Shaman accompanied the hunters in order to distract the animals. Duratan was alone, and suddenly he felt very vulnerable. He frowned and rallied himself. He had been searching for these creatures for almost three days, and now here they were. Nightfall would see a fresh haunch of meat devoured by a hungry orc youth, or it would see a stiffening orc corpse in the snow. He watched them for a while, aware that the shadows were lengthening, but not wanting to hurry and make a fatal mistake. The Talbuk were diurnal creatures, and they were busy digging hollows in the snow in which to curl up. He knew they did such a thing, but now he watched in dismay as they settled entirely against one another. How would he separate one? Movement caught his eye. One of the females, young and healthy from a gentle summer, spent feasting on sweet grass and berries, seemed to be in a feisty mood. She stamped and tossed her head, crowned with a glorious set of horns, and almost danced around the others. She did not seem inclined to join them, but like one or two others, opted to sleep on the outside of the cluster of furry bodies. Duratan began to grin. What an offering from the spirits. It was a good omen, the liveliest, healthiest one in the herd, the one who did not need to follow mindlessly, but choose her own path. While that choice would likely be her death, it would also give Duratan a chance to win his honor and right to be treated as an adult. The spirits understood the balance of such things. At least, he was told they did. Duratan waited. Twilight came and went and the sun sank below the mountains. With the sun went even the feeble warmth it had hereto provided. Duratan waited with the patience of the predator. Finally, even the edgiest of the herd tucked up its long legs and bedded down with its fellows. At last, Duratan moved. His limbs were stiff and he almost stumbled. He crept slowly from his hiding place behind the boulder and went down the slope, his eyes on the drowsing female. Her head drooped on its long neck and her breathing was regular. He could see small white puffs appearing in front of her muzzle. Slowly, pacing his feet as carefully as he could, he moved toward his quarry. He did not feel the cold. The heat of anticipation, the powerful focus, drove any sensations of discomfort away. Closer he came, and still the Talbuk dreamed. He lifted his axe and swung it down. Her eyes opened. She tried to scramble to her feet, the death blow had already come. Duratan wanted to scream the battle cry he had heard his father utter so many times, but he bit it back. 
It would not do to slay the Talbuk, only to be slain himself by a dozen of her herd in retaliation. He had sharpened the blade to shocking keenness, and it sliced through the thick neck and vertebrae as if slicing through cheese. Blood spurted, the warm sticky fluid spattering Duratan gently, and he smiled fiercely. Anointing himself with the blood of his first solo kill was part of the ritual, but the Talbuk had done it for him. Another good omen. Silent though he tried to be, he heard the sounds of the awakening herd. He whirled, breathing heavily, and let loose with the blood-chilling battle cry his throat had been aching to utter. He held his axe, the gleam of its metal blade now obscured with crimson blood, and bellowed again. The Talbuk hesitated. He had been told that if it was a clean kill, they would flee rather than attack, intuiting on some primal level that they could no longer help their fallen sister. He hoped this was true. He might be able to take down one or two, but would fall beneath the padded feet if they chose to attack. Moving as one, they began to back away, and then finally whirled and turned to run. He watched them gallop over the rise to disappear, their paw prints in the pristine snow the only evidence that they had been there. Duratan lowered his axe, panting with exertion. He raised it again and let out a cry of triumph. His empty belly would be full tonight. The spear of the Talbuk would enter his dreams, and on the morrow, he would return to his people, an adult male, ready to take his place in serving the clan, ready to one day become its leader. Why do we not ride? Duratan asked petulantly, glowering like a child. Because that is not the way it is done, Mother Kashur said curtly. Irritated, she cuffed the boy. Duratan was young and fit. The length he hiked to the sacred mountain of the ancestors was nothing to him. She, on the other hand, would have deeply appreciated being able to ride atop her great black wolf, Dreamwalker. But the traditions were ancient and specific, and as long as she was able to walk, walk she would. Duratan bowed his head in acknowledgement. They continued on. Despite the fact that each trip exhausted her more than the previous one, Mother Kashur felt a sense of excitement that helped temper the pain and weariness. She had taken many a youngling, both male and female, for each was as valued as the other, on this final part of the rite of adulthood. But never before had she been asked to bring one before the ancestors. She was not too old to be curious. It was less than a few hours for the young, about a day for the older bones to make the trip. Evening was coming, and they were almost there. Mother Kishore looked up at the familiar shape of the mountain and smiled. Unlike other mountain ranges, whose angles seemed to be random, Ashugan Spire was a perfect triangle gleaming like a crystal, its facets catching the sun. It resembled the surrounding terrain not at all. It had come from the heavens long ago, and the spirits had been drawn to it. It was for this reason the orcs had settled here, in its sacred shadow. Whatever squabbles and petty differences they had as living beings, they were as one here, inside this mountain. She would go there again soon, she knew, but not as a hobbling elderly woman. This was her last visit in such a broken vessel. The next time Kashur approached Ashugan, she would come as a spirit, floating in the air as the birds did, her heart light and clean and made new. What's wrong, mother? Duratan asked, concern in his young voice. She blinked, coming out of a reverie, and smiled at him. Not a thing, she assured him truthfully. The shadows had chased away the sunlight by the time they reached the foot of the mountain. They would sleep here tonight and begin their ascent at dawn. Duratan fell asleep first, wrapped in the hide of the Talbuk dock he himself had slain not too long ago, and Mother Kishore watched him fondly as he slept in the deep sleep of the innocent. She herself would have no dreams. Her mind needed to be clear if she was to be ready to receive visions on the morrow. The climb was a long, tiring one, harder by far than the simple hike to reach the mountain and Kishur was grateful both for her sturdy staff and Duratan's strong hand. But today, Kashur's feet seemed to move more surely, her lungs worked more efficiently, as she and her young charge climbed. She felt as if the ancestors were pulling her forward, aiding her physical body with the power of their spirit ones. They paused at the entrance of the sacred cave. It was a perfect oval in the smooth surface of the mountain, and as always, Kashur felt as though she were entering the womb of the earth. Duratan tried to look brave, but succeeded in only looking slightly nervous. Mother Kashur did not smile at him, 
he should be nervous. He was about to enter sacred space at the specific request of one of his long-dead ancestors. Even she was not unmoved. She lit a bundle of dry grasses that gave off a sweet, pungent scent, and waved the smoke over him to purify him. Then she marked him with the blood of his own father had shed for this moment, kept carefully in a small, sobered leather bag. Kashur placed her withered hand upon his smooth, low brow, murmured her blessing, and then nodded. You well know that few are called before the ancestors, who do not walk the path of the shaman, she said gravely. Brown eyes wide, Duratan nodded. I do not know what will happen, maybe nothing, but if something occurs, you know to behave with honor and respect to the beloved dead. Duratan swallowed and nodded again. Then he took a deep breath and stood straight and tall, and in the yet unmolded body of the boy, Kashur saw a hint of the clan chieftain to come. Together, they went inside, Mother Kashur going first to light the torches that lined the walls. The orange illuminations showed them the downward twining path, worn smooth by years of bare or booted orc feet. Here and there, steps had been carved to make those pilgrims' feet more secure. It was always cool inside this tunnel, warmer than it was outside in winter. Kashur let her hand brush the sides of the wall, remembering the first time she had come here long ago. The blood of her mother wet on her face her eyes wide, her heart racing. Finally, the long, gentle downward slope ceased. There were no more torches on the wall to light, and Duratan looked at her puzzled. We will not need to bring fire to come before the ancestors, Kashur said. They continued on a level surface, traveling into darkness. Duratan was not frightened, but he did look confused as they left the comfort of fire behind. Now it was completely dark. Kashur reached out a hand and grasped Duratan's to guide him. His strong, stubby fingers folded gently around hers. Even now, when he might be expected to clutch my hand, he remembers how it aches, she thought. The next Frostwolf chieftain would have a considerate heart. They continued without speaking, and then, subtly, like the arrival of dawn after a long, dark night, light began to grow around them. Now Kashur could dimly see the shape of the youth who stood beside her so much younger than she, and yet already walking in a body of a grown male. She watched him as they moved forward. The miracle of the cave of the ancestors was familiar to her, but Duratan's reaction was not. His eyes widened and he inhaled swiftly as he looked around. The glow emanated from a pool in the center of the cavern, casting a soft white light over everything. All was smooth and soft and dimly radiant. There were no sharp angles or rough places and Kishore felt the familiar sensation of deep peace wash over her. She let Duratan look his fill in silence. The cavern was huge, larger than the main drumming and dancing area of the Kosharg festival, and branching tunnels led to places that Kishore had never dared to explore. It would have to be so large, would it not, to be able to host the spirit of every orc who had lived and died. She walked to the water, and he followed her, watching her closely. She removed the pack she carried and gestured that he do likewise. Carefully, Kashur removed several water skins, opened them, and with a soft prayer added their water to the glowing liquid. You asked about the water skins as we departed, she said quietly to Duratan. The water in here is not native to this place. Long ago, we began offering blessed water to the spirits. Every time we come, we contribute to the sacred pool. And even so, I know not how. The water does not dissipate as it would in an ordinary hollow. Such is the power of the mountain of spirits. Once she had emptied the water skins, she sat down with a soft grunt and peered into the luminous depths. Duratan emulated her. She knew the angle at which she could see her reflection and made sure that both were positioned correctly. At first, all she could see was her own face and that of Duratan. Their features looked spectral themselves, reflected in a white pool rather than a dark one. Then a third figure joined them, as if Grandfather Takra was standing right beside her shoulder, his reflection as clear as theirs. Their eyes met, and Kashur smiled. She craned her neck to look up at him, but Duratan continued to gaze into the water, as if searching for the answers there. Kashur's heart sank a little, but immediately she reprimanded herself. If Duratan was not of the shamanic path, then he was not of the shamanic path. Surely his destiny would be an honorable one regardless born to lead his clan as he had been. My many times, great-granddaughter, Takra said with more gentleness than Kashur had ever heard from him before. You have brought him, as I ask. 
leaning heavily on a staff as insubstantial as he. The spirit of grandfather moved in a slow circle around Duratan as the young orc continued to look into the water. Kashur watched both Frostwolf males closely. Duratan shivered and looked about, no doubt wondering where the sudden chill came from. Kashur smiled to herself. He could not see his ancestor's spirit, but he knew, somehow, that Talkrat was there. You cannot see him, she said a bit sadly. Duratan's head came up, and his nostrils flared. Swiftly, he got to his feet. In the eerie light, his tusks looked blue, and his skin had a green cast to it. No, mother, I cannot. But, is an ancestor present? Indeed he is, Kashur said. She turned her attention to the ghost. I did bring him here, as you requested. How do you find him? Duratan swallowed hard, but remained standing straight and tall as the spirit circled him thoughtfully. I sensed... Something, Takra said. I had thought he would be a shaman, but if he cannot see me now, then he never will. But although he will not see spirits or summon the elements, he is born to a great destiny. He will be an important asset to the Frostwolf clan, indeed, to all of his people. He will be a hero, Kashur asked, her breath catching. All orcs strove to uphold a code of courage and honor but only a few were powerful enough to have their names engraved upon the memory of their descendants. At her words, Duratan inhaled swiftly, and she could see the wanting on his face. I cannot tell, said Talcroft, frowning a little. Teach him well, Kushur, for one thing is certain. From his line will come salvation. In a gesture of tenderness, the likes of which Kushur had never seen, Talcroft reached out and brushed an insubstantial finger across Duratan's cheek. Duratan's eyes went wide, and Kashur could see he had to fight the natural instinct to draw back, but Duratan did not quail beneath the spectral caress. Then, like mist on a hot day, Talcra was gone. Kashur stumbled a little. She always forgot how the energy of the spirits fed her. Duratan stepped forward quickly to catch her arm, and she was grateful for his youthful strength. Mother, are you all right? he asked. She gripped his arm and nodded. His first concern was for her not for what the ancestor might or might not have said about him. Even as she pondered the words, she decided not to tell Duratan of them. Level-headed and great-hearted though he was, such a prophecy could corrupt even the truest of orcish hearts. From his line will come salvation. I am all right, she reassured him, but these bones are no longer young, and the energy of the spirits is powerful. I wish I could have seen him, Duratan said a bit wistfully, but... But I know I felt him. You did, and that is more than most are honored with, Kashur said. Mother, can you tell me what he said about, about me being a hero? He was trying to act calm and mature, but a note of pleading crept in. She did not blame him. All wanted to live on in glorious memory, through tales told of their adventures. He would not be an orc if he did not share that desire. Grandfather Talcross said it was uncertain, she said bluntly. He nodded and hid his disappointment well. That much was all she had planned to say. But something moved her to add. You have a destiny to fulfill, Duratan, son of Garad. Be not a fool in battle and die before you can fulfill it. He chuckled then. A fool does not serve his clan well, and that is what I wish to do. Then, future chieftain, said Kashur, chuckling also, you had best be about finding a mate. And she laughed out loud as... For the first time on their journey together, Duratan looked completely unnerved. Chapter 5 Upon reflection, Sildrek Thar tells me, this time in our history was as a perfect day in early summer. We orcs had everything we truly needed. A hospitable world, the ancestors to guide us, the elements to aid us as they saw fit. Food was plentiful. Our enemies were fierce but not invincible, and we were rich with blessings. If the Drenai were not necessarily our allies, neither were they foe. They shared their knowledge and their bounty whenever they were asked. It was we, the orcs, who always held back. And it is we, the orcs, who would unwittingly be twisted to serve another's end. Hate is powerful. Hate can be internal. Hate can be manipulated. And hate can be created. In the darkness visible, ageless, timeless, Kil'jaeden dwelt. The power surged and throbbed through him, better than blood now, more nourishing than meat or drink, heating and calming at the same time. He was not omnipotent, not yet, 
or else worlds would fall before him with a thought rather than do battle and destruction. And on the whole, he was content with this. But they yet lived, die exiles. Kiljaden could sense them. Though centuries had passed according to those whom time still mattered, they were lying low. Velen and die rest of the fools, too cowardly to face him and Archimond, who had worked as his friend and ally through the changes, as he had when they were simple beings. He, Archimond, and the others no longer thought of themselves as Eridar. Velen would call them Minari, but they called themselves the Burning Legion, Sargeras' army, the Chosen Ones. He extended a scarlet hand, long and elegant and clawed, into the nothingness that was everything, and felt it ripple beneath his inquiry. Scouts had been dispatched the moment the enemy had escaped. Scouts who reported nothing but failure. Archimon wanted them to die for their lack of success, but Kill Jaden opted otherwise. Those who feared fled. He had good cause to know. Those who sniffed reward and their lord's approval stayed, hungering for it. So while Kill Jaden made his disapproval known, those who had failed him usually got a second chance or third, if he believed them to be doing all they could, and not simply coasting on his goodwill. Archimond disagreed on this obsession that occupied Kiljaden. There are worlds of plenty to conquer and devour, in service to our master, Sargeras, Archimond rumbled. The blackness glowed around them as his voice pierced it. Let the fool go. We would sense it if he used his talents on any level that would pose a threat. Let him rot in some world, bereft of everything that mattered to him. Kiljaden slowly turned his massive head to regard the other demon lord. It is not about rendering him powerless, Kiljaden hissed. It is about destroying him and those foolish enough to have followed him. It is about crushing him for his lack of faith, for his stubbornness, for his refusal to think about what was best for all of us. The large, clawed hand turned into a fist, and the sharp nails dug into the palm. Molten fire poured forth, then the flow stopped as it hit what passed for air leaving a thick ridge like a scar. Kiljaden's body was covered with many such welts. He took pride in them. Archimond was powerful, elegant, smooth, intelligent, but he lacked the burning desire for utter obliteration that Kiljaden nursed. He had explained it time and again, and now simply sighed and opted not to discuss the matter further. For centuries now, they had had this argument. No doubt, they would continue to have it for centuries more or until Kiljaden succeeded in the destruction of the being who had once been his closest friend. Archimond had never had particular feelings for Velen, other than as a fellow leader of the Eridar. Kiljaden had loved Velen as a brother, closer than that, loved him almost as another aspect of himself, and then, again the huge hand clenched, and again unholy fire poured forth in lieu of blood. No, it would not be enough to think of Velen sitting on some backwater world, nursing his hurt pride living off the land in some cave. Kiljaden once would have said he wanted blood, but blood, powerful in its own ways as it was, would not satisfy him now. He wanted the essence of shame, of utter and complete humiliation. That would be even sweeter than the coppery taste of life flowing from Velen and his stupid followers. Archimond tilted his head, a jester Kiljaden recognized. One of his own servants was speaking to him. Archimond had his own schemes and machinations, all, like Kiljaden's, in service to their dark master and his ultimate conquest. Without a word, Archimond rose to his full imposing height and departed, his movements lithe and sleek, belying his size. At that moment as well, Kiljaden felt a slight scratching inside his head. He recognized it at once. It was Talgoth, ever his right hand, seeking contact, and the sensation emanating from the thought was one of a cautious hope. What is it, my friend? Speak, Kiljaden commanded in his mind. My great lord, I do not wish to plant false hope, but I may have found them. Tempered delight rose inside Kiljaden. Like the being he haunted, Togoth was ever the cautious one of his minions. Only a little lower in rank than Kiljaden himself, he had proven his loyalty over the centuries. He would not say even this guarded statement without good cause. Where, and what makes you sense this? There is a small world, primitive and insignificant, and I have sensed their peculiar brand of magic minting the area. It is possible that they may have come and gone. Such, alas, has happened before. Kiljaden nodded. Even though Togoth was not present to see the jester, some things from his past yet lingered, he thought, 
smiling a little at the ancient movement that betokened agreement in nearly every sentinel species he had encountered. You speak truly, he acknowledged. Many times before, Kiljaden's forces had arrived on some world or other, lured by the sweet essence of Eridar magic, only to find that somehow Velen and his wretched followers had gotten wind of the approach and escaped. But I remain hopeful. I will find them and twist them to my purposes, and I have eternity in which to do so. A thought occurred to him. So often before, Kiljaden's forces had descended upon a world where Velen was thought to be, only to have him escape. Kiljaden had nursed his insulted pride by destroying such worlds, but the slaughter of primitive races, though pleasant, did not slake his demonic thirst for complete and total revenge. He would not behave that way this time. He would not send Talgoth at the head of the Burning Legion. Velen had once been the strongest of them, the wisest, the most attuned to magic and science. Kiljaden could not imagine that his old friend would have dropped his guard, not after such a relatively brief time. Velen would be constantly on the alert, ready to flee in the face of so obvious of a threat. But what about a less obvious threat? Talgoth, I want you to investigate this world for me, my lord. Talgoth's mental voice was smooth and poised, but puzzled. We have descended upon worlds in force before, and to no avail. Perhaps this time only one is sent. One only, but one who can be trusted completely. Kiljaden sensed unease and pride warring in Togoth's thoughts. There are many ways to destroy one's enemy than with an army. Sometimes those ways are better. You, you wish me to find such a better way then? Precisely. Visit this place on your own. Learn about it. Investigate. Tell me if the exiles are truly there, and if so, what their state is. Tell me what they live on, if they are fat and settled like tame livestock, or lean and edgy like prey animals. Tell me what their world is like, what other peoples live there, what creatures, what seasons. Investigate, Talgoth. Do nothing without express orders from me. Of course, my lord, I shall prepare at once. Still puzzled, but obedient and intelligent, Talgoth had served the Minari master well in the past. Now he would serve well again. Kiljaden's face, though it little resembled what it had been before he had cast his lot with the great Lord Sargeras, was still able to twist into the facsimile of a smile. Duratan, like all his people, had been ready to begin training with weapons at the age of six. His body was already tall and filling out, and the usage of weaponry came naturally to his people. At twelve, he had gone with the hunting parties, and now, after the right that marked him as an adult, he had been able to join them in the hunt for ogres and their obscene, twisted masters, the Grom. This year, as the autumn Koshard came, he joined the adults in the circle after the children had been sent to bed, and as he and Ogram had learned years before, being an adult and being able to attend the fireside circle was not very interesting. However, the one thing he did find interesting as he watched with observant brown eyes was interacting with those whose names he had known for many years but who never spoke much to him because of his youth. Mother Kashur, of course, was from his own dam. He knew she had high standings among the shaman of the other clans, and he took pride in that fact. He noticed her huddled by the fire on his first night, a woven blanket wrapped around a frame that seemed to him little more than bone and skin. He knew, without knowing how he knew, that this would be her last Koshog celebration, and the thought saddened him more than he had expected. Next to her, younger than she but older than Duratan's parents, was Kashur's apprentice, Drekthar. Duratan had not spoken much with Drekthar, but the older orc's sharp tongue and sharp eyes were deserving of much respect. Duratan's brown eyes continued to roam over the assembled company. Tomorrow, the shaman would be gone. Departing for their meetings with the ancestors in the cavern of the sacred mountain, Duratan shivered as he recalled their visit there and the cold breeze that he felt like a draft, but was nothing so ordinary. Over there was Grom Hellscream, the young and slightly manic chieftain of the Warsong clan, only a few years older than Duratan and Ogrim. He was new to his position. There had been mutterings about the mysterious circumstances under which the former chieftain had died, but the Warsong clan did not challenge Grom's leadership. Duratan thought it no wonder. Though youthful, Grom was intimidating. The dancing, flickering light of the fire only served to make him look more menacing. 
thick black hair flowed down its back. Upon his ascension to chieftainship, Grom's jaw had been tattooed a uniform shade of black. Around his neck hung a necklace of bones. Duratan knew their meaning. Among the war song, it was tradition that a young warrior wear the bones of his first kill, inscribed with his personal ruins. Beside Grom was the enormous, imposing black hand of the Blackrock clan. Next to Black Hand, munching in silence, was the chieftain of the Shattered Hand clan, Kargath Bladefist. In lieu of a hand, he had a scythe embedded in his wrist. And even now, as an adult, Duratan found himself unsettled as the blade glinted in the firelight. Next to him was Kilrog Deadeye, chieftain of the Bleeding Hollow clan. The name was not a familiar one, but one he had taken for himself. One eye flitted over the assembled company, the other sat, mangled and dead in truth, in its socket. If Grom was young for a chieftain, then Kilrog was old for one. But it was clear to Duratan that despite his years and grizzled appearance, Kilrog was far from done with either life or leadership. Uneasily, Duratan turned his attention elsewhere. On Drek'thar's left was the famous Ner'zhul of the Shadowmoon clan. For as long as Duratan could remember, Ner'zhul had led the shaman. Once. Duratan had been permitted to attend a hunt at which Ner'zhul had been present, and the mastery this shaman had over his skills was shocking. While others grunted and labored to contact the elements, directing them powerfully but without grace, Ner'zhul remained tranquil. The earth shook beneath him when he asked it. Lightning came down from the sky as a strike where he directed. Fire, air, water, earth, and the elusive spirits of the wilds all called him companion and friend. He had not seen Ner'zhul interact with the ancestors, of course. No one but shaman were witness to such things. But it was clear to Duratan that if the ancestors had not favored Ner'zhul, he would not have serenely carried power all this time. <laughs> Ner'zhul's apprentice, however, Duratan did not like. Olgrim was sitting next to his boyhood friend, and, seeing where Duratan's gaze led, leaned over and whispered, I think that Gul'dan would better serve his people if he were set out as bait. Duratan looked away so that no one else would see him smile. He did not know how experienced Gul'dan was as a shaman. Surely he must have some ability, or else Ner'zhul would not have taken him on to succeed him. But he was not a very prepossessing orc. Shorter than many, softer than most. With a short bushy beard, he did not exemplify the orc as a warrior. But Duratan supposed that one did not have to be a hero to contribute. Now that one, she, is a warrior born. Duratan looked in the direction that Ogrim had indicated, and his eyes widened slightly. Ogrim had spoken the truth. Standing tall and straight, her muscles rippling beneath smooth brown skin in the firelight, as she reached and sliced a chunk of meat off the roasting Talba carcass, the female in question seemed to Duratan to be the epitome of all the orcs valued. She moved with the feral grace of one of the black wolves. Her tusks were small, but sharpened to deadly points. Her long black hair was pulled back in an efficient but attractive braid. Who, who is she, Duratan murmured, his heart already sinking. Surely this magnificent female was a member of another clan. He would have noticed if such a beauty, strong, supple, graceful, had been in his own clan. Ogrim goffled and slapped Duratan on the back. The sound and jester caused several heads to turn in their direction, including, Duratan realized, that of the lovely female. Olgrim leaned in to whisper the words that made Duratan's spirit rise. You unobservant dog, she is a frostwolf. I'd have claimed her for myself if she were of my own clan. A frostwolf, how in the world had Duratan failed to notice such a treasure in his own clan? He turned his gaze from Olgrim's grinning visage to look at her again. He found her staring directly at him, their gazes locked. Draka! The female started and turned away. Duratan blinked as if returning to himself. Draka, he said quietly. No wonder he had not recognized her. No, Ogrim. She was not a warrior born. She is a warrior made. Draka had been born sickly, her skin a pale fawn color rather than the healthy tree bark brown that marked most orcs. For most of his childhood, Duratan remembered the adult speaking of her in low whispers as of one already on the way to joining the ancestors. His own parents once spoke of her sadly, wondering what her family had done that the spirits would curse them with such a frail child. It was soon after that, Duratan realized, putting the pieces together, that Draka's family had moved to the outskirts of the encampment. He had not seen much of her, busy as he was with his own duties. 
Duraka had sliced off several chunks of meat and brought them back to her family. Duratan noticed two younglings sitting with the orcs who presumably were her parents. Both looked fit and healthy. Feeling her gaze upon him, Duraka turned her head and met his eyes steadily. Her nostrils flared as she sat up straighter, as if daring Duratan to look upon her with pity and compassion rather than admiration and respect. No, this one did not need any pity. By the grace of the spirits, the healing of the shaman, and the power of the will he could see burning in her round eyes, she had cast off her childhood frailty to mature into this, this vision of female orc perfection. His breath escaped him in a whoosh as Ogre melbled him. Duratin glared at his childhood friend. Stop gaping. It makes me want to put something in your mouth to shut it, Ogrim grumbled. Duratin realized he had indeed been gaping, and that more than one knowing, grinning glance was coming his way. He returned his attention to the feast and did not glance at Draka again for the rest of the night. But he dreamed of her, and when he awoke, he knew that she would be his. He was the heir to chieftaincy and one of the proudest of the orc clans. What female could deny him? No, Draka said. Duratan was stunned. He had approached Draka the next morning and invited her to go hunting with him the following day, alone. Both knew what that meant. Male and female hunting in a pair was a courtship ritual, and she had rebuffed him. It was so unexpected, he did not know how to react. She watched him almost contemptuously, her lips curving around her perfect tusks in a smirk. Why not? Duratan managed. I am not yet of age, she replied. The way she phrased it made it sound more like an excuse than a reason. But Duratan would not be put off so easily. I had intended this to be a courting hunt. That much is true, he said bluntly. But if you are not of age, I will respect that. Still, I would like your company. Let this be a hunt shared by two proud warriors, nothing more. Now it was her turn to be startled. Duratan guessed that Draka had expected him to either push the point or leave in anger. She paused, her eyes wide. Then she grinned. I will come on such a hunt, Duratan, son of Garad, leader of the Frostwolf clan. Duratan thought he had never been happier. This was vastly different from the usual hunt. He and Draka had set a brisk, loping pace. All his challenges with Ogrim had given Duratan stamina, and for a moment he worried he was going too fast. But Draka, born so fragile and now so strong, kept up with him. They did not speak much. There was little to say. They were on a hunt. They would find prey, kill it, and bring it back to their clan. The silence was easy and comfortable. He slowed as they moved into open territory and began to scan the ground. There was no snow on the earth, so tracking was not the simple job it was in the winter months. But Duratan knew what to look for. Disturbed grass, broken bush twigs, an indentation however slight on the soil. Cleft hooves, he said. He rose and scanned the horizon in the direction they had gone. Draka still crouched on the earth, her fingers delicately moving aside the foliage. One is injured, she announced. Duratan turned to her. I saw no blood. She shook her head. No blood, but the pattern of prints tells me this. She pointed where he had looked. He saw nothing to alert him to an injured beast and shook his head puzzled. No, no, not this print. The next, and the one after that. She moved along, careful where she placed her feet, and suddenly Duratan saw what she had. The indentations of one hoof were slightly less deep than the other three. The beast was limping. He turned admiring eyes on her, and she flushed slightly. It is easy to read, she said. You would have found it yourself. No, he admitted honestly. I did not. I saw the prints, but I did not take the time to observe them in full detail. You did. You will make an excellent hunter one day. She straightened and looked at him proudly. Something warm and simultaneously strengthening and weakening rushed through him. He was not one to pray. But now as he looked at Draka standing before him, he sent a quick prayer to the spirits. Let this female look agreeably upon me. They followed the trail like wolves on the scent. Duratan had stopped leading. This female was his equal in tracking. They complemented one another well. He had the sharper eyes, but she looked more deeply at what he found. He wondered what it would be like to fight beside her. Their eyes on the earth before them, they loped around a sharp turn. He wondered what it would be like to. The great black wolf, crouched, snarling over the same animal they had been tracking, whirled. For an endless instant, three predators regarded one another. 
But even before the mighty beast had gathered itself to spring, Duratan had charged. The axe felt as nothing in his arms as he lifted and struck. It sank deep into the creature's torso, but Duratan felt the retaliatory bite from the yellow teeth crunch down on his arm. Pain, white hot and shocking, coursed through him. He tore his arm free. It was harder this time to lift the axe with his arm pumping blood, but he did. The wolf had turned its attention fully upon Duratan, its yellow eyes boring into his, its mouth open in a roar, its hot breath stank of rancid meat. At that instant, before the gray jaws closed upon his face, Duratan heard a war cry. There was a flurry of movement in the corner of his eye. Draka sprang upon the beast, her long, ornamented spear preceding her. The wolf's head snapped back as the spear pierced its midsection. In the instant of inattention, Duratan hefted his axe again and brought it down as hard as he could. He felt it cut through the animal's body, down, down, striking earth, going deep, lodging so firmly he could not pull it out immediately. He stepped back, panting. Draka stood beside him. He felt her warmth, her energy, her passion for the hunt as powerful as his. Together they stared at the mighty beast they had slain. They had been taken unawares by an animal that usually requires several seasoned orcs to bring it down, and they were still alive. Their foe lay dead, blood pooling beneath it, sliced in two by Duratan's axe, Draka's spear protruding from its heart. Duratan realized he would never be able to tell which of them had struck the true killing blow, and the thought made him ridiculously happy. He sat down hard. Draka was there, quickly washing the blood from his lacerated arm only to mutter under her breath as one more came. She tended him with healing salves and tightly wrapped bandages, along with some bitter-tasting herbs she added to the water and ordered him to drink. After a few moments, the dizziness went away. Thank you, he said quietly. She nodded, not looking at him. Then a smile quirked one corner of her mouth. What is so funny? That I was not able to stand? His voice was harsher than he had intended, and she looked up quickly surprised at his tone. Not at all. You fought well, Duratan. Many would have dropped their axe after such a blow. He felt oddly pleased by her comment, delivered as a factual statement rather than flattery. Then, what amuses you? She grinned, meeting his eyes evenly. I know something, and you do not know it. But, after this, I think I will tell you. He felt himself smiling too. I am honored. I told you yesterday, I was not of age for a courtship hunt. True? Well, when I said that, I knew I would soon come of age. I see, he said, though he didn't, not quite. Well, when will you come of age? Her smile broadened. Today, she said simply. He looked at her for a long moment, then, with no word, pulled her to him and kissed her. Talgoth had been observing the orcs for some time. Now, he withdrew from them, their bestial nature offending him. Being a Minari was better, except for the female creatures with the leathery wings and tail. Minari slaked their lust with violence, not coupling. He preferred it that way. He would, in fact, have preferred to have slain the two on the spot, but his master had been quite clear about intervening. There would be questions asked if these two did not return to their clan, and though they were as unimportant as flies to him, flies could become a nuisance. Kil'jaeden wanted him to only observe and report back, nothing more, and so Talgoth would. Revenge, mused Kil'jaeden, like fruit on a tree, was sweetest when allowed to fully ripen. There had been moments over a long stretch of years when he had harbored doubts about being able to locate the renegade Eridar. The more Talgoth shared with him, however, the more confident and delighted Kil'jaeden grew. Talgoth had served him well. He had observed the pathetic so-called cities the once mighty Velen and his little handful of Eridar had created. He had observed how they lived, hunting like the creatures who called themselves orcs, putting grain in the ground with their own hands. He had watched them trade with the hulking, barely verbal creatures, treating them with a courtesy that was positively laughable. Talgoth sensed some echoes of former grandeur in the buildings and limited technology, but overall, Talgoth felt that Kil'jaeden would be pleased with how low his former friend had fallen. Drenai, they called themselves now, the Exiles, and they had named the world Drenor. Kil'jaeden realized that Talgoth was perplexed when, rather than focusing on Velen himself, Kil'jaeden wanted to know more about the Orcs. How were they organized? What were 
some of their customs? Who were their leaders and how were they chosen? What was important to them as a society and as individuals? But Talgoth's job was to report, not to evaluate, and he answered his master to the best of his ability. When at last killed Jaden had learned everything that Talgoth had learned, right down to the names of the two beasts running after their kill together, he was satisfied, for the moment at least. At long last, revenge would be his. Velen and his upstart companions would be punished, but not quickly. Not with an army of enhanced Eridar to rend them to pieces of bloody pulp. That would be too merciful. Kil'jaeden wanted them dead, yes, but he wanted them broken, humiliated, crushed as utterly and completely as an insect beneath a booted foot. And now, he knew exactly how to do it. Chapter 6 The lessons from that time were bitter, bought with blood and death and torment. But ironically, the thing that nearly destroyed us was the thing that would redeem us later, a sense of unity. Each clan was loyal to itself, fiercely dedicated to its members, but not to the others. What we united under and against was dreadfully wrong and for that we are atoning still, generations after me will still pay for those mistakes. But the unity itself was glorious, and it is that lesson I wish to recover from the ashes. It is that lesson that caused me to speak with the leaders of so many seemingly different peoples, to work together towards goals we can all be proud of. Unity. Harmony that is the good lesson of the past. I have learned it well. Nirzul looked up into the twilight sky content. The sunset was brilliant tonight. The ancestors must be pleased, he mused, taking a small amount of pride in the thought. Another Koshark festival had come and gone. They seemed to him to come much harder on each other's heels than they had in the past. And each time the celebration occurred, there was something to rejoice in, and something to mourn. His old friend Kashur, he understood that her clan, the Frostwolves, had addressed her as Mother, had passed to the ancestors. From what he had heard, she had died bravely. She had insisted on joining a hunt, something she had not done for years. The Frostwolves had hunted Kleptoves, and the ancient mother had been in the vanguard of the charging warriors. She had been trampled to death before anyone could intervene to save her. And Nerzul knew that even as her clan mourned her, they celebrated her life and how she had chosen to depart it. Such was the way of the orcs. He wondered if he would see her, and then chided himself for the thought. He would see her if she saw fit to reveal herself to him. Death was not the vast desert of sorrow to a shaman that it was to other orcs for they had the privilege to again be in the presence of the beloved dead, learn their wisdom, feel their affection. The Frostwolves had had a double tragedy, for the intervening time between Koshargs had claimed their leader Garad as well. The Frostwolves had had the misfortune of one deceptively sunny day to stumble across no fewer than three ogres and one of their monstrous masters. The hideous creatures were stupid but fierce, and the Gron was a cunning foe. The orcs were victorious, but at a grave cost. Despite all the healers could do, Garad and several others died from their injuries that black day. But in the sorrow of losing a leader, and one that Nerzul had known and respected, was the joy of seeing new blood come into its own. Kashur had spoken well of the young Duratan, and from all Nerzul had seen, the young orc would make a fine leader. He had watched as Duratan was named Chieftain, and had noticed an attractive, fierce-looking female looking on with more than simple clan interest in the proceedings. Nerzul felt certain that by the next Kosharg, the lovely Draka would be the mate of the new Frostwolf chieftain. He sighed, sifting through the images in his mind while filling his eyes with the delights of the glorious sunset. The years came and went and gave their blessings and demanded their sacrifices. He went to his small hut, which he had once shared with a mate who had passed to the ancestors several years ago. Rolkan visited him from time to time, imparting no words of wisdom but filling his heart with tenderness and opening him afresh to the needs of his people each time her spirit brushed his. He missed her rough laughter and her warmth beside him at night, but he was content. Perhaps, he mused, Rolkan would come visit him tonight in a vision. He prepared a potion, chanting over it softly, then drinking it slowly. It would not actually cause a vision. Nothing would unless the ancestors willed it, and sometimes visions came upon him when he least expected them. But over many long years, the shaman had learned that some herbs opened the mind while one slept, so that if one was indeed granted the gift of a vision, one would remember it more clearly the following morning. Nerzul closed his eyes, 
and then opened them again almost immediately, although he knew he was fast asleep. They were standing on a mountaintop, he and his beloved Rolkan. At first he thought they were observing the sunset together, then realized that the sun was rising, not descending into slumber for the night. The sky was glorious, but in a way that roused and moved him, rather than calmed and comforted him. The colors were scarlet, purple, and orange, almost violent, and Nerzul's heart lifted. Rolkan turned to him, smiling, and for the first time since she had exhaled her final breath as a living being, she spoke to him. Nerzul, my mate, this is a new beginning. He gasped, trembling, overcome with love for her, flooded with a simmering excitement roused by the vibrant colors of the sunrise. A new beginning. You have led our people well, she said, but the time has come to deepen the old ways. Take them further, for the good of all. Something rose inside his mind to nudge at his conscious thought. Ralkan had not been a shaman. She had not been a chieftain. She had only been her wonderful self, which had been more than enough for Nerzul. But she had held no position in life that would make it likely that she would speak so authoritatively. Annoyed at his lack of faith, Nerzul pushed the voice down. He was not a spirit. He was only flesh and blood, and though he understood the spirit ways more than most, he also knew that there was much he would never understand until he stood with them. Why wouldn't Ralkan speak for the ancestors? I am listening, he said. She smiled. I knew you would, she said. There are dark and dangerous times ahead of us for the orcs. Hitherto, we have only come together at the Kosharg festivals. Such isolation must end if we are to survive as a race. Ralkan looked into the sunrise, her face thoughtful and shadowed. Nerzul ached to hold her, to take her burden as his own as he always had in life. But now, he knew he could not touch her, nor force her to speak, so he sat silently, drinking in her beauty, ears straining for her voice. There is upon this world a blight, Ralkan said quietly. It must be eliminated. Say it, and it will be done, Nerzul swore fervently. I will always honor the advice of the ancestors. She turned to him, then, her eyes searching his as the light grew brighter. When it is eliminated, our people will stand proud and tall, even more than they are now. Power and strength will be ours. This world will be ours, and you, you, Nerzul, will lead them. Something in the way she said the words made Nerzul's heart leap. He was already powerful. He was honored, perhaps even revered by his own clan, the Shadowmoon clan. He was the leader of all the orcs, in fact, if not in name. But now, desire stirred in his heart for more, and fear stirred in him too, dark and unpleasant. But something that must be faced. What is this threat that must be eliminated before the orcs can claim what is rightfully theirs? She told him. What does this mean? Duratan asked. He broke his fast with the two people in his clan he trusted most. Draka, his intended, whom he would wed with full ceremony at the next full moon, and Drek'thar, the new head shaman of the clan. Duratan, along with everyone else, had mourned the passing of Mother Kashur. Duratan knew in his bones that she had intended to die that day, and wished to make a good death. She would be missed, but Drek'thar had proved himself a worthy successor. Fighting back his personal grief, he had stepped in as the primary healer of the hunt then and subsequently. Kashur would have been proud. Now the three sat and ate in the chieftain's tent, where Duratan, chieftain since his father's death in the battle against the Gron and their ogres, now dwelt. Duratan was referring to the letter that had recently arrived, borne by a long, lean courier on a long, lean black wolf. He again perused its contents as he ate porridge made from blood and grain. On to Duratan, chieftain of the Frostwolf clan, the shaman Nerzul gives greetings. I have been granted visions by the ancestors that concern us all, as orcs, rather than individual clan members. I would speak with the leaders of all the clans on the twelfth day of this moon, as well as every shaman of every clan. You are to come to the foot of the sacred mountain. Meat and drink will be provided. If you cannot attend, I will take it as a sign that you do not care for the future of our people and act accordingly. Forgive my brusqueness, but this matter is of utmost urgency. Please respond via my courier. Duratan had made the courier wait while he discussed the matter. The courier seemed quite put out, but agreed to stay out for a brief time. The aromatic spell of the porridge, wafting from a large cauldron, perhaps helped convince him. I do not know, 
Other than that, obviously, near Zul Fields, this is of extreme importance, Strekthar admitted. Such a thing has never happened outside of the Koshark ceremonies. Always a shaman have a meeting then, in the presence of the ancestors who wish to attend, but never outside of that. And I have never heard of anyone summoning the chieftains, but I have known Nerzul all my life. He is a wise and great shaman. If the spirits were to speak to any of us about something that threatens us all, they would speak through him. Draka growled, summoning you like you are pets to come at his call, she muttered. I mislike this, Duratan. It smacks of arrogance. I do not disagree with you, Duratan said. His hackles had risen at the tone of the letter, and at first he had been inclined to refuse. But as he read it again, he looked past the haughty words to the intent of the letter. Something was definitely troubling the one orc everyone respected, and surely that was worth a few days' travel. Draka watched him, her eyes narrowing. He looked at her and smiled. I will go then, and all my shaman. Draka frowned. I will come with you. I think it would be best if... Draka snarled. I am Draka, daughter of Kelkar, son of Rakish. I am your intended, soon to be your life partner. You will not forbid me to accompany you. Duratan threw back his head and laughed, warm inside at the display of Draka's spirit. He had chosen well, all right. From one born weak had come strength and fire. The Frostwolf clan would flourish with her by his side. Call him the courier, then, if he has finished his meal, Duratan said, humor still lacing his deep voice. Tell him that we will come to this strange meeting of Nerzul's, but we had best be assured of its necessity when we are there. The Frostwolf leader and shaman were among the first to arrive. Nerzul himself greeted them, and the moment Duratan laid eyes on the shaman, he knew that he had been right to come. While Nerzul was not a young orc, Duratan thought he had aged years in the few months since the last Kosharg. He looked thinner, almost wasted, as if he had not been eating for some while. And his eyes looked haunted. He grasped Duratan's broad shoulders with hands that trembled, and his thanks were sincere. This was no arrogant play for power, but a genuine feeling of threat. Duratan inclined his head, then left to see his people settled in. Over the next few hours, as the sun sank toward the horizon, Duratan watched a steady stream of orcs progress to the flat meadowlands at the base of the sacred mountain, almost as if gathering there for the Koshark festival. He saw the bright banners that announced every clan fluttering the breeze, and he felt the smile curve his face when he saw the symbol of the Blackrock clan, Ogrim's clan. Since they had become adults, the two boyhood friends had found their time together limited, and while Ogrim had attended Duratan's chieftain ceremony, they had not seen one another since. Duratan was pleased but not altogether surprised to see that Ogrim marched only a step behind Blackhand, the hulking and intimidating leader of the Blackrock clan. Duratan's old friend was now second in command then. Draka followed her future mate's gaze and grunted, also pleased. She got along very well with Ogrim, for which Duratan was grateful. He was fortunate that the two people who mattered the most to him could be friends with one another. While Blackhand was speaking with Nerzul, Ogrim threw Duratan a glance and a wink. Duratan grinned back. He was troubled by Nerzul's appearance, but at the very least, this gathering would give him a chance to visit with Ogrim. Even as Duratan had had that thought, however, Blackhand turned away with a snort and waved for Ogrim to follow. Duratan felt the smile on his face ebb. If Blackhand demanded that Ogrim attend him throughout this meeting, then even that pleasure would be denied to him. Draka, who knew him so well, reached for his hand and squeezed it. She said nothing. She did not have to. Duratan looked down at her and smiled. Word came from the same long, lean courier that Nerzul would not hold the meeting until tomorrow, as various clans would still be trickling in through the night. The Frostwolf encampment was smaller than most, but more harmonious than many. They had brought traveling tents and furs, and the courier had seen to it that they had been given plenty of meat, fish, and fruit. A haunt of Talbuk was now turning slowly over the fire, its tantalizing scent keeping the appetite sharp even as the orcs feasted on raw fish. There were a total of eleven, Duratan, Draka, Drakthar, and eight of his shaman. Some of them looked very young to Duratan, but while shamans certainly grow in skill over time, once the ancestors had appeared to them in visions, they were all accorded with equal honor and respect. A shadowy form appeared beyond the ring of the fire's illumination. Duratan got to his feet and drew himself to his full imposing height, just in case the visitor had too much to drink and had come with belligerent intent. Then the wind shifted, and he laughed as he caught Ogrim's scent. Welcome, my old friend, he cried as he went to roughly embrace the other orc. 
Tall as Duratan was, Ogram was still bigger, as he had been in their youth. As he regarded the Black Rock second in command, Duratan privately marveled how he had been able to best Ogram in anything. Ogram grunted and clapped Duratan on the shoulder. Your gathering is small, but it smells the best of any of them, he said, looking at the roasting meat and sniffed appreciatively. Then tear off a hunk of Talbuk and leave your duties behind for a while, Draka said. With that I could, Ogram sighed, but I do not have much time. If the Frostwolf chieftain would walk with me a bit, I would be honored. Let us walk then, Duratan replied. They left the encampment and walked in silence for a time, until the campfires were small, twinkling lights in the distance, and they were assured that there were no prying eyes or ears to witness them. Both orcs sniffed the wind as well. Ogram stood silently for a while, and Duratan waited with the patience of a true hunter. At last Ogram spoke. Blackhand did not want us to come, he said. He thought it demanding that Nerzul would summon us like we were pets to his call. Draka and I had that same reaction as well, but I am glad we did. You saw Nerzul's face. One look at him was all I needed to determine that we had been right to come. Ogram snorted derisively, for myself as well, but when I left the camp, Blackhand was still raging against the shaman. He does not see what you and I do. It was not Duratan's place to speak ill of another clan leader but neither was it any secret what most orcs thought of Blackhand. He was certainly a powerful orc, fully in his prime, bigger and stronger than any orc Duratan had ever seen, and he was also certainly not stupid. But there was an air about him that raised Duratan's hackles. Duratan decided to hold his tongue. I see your struggle, even in the darkness, my old friend, Ogram said quietly. You do not have to speak for me to know what you would say. He is my chieftain. I have sworn loyalty to him, and I will not break that oath. But even I have my misgivings. The admission startled Duratan. You do. Ogram nodded. I am torn, Duratan. Torn between my loyalties and what my mind and heart tell me. May you never be put in such a position. A second, I can help moderate him somewhat, but not much. He is clan leader, and he has the power. I can only hope that he will listen to others tomorrow and not stubbornly sit on his wounded pride. Duratan fervently shared that hope. If things were indeed as bad as Nerzul's expression seemed to indicate, the last thing he wanted to see was the leader of one of the most powerful clans behaving like a spoiled child. His eye fell upon a dark shape on Ogrim's back. Pride and sorrow both flooded him as he spoke. You carry the Doomhammer now. I did not know of your father's passing. He died bravely and well, Ogrim said. He hesitated and said, do you remember that day long ago when we ran afoul of the ogre and the Drenai saved us? I can never forget it, Duratan said. Their prophet spoke of a time when I would receive the Doomhammer, Ogrim said. I was so excited at the thought of wielding it in a hunt. That was the first time I understood, I mean really understood, that the day it became my weapon would be the day I would be fatherless. He unstrapped the weapon from his back and hoisted it. It was like watching a dancer, Duratan thought a balance of power and grace. The moon shone down upon Ogrim's strong body as he moved, crouched, sprang, swung. Finally, breathing heavily and sweating, Ogrim replaced the legendary weapon. It is a glorious thing, Ogrim said quietly, a weapon of power, a weapon of prophecy, the pride of my lineage, and I would shatter it into a thousand pieces with my own hands if it would bring my father back. Without another word, Ogrim strode back toward the small cluster of twinkling fires. Duratan made no move to follow. He sat for a long time, staring up at the stars, sensing deep within his soul that the world he would behold upon awakening tomorrow would be radically different than the one he had known all his life. Chapter 7 I know well that we lost more than we gained, we orcs. At that point, our culture was unspoiled, innocent, pure. We were like children, who had always been safe, loved, and protected. But children need to grow up. And we as a people were too easily manipulated. There is a place for trust. No one can accuse me of not knowing this. But we must also be careful. Those who have fair faces can deceive. And even those whom we believe in with all our souls can beguile. It is the loss of our innocence that I am lamented when I think back to what those days must have been like and it was our innocence that led to our downfall. It was a long line of solemn faces that turned to look at die-gathered leaders of the Orclans. Duratan stood next to Draka, his arm about her waist in a protective gesture, 
although he was not sure why he felt she needed defending. His eyes widened as they met Drek'thar's, and he saw in his friend and advisor's face something that chilled him to the bone. He wished he could stand with Ogrim. They were of different clans and different traditions, but other than his intended, there was no one Duratan trusted more. But Ogrim, of course, stood beside his chieftain Blackhand, who looked around at the gathered shaman with thinly concealed annoyance. He has been too long away from the hunt, that one, Draka murmured, nodding in Blackhand's direction. He is spoiling for a fight. Duratan sighed. He may well get it. Look at their faces. I have never seen Drek'thar so, not even when Mother Kishore's body was broken, Draka said. Duratan did not reply, merely nodded and continued to observe. Nerzul strode forward into the center of the gathered crowd. Everyone moved back to give him more room. He began to walk sunwise in a circle, murmuring. Then he paused and lifted his hands. Fire burst forth in front of him, leaping skyward in a display that brought soft sounds of appreciation even from those who had seen such things many times before. It stood, towering over them for a long moment, then subsided, settling down to become a traditional bonfire, albeit a magical one. As the darkness falls, in more ways than one, sit you beside the fire, Nerzul commanded. Let each clan sit to itself, with each its own shaman, and I will call you forth to speak when the time is right. Perhaps you wish us to fetch a slain beast for you, too, came a fierce, angry voice, and lie obediently at your feet at night. Duratan knew that voice. He had heard it raised often enough at the Koshark festivals in his youth, and had heard its owner utter cries to chill the bone during hunts. It was distinctive and unmistakable. He turned to look at Grom Hellscream, the youthful leader of the Warsong clan, and hoped that the outburst would not overly delay whatever it was Nerzul had to tell them all. Hellscream stood in front of his clan, more slender than most orcs, but still tall and imposing. The Warsong colors were red and black, and while Hellscream wore no armor, the simple learners in those strong hues served to send an imposing message nonetheless. He folded his arms and glared at Nerzul. Nerzul did not rise to the bait, merely sighed deeply. Many of you feel your honor is offended, this I know. Give me leave to speak, and you will be glad that you are here. Your children's children will be glad of it. Hellscream growled, and his eyes flashed, but he said no more. He stood for a moment longer, then with a shrug, as if to indicate that it was by his own will, he sat. His clan followed his lead. Nerzul waited until there was quiet, and then began to speak. I have had a vision, he said, from one of the ancestors, whom I trust more than I can possibly say. She has revealed to me a threat, lurking like a poisonous scorpion under a flowering bush. All the other shaman can attest to this, once they have the opportunity to speak. It grieves and infuriates me that we have been so duped. Duratan hung on the shaman's words, his heart racing. Who is this mysterious enemy? How had so dark a foe escaped their notice? Nerzul sighed, looking down on the ground, then shook himself. His voice was deep and confident, if laced with sorrow. The enemy of which I speak, he said heavily, is the Drenai. Chaos erupted. Duratan stared, disbelieving. He looked around, seeking Ogrim's gaze, and stared into his friend's wide gray eyes, seeing there the same stunned shock that he himself felt. The Drenai. Surely something was wrong. The Gron, yes. Perhaps they had stumbled across some secret knowledge to use against the hated orcs. But no, not the Drenai. They were not even fighters on the level that the orcs were. They hunted, yes, that was true. But they needed meat as much as any orc in order to survive. They could stand against the Gron, and sometimes had assisted a hunting party a time or two. Duratan's thoughts went back to the day when two young orc children were fleeing before an ogre whose footsteps made the earth tremble and the tall blue figures that had appeared out of nowhere to save them. Why would they risk themselves to save two boys if they were truly as methodically evil as Nerzul believed? It made no sense. Nothing about any of this made sense. Nerzul was clamoring for silence and not getting it. Blackhand was on his feet, veins standing out his thick neck, while Ogrim was doing what he could to placate his chieftain. Then a terrible noise pierced the air, shattering the ears and almost stopping the heart. Grom Hellscream stood as well, 
his head thrown back, his chest thrust forward, and his black jaw opened so wide it seemed almost to have unhinged itself like a snake's. Nothing could compete with Hellscream's war cry, and stunned silence ensued. Grom opened his eyes and grinned at Nerzul, who seemed completely nonplussed at having a former antagonist become an ally so quickly. Let the shaman continue, Hellscream said. So utter was the silence after his outburst that the words were heard by all, even though they were spoken in a conversational tone. I want to hear more of this new, old enemy. Nerzul smiled gratefully. I know this startles you. It shocked me as well. But the ancestors do not lie. These seemingly benevolent people have been waiting for years until the time is right to attack us. They sit safely behind their strange buildings, made of materials we do not understand, and they harbor secrets that could benefit us greatly. But why? Duratan spoke, even before he himself realized he had. Heads turned to look at him, but he did not back down. Why do they want to attack us? If they harbor such vast secrets, what do they need from us? And how could we possibly defeat them if this is true? Nerzul looked discomforted. That, I do not know. But I do know the ancestors are concerned. We outnumber them, Blackhand growled. Not by that much, Duratan shot back. Not against their superior knowledge. They came here on a ship that sails between worlds. Blackhand, think you they will fall to arrows and axes? Blackhand's heavy brows drew together. He opened his mouth to retort. This has been simmering like a stew on a fire for many decades. Nerzul interrupted, forestalling the argument. Resolution! An eventual victory will not come overnight. I do not ask you to go to war at this moment, but simply to be aware, to prepare, to discuss with your shaman the right course of action, and to open your minds and hearts to a union that will ensure triumph. He spread his hands imploringly. We are separate clans, yes, each with its own traditions and heritage. I am not asking you to give up that proud history merely asking you to open your minds to a unity that takes the clans that are strong alone and turns them into an unstoppable force. We are all orcs, Blackrock, Warsong, Thunderlord, Dragonmaw. Don't you see how little those distinctions matter? We are the same people. In the end, we want safe homes for our young, success in the hunt, mates who will love us, honor amongst the ancestors. We are more alike than different. Duratan knew this to be true, and glanced over at his friend. Ogram stood behind his chieftain, tall and imposing and solemn. Yet when he felt Duratan's gaze on him, he met that gaze and nodded. There had been those who had protested this unusual friendship between two adventuresome and, Duratan had to admit, trouble-prone youths. But Duratan would not be who he is today if he had not drawn from Ogram's steady strength and he knew in his bones that Ogrim felt the same about him. But the Drenai... May I speak? The voice belonged to Drek'thar, and Duratan turned, surprised. The question seemed to be addressed not only to his chieftain, but to the shaman who had been a mentor to all of them. Nerzul looked at Duratan, who nodded. My chieftain, Drek'thar said, and to Duratan's shock his voice trembled. My chieftain, what Nerzul has said is true. Mother Kashur confirmed it. The other Frostful shaman nodded. Duratan stared at them. Mother Kashur. If there was anyone Duratan trusted, it was that wise old orc. His mind went back to the moment when he stood in the cavern, feeling the cold air that was not air on his face. Listening and watching with every fiber of his being as Mother Kashur spoke to someone he could not see, but who he knew was there. Mother Kashur said the Drenai are our enemies, he asked. Hardly able to believe his ears, Drek'thar nodded. It is time for the clan chieftains to listen to their own shaman, as Duratan has, said Nerzul. We will reconvene at twilight, and the chieftains will tell me their thoughts. These are the people you know and trust. Ask them what they have seen. The gathered crowd began to disperse, slowly, looking at one another cautiously. The Frostwolf clan wandered back to their own encampment, as one. They sat in a circle and turned their attention to Drek'thar, who began to speak slowly and carefully. The Drenai are not our friends, he said. My chieftain, I know you and the Doomhammer Blackrock stayed with them one night. I know that you spoke well of them. I know that it appears they saved your life. 
But let me ask you, did nothing strike you amiss? Duratan recalled the ogre bearing down on them, bellowing in fury, its club swinging. And with an uncomfortable sensation, he recalled how very, very quickly the Drenai appeared to rescue him and ogre, how they could not return home as it was so conveniently close to twilight. He frowned. It was an uncharitable thought, and yet... Your brow furrows, my chieftain. I take it, then, that your youthful faith in them is now starting to wane. Duratan did not answer, nor did he look at his clan's head shaman. He stared down at the earth, not wanting to feel this way, but unable to stop the doubt from creeping into his heart, like the cold fingers of a frosty morning. In his memory, he again spoke to Restalon, telling the tall blue Drenai, we were not as we are now. No, you are not, Restalon had said. We have watched the orcs grow in strength and skill and talent. You have impressed us. He felt again a sharp sting, as if the compliment were a carefully crafted insult, as if the Drenai thought they were superior, even with their strange, unnatural blue skin, their legs shaped like those of a common talbuk, with long reptilian tails and shiny blue hooves instead of decent feet like the orcs had. Speak, my chieftain, what do you recall? Duratan told him in a rough and heavy voice of the fortuitous arrival of the Drenai, of Reslon's near arrogance, and and Velen, their prophet, asked many questions about us. He was not making idle conversation. He truly seemed to want to know about the orcs. Of course he did, Drekthar said. What an opportunity. They have been plotting against us since they arrived, and to find two, forgive me, Duratan, but two young and naive children to tell them everything they wanted to know. It must have been quite an event. The ancestors would not lie to them, especially about something so important. Duratan knew this. And now that he recalled the events of that day and night in this new light of knowledge, it was obvious how suspicious Velen's actions were. And yet, was Velen such a master of deceit that the sensation of trust both Ogram and Duratan had felt had all been a lie? Duratan bowed his head. There is a part of me that doubts yet, my friends, he said quietly. And yet, I cannot stake the future of our people on such thin ice as my own personal doubts. Nerzul did not propose an assault tomorrow. He asked for us to train, and watch, and prepare, and draw closer as a people. This I will do, for the good of the Frostwolves and the good of the Orcs. He looked at each worried face in turn, some merely friends, some, like Drek'thar and Draka, known and loved. The Frostwolf clan will prepare for war. Chapter 8 How easily the mind can be turned to hate from a place of fear an instinctive, natural, protective response. Instead of focusing on the things that unite us, we focus on what divides us. My skin is green, yours is pink. I have tusks, you have long ears. My skin is bare, yours is covered with fur. I breathe air, you do not. If we had done such things, the Burning Legion would not have been defeated, for I would never have wished to ally with Jaina Proudmore or fight alongside elves. My people would not have survived to befriend the Torrent or the Forsaken. So it was with the Drenai. Our skin was reddish-brown then, theirs was blue. We had feet, they had hooves and a tail. We lived mostly in the open, they lived in enclosed spaces. We had a fairly short lifespan, no one knew how long-lived they were. Never mind that they had shown us nothing but courtesy and openness, that they had traded with us, taught us shared whatever they were asked to share. They had no bearing now. We had heard from the ancestors, and we saw with our own eyes how different they were. My prayer, every day, is for wisdom to guide my people. And in that prayer is couched a plea, never to be blinded by such trivial differences. The training began. It had always been custom among nearly every clan to begin training the younglings once they celebrated their sixth year. But previously, the training had been serious but relaxed. Weapons were for hunting animals, not sentient beings who had their own weapons and skill and technological advantages, and there were plenty of hunters who could easily bring down prey. A young orc learned at his or her own pace, and there was plenty of time for play and enjoying simply being young, no longer. The plea for unity among the orcs was answered. The couriers exhausted their beasts riding to and fro between clans carrying messages. At one point, some bright fellow came up with the idea of training bloodhawks to carry the letters 
It took some doing and did not happen overnight, but gradually Duratan grew used to seeing the scarlet birds fluttering to Drek'thar and others in the clan. He approved of the idea. Every warm body was needed if battle plans were to be successful. While spears, arrows, axes, and other weapons worked well against the animals of the field and force, they would need to be supplemented with other types of weapons if they were to be used against the Drenai. Protection would be vital, and whereas before the smiths and leather crafters focused on armor that would blunt attacks from claws and teeth, now they had to create things that would save the wearer if you were impaled or slashed by a sword. Those who understood the craft of smithing had been few previously. Now, the master smiths found themselves teaching dozens at a time. The forges rang day and night with the sound of hammers and the hiss of hot metal being plunged into water barrels. Many spent long days swinging picks, forcing the earth to yield the necessary minerals for crafting weapons and metal armor. Hunts, which had been conducted as need arose, were now daily events, as food needed to be dried and preserved and skins were required for armor. The younglings who lined up for training looked very young indeed to Duratan, who was one of the many instructors. He recalled his father teaching him the ways of axe and spear. What would he think of these small ones, all but buckling beneath shiny metal armor, holding weapons that no orc had ever before borne? Draka, with whom he had joined in a quick, quiet ritual as he did not want to take time or resources away from war training, touched his back gently. Always, she knew what he was thinking. It would be better if we had been born in a time of peace, she agreed. Even the most bloodthirsty knows the truth of that. But we are where we are, my mate, and I know you will not shirk this task. He smiled sadly at her. Nay, I will not. We are warriors. We thrive on the hunt, on the challenge, on the spilling of blood and the cries of victory. They are small, but they are not weak. They will learn. They are frost wolves. He paused, then added fiercely, They are orcs. Time is passing, said Ralkan. I know. But you would not have our people go into battle unprepared, Ner'zhul replied. The Drenai are vastly superior as it stands now. Rolkan grunted unhappily, then smiled. Ner'zhul looked at her. Was it his imagination, or did the smile seem forced? We are training as fast as we can, Ner'zhul added quickly, not wishing to offend the spirit who had been his life mate. Rolkan was silent. Clearly it was not fast enough. Perhaps you can help us, he said. He was aware that he was babbling. Perhaps there is knowledge that you have that... That... Rolkan frowned, then cocked her head. I have told you all I know, she said. But there are other powers, other beings, that the living do not know of. Ner'zhul almost stumbled at her words. There are the elements, and there are the ancestral spirits, he managed. What other beings are there? She smiled at him. You yet breathe, my mate. You are not ready to treat with them. They are the ones who have been aiding us, so that we may aid you, the beloved ones we left behind. No, Ner'zhul replied. He was pleading. But he could not help it. Please, we need aid if we are to protect the future generations from the Drenai's insidious plots. He did not say that he was enjoying being the center of attention from every single orc and every single clan. He did not say that her earlier promise of power had made him think on such things and began to desire them. But even more than that, she had instilled such terror of the monstrous Drenai that the sudden holding back on her part unnerved him totally. Rolkan looked at him appraisingly. Perhaps you are right, she said. I will see if they will speak to you. There is one whom I trust the most, whose concern for our people is deep and abiding. I will ask him. He nodded, almost ridiculously pleased at her words, then blinked awake. A smile stretched his lips. Soon, he would see this mysterious spirit, this benefactor, very soon. Veldan smiled at him as he brought in fruit and fish to break his master's fast. Another vision, my master. He bowed low as he presented the food and cup of steaming herbal tea. Upon Rolkan's advice, Ner'zhul had begun drinking a tincture of certain herbs brewed to a precise strength. Rolkan assured him that it would continue to ensure that his mind and spirit remained open to visions. Nerzul had found the concoction unpleasant at first, but had showed no sign of his dislike. Now, he found he enjoyed the beverage first thing in the morning, and three more times throughout the day. He accepted the cup, and sipped it as he nodded in response to Gul'dan's question. Indeed, and I have learned something important. Gul'dan, for as long as there have been orcs, there have been shaman. And the shaman work with the elements, 
and with the ancestors. Gul'dan's face wore an expression of puzzlement. Yes, of course. Ner'zhul couldn't stifle a grin that stretched his lips wide over his tusks. And that is still true, but there is more than we know of. More that the ancestors can see, but we as living beings cannot. Ralkan has told me she has been in contact with such beings. They have wisdom and knowledge even beyond that of the ancestors, and they will come to aid us. Ralkan says there is one in particular who has chosen to take the orcs under his wing, and soon, soon he will show himself to me. Galtan's eyes sparkled, and to me too, perhaps, Master. Ner'zhul smiled. You are a strong one, Galdan, he said. I would not have chosen you as my apprentice if that were not the case. Yes, I think so. When he has deemed you worthy, as he has deemed me, Gul'dan lowered his head. May it be so, he said. I am so honored to serve. This is a time of great glory for the orcs. We are blessed to live to see it. The Blackrock clan, with Blackhand himself in the vanguard, had begged for the honor of being first to strike. There had been some resentment and grumbling, but the hunting skills of the Black Rock were legendary, and they were a logical first choice as they also lived fairly near Telmore, one of the smaller, more isolated cities. They had been given the first efforts at armor, swords, metal-tipped arrows, and other weapons of war that would bring down the Drenai. Olgrim, the Doomhammer strapped across his back and clad from head to foot in metal that made him chafe and feel confined, rode at his chieftain's side. The wolf beneath him seemed to have an equal dislike of the armor, and now and then turned his massive head to snap at Ogrim's leg, as if at some insect that annoyed him. He also seemed to be laboring a bit as he bore his rider across a soft meadow grass, panting more than usual, pink tongue lolling. Ogrim muttered under his breath. It had sounded so simple. Go to war against this new, insidious foe. But when they had all, including Ogrim, stood and cheered the decision, no one had stopped to think how difficult it would be to simply prepare. They would need to breed the wolves for size even more now, if the animals were to carry armor as well as orc bodies already heavy with dense bone and powerful muscle. The weapons were not untried. Several times already they had attacked the ogres, rationalizing that although they were lumbering and stupid, and the Drenai were quick and intelligent, fighting them was more akin to fighting the new enemy than killing Talbuk would be. They had lost a few, at first, who were burned on a pyre with due ceremony for their honorable sacrifice. The weapons felt alien in their hands. The armor slowed them down, but each time the attacks went more smoothly. The last time, they had faced not only a pair of ogres, but one of their masters, a Gron, who had the ferocity of the ogres it dominated, and a vile cleverness that made it a much more challenging foe. Two brave Blackrock soldiers fell before Ogrim got in the final blow, swinging his hammer of prophecy and bringing doom upon the bellowing Gron. Blackhand stood beside him, panting and sweating, blood, his own and that of the creature they had just slain, spattering his face. He wiped his face with his mailed hand and licked the blood, grunting. Two ogres and their master, he muttered, reaching out a hand to clap Ogrim on the shoulder. The pitiful Drenai do not stand a chance against our might. Standing, sweating in the sun, its bright light glinting off the metal plate and almost blinding his eyes, Olgrim agreed. Bloodlust rose high in him. He trusted Ner'zhul and the shaman of his clan. Further, he had spoken with Duratan, and they both agreed that although they had been treated fairly by the Drenai on that long ago day when they had been rescued by the Blueskins, there had been something peculiar about them. The spirits had never guided them falsely before. Why would they do so now? But as he rode alongside his lord, to where a small hunting party had been reported, Ogrim had misgivings. What if the Drenai had been odd? Surely the orcs must have seemed odd to them when they first arrived. Was death truly an appropriate punishment for being different? When had there been a single attack on an orc by the Drenai? A single insult or offense even? Now, eighteen Blackrock warriors, armed to the teeth, their bodies coated in protective metal, were riding to slaughter a group of the Blueskins who were doing nothing more threatening than gathering food for their people. Unexpected and unwanted, an image rose in Ogrim's mind of the young Drenai girl who had smiled shyly at them. Was it her father or mother who would die here on this glorious sunny day? You look lost in thought, Ogrim, said Blackhand in his gravelly voice, startling Ogrim momentarily. What fills your mind, my second? The face of an orphan, thought Ogrim, but did not say. Instead, he said gruffly, I was wondering what color Drenai blood was. 
Black Ham threw back his oversized head and laughed heartily. Ogram heard a harsh caw and the sound of frantic wing beats, as the very crows took flight at the noise of the Black Rock chieftain's laughter. I will make sure your face is painted in it, Black Hand said, chuckling. Ogram's jaw tightened, and he said nothing. The ancestors do not lie, he thought grimly. A child is innocent, always, but its parents have earned death, if they are plotting against us as the spirits have said. They came upon them with ridiculous ease, not bothering to hide their approach. The scout had said the hunting party numbered eleven, six males and five females, and they encountered a herd of kleptos. While the great, shaggy beasts were strong and difficult to bring down, they did not have the aggressiveness of a roused herd of talbucks, and the Drenai hunting party had already managed to isolate a young bull. It roared, pawing the earth and lowering its head, aiming its single horn at its attackers, but the outcome was assured. Or it would have been, had it not been for the arrival of the orcs. Black Hand drew his company to a halt on a ridge. Ogram could smell the excitement from his kinsmen. Their bodies quivered with anticipation in their newly crafted armor, their hands clenched and unclenched, wanting to curl about the weapons that were only now becoming familiar. Black Hand held up a mailed fist, his small eyes fastened on the activity below, waiting for the right moment to swoop down like a hawk on a meadow rat. The Black Rock chieftain turned to his shaman, who were in the back. They, too, wore armor, but carried no weapons. They did not need to. They would heal their brethren as they fell, and also direct the immense power of the elements towards their foe. You are ready, he asked. The eldest among them nodded. His eyes glowed fiercely, and his lips were curved in a smile. He, too, wanted to see Drenai blood shed this day. Black Hand grunted and brought his fist down. The Blackrock warriors charged. They uttered their battle cries as they came, and the Blueskins turned, startled. At first, only surprise registered on those faces. No doubt they merely wondered why such a great number of mounted orc warriors were coming to aid them in a kill. It was only when Black Hand, atop his monstrous wolf, brought his two-handed broadsword down in a smooth blow that severed their leader in half that the Drenai realized that the orcs had come not for the Kleftoth, but for them. To their credit, they did not stare in stunned horror at the sight, but sprang immediately into action. Voices that held only the faintest tremor of fear uttered words in a liquid-sounding alien tongue. Although Ogram did not recognize the words, Duritan had the gift of her call for such things. Not he. The sound was familiar. He knew what to expect from that long ago day when the Drenai had rescued him and Duritan and had prepared his kinsmen. So when the sky crackled with an unnatural blue and silver lightning, the shaman were ready. They blasted the strange bolts of light with lightning of their own. The brightness was almost blinding, and Ogram looked down quickly his focus on the Drenai warrior in front of him, wielding a staff that glowed and sparked. He roared and lifted the Doomhammer over his head, and brought it crashing down upon his enemy. The armor the Drenai warrior wore could not withstand such an attack, and crumpled like a thin tin bracelet. Blood and brains spattered the ground. Ogrim looked up, searching for his next target. Some of the black rocks were held in the magical netting created by one of the Drenai's foul, unnatural lightning. They were proud and strong warriors, but they screamed in agony as the netting burned its way into their skin. The acrid odor of burning flesh mixed with the wreck of blood and fear in Ogram's nostrils. It was an intoxicating smell. He felt a wind brush his face, chasing away the sense of battle and infusing his lungs with energy. Ogram selected the one he would next kill and raced towards the warrior, a female who had no weapon, but who was wreathed in a pulsating blue energy. Ogrim grunted in surprise as the Doomhammer struck die field and bounced off, the shock shivering up the weapon into his arms and jarring him to the bone. One of the shamans stepped in, the crackling sound of light vying with the mysterious, magical energies of the Drenai, and Ogrim cheered as he saw the good, natural lightning beat back that blue field. He swung again, and this time the Doomhammer crunched down on the blue skin's skull almost satisfactorily. It was all but over now. Only two remained standing, and in a heartbeat they had fallen beneath a mass of armored brown bodies. A few more shouts and grunts, and the unmistakable sound of bladed weapons sinking into flesh. And then all was silent. The corner cleft hoof had escaped. Ogram caught his breath, his blood singing in his ears, aflame with the excitement of the kill. He had always enjoyed the hunts, but this, 
he had never experienced anything like this. Sometimes the beasts he attacked fought back, but prey such as the Drenai, intelligent, powerful, who fought in the same way he did and not with tooth and claw, was new to him. He threw back his head and laughed, and wondered if somehow he had become drunk on the sensation. The cheers and rough deep bellows of laughter from the victorious orcs were the only sound in the glade. Blackhand strode to Ogrim and embraced him as best he could through the armor they both wore. I saw the Doomhammer, but it was so fast it was only a blur to my eyes, the Black Rock chieftain rumbled, grinning. You fought well today, Ogrim. I was wise to name you my second. He stooped over the mage that had been Ogrim's last kill and removed his mailed gloves. The skull had been completely shattered and blue blood was everywhere. Blackhand dipped his fingers in the slain Drenai's life fluid and carefully painted Ogrim's face with it. Deep inside, something shifted in the orc. He remembered doing this himself at his first kill, the blood red and warm. He remembered having this done to him when he went to the sacred mountain as part of the Om Ragor ritual, with his father's blood on his face. And now, his leader had anointed him again, with the blood of the beings that were their enemy. A bit of the dark blue liquid trickled down his cheek into the corner of his mouth. Ogram extended his tongue, tasted the fluid, and found it sweet. The bloodhawk settled on its master's arm, its talons digging deep into the protective leather. Nerzul paced while the hawkmaster unrolled the message and delivered it to him. Quickly, he scanned the small piece of parchment. So easy. It had been so easy. Not a single casualty, although some had been injured, of course. Their first foray and the orcs had been completely victorious. Blackhand spoke contemptuously of how swiftly they had descended upon the party and broken their skulls. It was all unfolding as Rolkan had promised him. Surely, surely now the being with whom Rolkan had allied would appear. The orcs, led by Nerzul, had certainly proven their worth with this decisive triumph. He again read the missive. Blackhand and the Black Rock orcs had indeed been the right choice to send against the Drenai. They were powerful and violent, but unlike the Warsong or some other clans, they were completely under the control of their chieftain. That night, he had a victory feast prepared for the Shadow Moon clan, and they ate and drank and laughed and sang until at last Nerzul trundled to his bed and fell into a deep, profound sleep. And the being came. It was glorious, radiant, so bright that even with his vision eyes, Nerzul could not bear to look upon it at first. He fell to his knees, shaking with the joy and awe that washed through him. You have come, he whispered, feeling tears well up in his eyes and slip down his face. I knew that if we pleased you, you would come. Indeed you have, Nerzul, shaman, soul tender of the orcs. The voice rumbled through his bones, and Nerzul closed his eyes, almost giddy at the sensation. I have seen your masterful handling of your people, how you brought separate clans together with a common purpose, a glorious goal. One that was inspired by you, great one, murmured Nerzul. He thought of Rolkarn, and briefly wondered why she was no longer appearing to him then dismissed the thought of her. This great entity was far superior to even the shade of his beloved mate. Nerzul craved more words from this magnificent being. You came to us and revealed the truth, Nerzul continued. We did what was needed. You did indeed, and I am well pleased with you. Glory and honor and sweet victory will continue to be yours if you do as I say. Of course I will, but, great one, this humble petitioner would beg a favor. Nerzul risked a glance up at the being. It was enormous, radiant and red, with a powerful torso and legs that ended in cloven hose and curved back like a Talbux, or a Drenai's. Nerzul blinked. There was silence for a moment, after he voiced his request, and he thought he felt a sudden chill. Then the voice spoke again in his mind and his ears, and it was still smooth and sweet as honey. Ask, and I will decide if you are worthy. Suddenly, Nerzul's mouth was dry and the words would not form. With an effort he spoke, Great One, do you have a name by which we may call you? A chuckle rumbled through Nerzul's blood. A simple favor, easily granted. Yes, I have a name. You may call me Kill Jaden. Chapter 9 It is easy to understand why so many of my contemporaries prefer to let this history die. Let it sink into oblivion silently, 
slipping beneath the waters of time until the surface of the lake is once again unruffled, and no one knows of the shame lurking in the depths. I too feel that shame, though I was not alive when this occurred. I see it in Drekthar's face as he recounts his part of the tale in a shaking voice. I saw the weight of it on Ogrim Doomhammer. Grom Hellscream, friend and traitor and friend again, was ravaged by it. But to pretend it did not exist is to forget how dreadful the impact was. To make ourselves into victims, rather than claiming our participation in our own destruction. We chose this path, we orcs. We chose it right up until it was too late to turn back. And having made that choice once, we can, with the knowledge that we have of the end of the dark and shameful road, choose not to take it. So I wish to hear the testimony of those who placed one foot in front of the other on a road that spelled near obliteration of our kind. I want to understand why they took each step, and what had to happen for it to seem logical and good and right. I want to know this, so when I see it unfolding again, I will recognize it. Humans have two sayings that are wise beyond imagining. The first is, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And the second is, know your enemy. Belen was deep in meditation when Restlon reluctantly approached him. He sat in the central courtyard of the Temple of Karabor, not on the comfortable benches that flanked the rectangular pool, but on the hard stone. The air was filled with the scent of the flowering bushes of the lush garden, and the water murmured softly as it circulated. Trees, their leaves moving in the wind, added their own quiet sounds. It was a tranquil scene, but Velen's attention was inward. Long, long had the Drenai and the Naru trusted one another. The luminous beings who so seldom opted to take solid form had been first caretakers of the exiled Eridar, then teachers, and then friends. They had traveled together and beheld many worlds. Each time the Naru, particularly the one that called itself Kayur, had been instrumental in helping the Drenai flee when the Minari uncovered their hiding place. And each time, Kill Jaden and the monstrous creatures who had once been Eridar had come closer to capturing them. Velen grieved every time he and his people had to depart a world to save themselves, knowing that any beings they left behind would be as changed as the Eridar had been. Kill Jaden, always eager for more to join the legion he was creating for his dark master Sargeras, would overlook no possible recruit. Kayur, as sorrowful as Velen, grieved with him, but it spoke in Velen's mind with the unalterable logic that Kil Jaden, Archimond, and Sargeras would have destroyed another world in the same amount of time. All worlds, all beings, all races were horrifically equal in Sargeras' eyes. They all needed to be obliterated in a ghastly festival of carnage and fire. Velen's death at the hands of beings who had once been his dearest friends would save none of the luckless innocents, whereas his life possibly would one day. How? Velen had raged once. How is my life more important, worthier than theirs? The gathering is slow, Kayur had admitted. But it continues. There are other Naru like me, who are reaching out to the younger races. When they are ready, they will all be brought together. Sargeras will eventually fall beneath the will of those who yet believe in what is good and true and harmonious, what is the timeless balance of this universe. Velen had no choice but to either believe this being who had become his friend, or to turn his back on those who had trusted him and be twisted into a Minari. He chose to believe. Now, though, he was confused. The orcs had begun attacking lone hunting parties. There seemed to be no reason for the aggression. None of the shaken guards to whom Velen had spoken reported anything out of the ordinary. And yet, three hunting parties had been killed down to the last Drenai. Restwan, who had investigated the slaughter, had reported that the bodies were not simply killed, they were butchered. So Velen had come to the temple, created in the earliest years of the Drenai on this world. Here, surrounded by four of the seven Adamar crystals that had sprung into being so very long ago, he could hear the faint voice of his friend in his mind. But as yet, Kayur had no answers for him. There would be no flight for them this time if things went wrong. Kayur was dying trapped in the very vessel that it had provided when it had crashed into this world two hundred years past. Great prophet, said Restalon, his voice soft and weary sounding. There has been another attack. Slowly, Velen opened his ancient eyes and regarded his friend sorrowfully. 
I know, he said. I felt it. Reslon ran a thick-fingered hand through his black hair. What do we do? Each attack seems more violent than the last. Examination of the inquiries done to the bodies seemed to indicate that they were improving their weapons. Velen sighed deeply and shook his head. The white braids swung gently with the movement. I cannot hear Kayor, he said quietly. At least, not as well as I used to. I fear it's time. It's not much longer. Restalon lowered his gaze, pain evident on his face. The Naru had effectively sacrificed itself for them. All the Drenai knew and understood this. Strange and mysterious as the being was, the Drenai had grown to care for it. It had been trapped and slowly dying for two centuries. Somehow, Velen had thought it would take longer than that for the being to die, if it did die, as he understood such things. He rose with purpose, his light tan robes fluttering behind him. It yet has wisdom to impart to me, but I have not the skill to hear it any more. I must go to it. Perhaps proximity will help it communicate better. You... you mean go to the ship? Restalon asked. Velen nodded. I must. Great prophet, I do not mean to question your wisdom, but... But you do anyways, Velen said, laughing, his startling blue eyes crinkling at the corners with genuine good humor. Continue, my old friend. Your questioning always has value to me. Restalon sighed. The orcs have adopted the vessel as their sacred mountain, he said. I know this, Velen replied. Then why antagonize them by venturing there? Restalon asked. They would surely see this as an act of aggression at any time, particularly now. You would be giving them reason to continue their tax against us. Velen nodded. I have thought of this, thought long and hard on it, but perhaps it is time to reveal who we are and what their sacred mountain is. They believe their ancestors dwell there, and they may very well be right. If care does not have much longer, should we not utilize its wisdom and powers while we can? If anyone or anything can broker peace between the orcs and ourselves, this being, greater far than any of us, has that ability. This may be our only hope. Kaior spoke of finding other races, other beings, to join it in its quest for balance and harmony. To stand against Sargeras and this vast, unholy force he has created. Velen placed a white hand on his friend's armor-plated shoulder. One thing for certain has been revealed to me in my meditations, and that is that things can no longer continue as they used to, or can Drenai can no longer live in distant familiarity with one another. There's no returning to that, my old friend. There is either war or peace. They will either become our allies or our enemies and I would never forgive myself if I did not explore every avenue to peace I could. Do you understand now? Restalon searched Velen's face unhappily, then nodded. Yes. Yes, I suppose I do. But I like it not. At least let me send you with an armored guard, for I know they will attack before they will listen. Velen shook his head. No. No weapons. Nothing to provoke them. In their hearts, they are honorable beings. I was able to glimpse the souls of the two young orcs who stayed with us a few years ago. There was nothing cowardly or evil in there, only caution and now, for some reason, fear. They attacked hunting parties, not civilians. Yes, Restalon shot back, parties that were greatly outnumbered. We found blood that was not our own spilled at those sites, Velen reminded him. They took the bodies back for ritual burning, but there was orcish blood enough on the soil, and with our knowledge, a handful of Drenai can easily stand against many orcs. No. I will risk all on this. They will not slay me where I stand if I state my intentions honorably and I come without the blatant ability to defend myself. I wish I had your confidence, my prophet, said Restalon resigningly, bowing deeply. I will assemble a small escort party then, and they will not be armed. The Great One, Kill Jaden began to visit Ner'zhul with more frequency. First it was only in the dream state, as with the ancestors. He would come in the night while Ner'zhul slept deeply, his body heavy with the drug that opened his mind to kill Jaden's voice, and whisper his praise and congratulations and plans for further orc victory. Ner'zhul was in ecstasy. Each letter that arrived by Bloodhawk from the various clans was read with eagerness and delight. We came across two scouts far from aid. The Shattered Hand clan chieftain wrote. It was ease itself 
to dispatch them, outnumbered as they were. The bleeding hollow clan is proud to report to the great Nerzul that we have obeyed him in all things, said another letter. We have joined with the Laughing Skull Clan, more than doubling the number of armed warriors to send against this devious foe. It is our understanding that the Thunderlord Clan seek allies. We will send a courier to them tomorrow. Yes, smiled Kiljade. Do you see how they are coming together in a just cause? Before, these clans would be challenging one another if they crossed paths. Now, they are sharing knowledge, sharing resources, working as one to overcome a foe who would see you all destroyed. Nerzul nodded, but he felt a sudden pang. It had been glorious to finally behold this beautiful, powerful entity, despite the fact that he looked so much like the hated Drenai, but he had stopped seeing Rokan. He found he missed her. He wondered why she was no longer seeking him out. Hesitantly, he spoke. Rolkan. Rolkan has done her part in bringing you to me, Nerzul, soothed Kil'jaeden. You know she is well and happy. You have seen her. We do not need her as an intermediary anymore. Now that I have been convinced of your worthiness to be my voice among your people. And as before, Nerzul's heart flooded with joy. But this time, despite the comforting and exciting words of Kil'jaeden, he felt a sad little jerk in his heart as it beat and still wished he could speak with his mate. Nerzul was deep in thought when Gul'dan brought the missive to him. The apprentice bowed and handed his master a piece of parchment, stiff with blue liquid. What is this? Nerzul asked, taking the parchment. It was taken off a Drenai approaching from the south, Gul'dan replied. A party? A single courier. No arms. Not even a mount. The fool was walking. Gul'dan's lips twisted into a smile, and he chuckled. Nerzul looked down at the parchment, realizing now that the blue stains were the courier's blood. What had possessed the idiot, walking alone, unarmed, into the heart of Shadowmoon territory? He unfolded it carefully, trying not to tear it, and quickly began to read. Even as his brown eyes darted over the words, the room was suddenly filled with radiance and both shaman prostrated themselves. Read it out loud, great Nerzul, came Kil'jaeden's smooth voice. Share it with me and your loyal apprentice. Yes, please, my master, said Gul'dan eagerly. As he read it, for the first time since he had spoken with his beloved Rolkan, Nerzul tasted doubt. On to Nerzul, shaman of the Shadowmoon clan, the prophet Valen of the Drenai sends greetings. Recently, many of our people have come under attack from the orcs. I do not understand why this is. For generations, your people and mine have lived in peace and tolerance a state that has benefited us both. We have never lifted a weapon toward an orc, and indeed, once we were instrumental in saving the lives of two young orcs who unwittingly placed themselves in danger. Ah, Gul'dan interrupted, I remember Duratan, who is currently the Frostwolf chieftain, and Ogrim Doomhammer. Nerzul nodded absently, his thoughts distracted for a moment, then resumed reading. We can only assume there is a terrible misunderstanding and wish to speak with you so that no more lives, orc or Drenai, are lost in such a tragic fashion. It is my understanding that the mountain you call Ashugan is sacred to your people, that this is where the wise spirits of your ancestors dwell. While this place has long had deep meaning for the Drenai as well, we have always respected your decision to claim it as your holy site. However, the time has come for us to recognize that there is far more that we share than that divides us. I am called the prophet among my people because at times I am granted wisdom and insight. I seek to lead well and peacefully, as I am sure you and the leaders of the various clans do your own people. Let us meet peaceably at the place that holds so much meaning for both our races. On the third day of the fifth month, I and a small party will be moving in pilgrimage to enter the heart of the mountain. No one in the group will bear arms. I invite you and any others who feel so moved to join me. As we enter the deep place of magic and power, I ask the wisdom of beings much wiser than we how we can heal this rift between us. In light and blessings, I bid you peace. Gul'dan was the first to speak, or, more accurately, to laugh. Such arrogance! My lord, great Kil'jaeden, this is an opportunity not to be missed. 
their leader comes like a cleft hoof calf to the slaughter, unarmed and stupidly thinking that we know nothing of his evil intentions. And he thinks to violate Ashagun. He will die before he sets a vile blue hoof upon even the root of our holy mountain. What you say pleases me, Galdan, Kiljaden rumbled in that smooth as water voice. Nerzul, your apprentice speaks wisdom. But Nerzul found words stuck in his throat. He opened his mouth twice to speak, and finally words rasped forth on the third attempt. I do not disagree that the Drenai are dangerous, he said haltingly, but we are not Gran to kill unarmed foes. The courier was slain, Galdan pointed out. He was unarmed and even unmounted, and I regret that, Nerul snapped. He should have been taken into custody and brought to me at once, not killed. Kiljaden said nothing. The scarlet radiance bathed Nerzul as he continued, groping his way to a solution. He will not be permitted to defile our sacred place, the shaman continued. Have no worries about that, Gul'dan, but I will not have him killed without having the chance to speak to him. Who knows but that we might learn something. Yes, said Kiljaden, his voice rich and warm. When one is in pain, one will reveal all he knows. The word startled Nerzul but he did not reveal his surprise. This magnificent being wanted him to torture Velen. Something inside him was excited at the prospect, but something else inside him recoiled. Not yet. He would not do such a thing. We will be waiting for him, he assured both his great lord and his apprentice. He will not escape. Lord, said Gul'dan slowly, a suggestion, if I may. What is it? The closest clan to the mountain is the Frostwolf clan, Goldan pointed out. Let us have them take Velen and his party and bring them to us. Their leader once tasted Drenai hospitality, and although he has not hindered our efforts, I do not recall hearing that he has led any attacks against the Drenai. We shall kill two birds with one stone, take the Drenai leader captive, and make Duratan of the Frostwolves prove his loyalty to our cause. Nerzul felt two pairs of eyes boring into his, die small, dark ones of his apprentice, and the glowing orbs of his master killed Jaden. What Gul'dan had suggested sounded like wisdom. Then why was Nerzul so reluctant to agree? The heartbeats ticked away, and perspiration sprouted on Nerzul's low brow. Finally, he spoke, and he was relieved to hear his voice sounded sure and strong. Agreed. It is a good plan. Find me a pen and parchment. I shall notify Duratan as to his duty. Chapter 10 I have never been so proud of my father as when Drek'thar told me of this incident. I have good cause to know how hard it is to make the right decisions at times. He had much to lose and nothing to gain by making the choices he did. No, that is not right. He retained his honor, and there can be no price high enough to sacrifice that. The letter brooked no disagreement. Duratan stared at it, and then with a deep sigh, passed it to his mate. Draka read it quickly, her eyes darting over the words, and growled soft and low in her throat. Nerzul is cowardly to lay this at your feet, she said softly, so as not to be overheard by the courier who waited outside. The request comes to him, not you. I have promised to obey, Duratan said, his voice equally soft. Nerzul speaks for the ancestors. Draka cocked her head thoughtfully. A stray beam of sunlight penetrating the tent from a gap in the scams caught her face, throwing her strong jaw and high cheekbones into sharp relief. Duratan's breath caught in his throat as he looked at his beloved. For all the chaos, madness even, that seemed to have suddenly descended upon himself and his people, he was grateful for her. He touched her brown face lightly with a sharp clawed finger, and she smiled briefly. My mate, I do not know that I trust Nerzul, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. He nodded, but we both trust Drek'thar, and he has confirmed what Nerzul has said. The Drenai have been plotting against us. Nerzul says that Velen has even insisted on entering Ashugan. Again, the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan regarded the letter. I am pleased that Nerzul has not asked me to slay Velen. Perhaps, once we have him in our power, 
we can convince him to change his ways, have him explain why they are so bent on harming us. Perhaps we can negotiate a peace. The thought seized his heart and squeezed it hard. As glorious as his life was with Draka, as proud as he was of his clan, how much happier would he be simply doing as his father had done, hunting the beasts of the woods and fields, dancing in the moonlight at the Kochark festivals, listening to the old tales and basking in the loving warmth of the ancestors. He had not said anything to Draka, but he was secretly glad that they had not yet conceived a child. This was not a time that was easy on the young orcs. Their childhood had been stolen from them. Adult duties had been placed on shoulders still not quite broad enough to bear them. If Draka were to bear a child, Duratan would not hesitate to have his son or daughter trained as the other children were. He would ask nothing of the other parents that he would not do himself, but he was glad that he was not faced with that decision quite yet. Draka watched him with intense, narrow eyes. It was as if she could read his thoughts. You have met Velen before, she said. I watched you try to reconcile your memories of that encounter with the news that they were trying to destroy us all. It was not easy for you. Nor is it now, he replied. Perhaps it is just as well that I am assigned this task. Velen will remember that night, of that I am certain. He may be willing to treat with me, whereas he might not be so willing to treat with Nerzul. I wish I had seen the letter he had sent. Draka sighed and got to her feet. I think that would have been most enlightening, she said. Duratan emulated her. I will tell the courier that his master may rest content. I will not shirk my duty. He felt her worried gaze boring into his back as he left. Velen held the violet crystal close to his heart. The red and yellow ones rested at his side as he sat in meditation, casting a soft glow upon his alabaster skin. The four others were placed elsewhere in Draenei territory, their great powers serving his people as needed. But the violet one never left him. Its powers opened the mind and spirit. In a way, it was almost like being in direct communication with the Naru. Velen always felt stronger, cleaner, his soul honed to a keen edge when he meditated with the violet crystal. Although each of the seven crystals was precious and powerful, this was the one he treasured the most. He strained to hear the soft whispers of Kayur, but he could not. Velen's heart ached, and he bowed his head. He heard voices and opened his eyes. Restalon was speaking to one of the acolytes, and Velen waved him forward. What news, old friend? Velen inquired. He indicated a pot of hot herbal tea. Restalon waved his hand, declining the offer. Good and bad, my prophet, he said. I deeply regret to inform you that the courier you sent to the shaman leader Nerzul was killed by a group of orcs. Velen closed his eyes. The violet crystal grew warmer for a moment, as if trying to offer comfort. I sensed his death, Velen said heavily, but I had hoped it was an accident. You were certain he was murdered. Nerzul says so and offers no apology. Restalon's voice conveyed his anger and affront at the incident. He was kneeling beside Velen, next to the red crystal. Velen's dark blue eyes darted to the crystal as it pulsed once, briefly, responding to Restalon's emotions. So much for your theory that they would not attack an unarmed man, Restalon continued bitterly. I had so hoped for better, Velen said quietly, but you said there was some good news to mitigate these sad tidings. Restalon grimaced, if you can call it that. Nerzul says that an orc contingency will meet us at the base of the mountain. He is not coming. Restalon dropped his gaze and shook his head. No, my prophet, he said quietly. Who does he send in his stead? The letter does not say. Give it to me. Velen stretched out a white hand, and Restalon placed the parchment in his palm. Velen uncurled the parchment and read the letter quickly. Your courier is dead. It is fortunate that those who slew him thought to search the body for his missive. I have read it, and I will agree to send a contingency of orcs to speak with you. I guarantee nothing, not your safety, not a truce, nothing. But we will hear you out. Velen sighed deeply. This was not the response his soul had longed for. What had happened to the orcs? Why in this world 
or any other were they suddenly so bent on harming the Drenai, who had never opposed them in any fashion. I guarantee nothing, Nerzul had said, writing in a strong, bold hand. Very well, said Velen quietly. Then nothing is guaranteed. He smiled at Restalon, rather like life. The day was inappropriately bright and cheerful, Duratan thought, squinting against the bright early summer light that danced down. Surely, on a day when his soul felt so bleak and unhappy, the weather ought to reflect it, clouds at the very least, more appropriately, a cold, drizzling rain. But the sun did not care about an orc's heavy heart, or even the fate of an entire race of people. It shone down as merrily as if all was right every place its rays touched. Ashugan almost seemed to be on fire, so bright was the light that reflected off its multifaceted crystalline surface. Duratan had chosen a position of strength. From where he had positioned his warriors, he would be able to see Valen's traveling party long before they spotted the orcs. He had decided to wait and let the prophet of the Drenai come to him directly. Although he had strategically positioned his warriors, so that if the Drenai attempted to flee, no avenue of flight would be open to them. And all the orcs who waited patiently on this offensively glorious day were armed to the teeth, with shaman at the ready. With their sharp eyes and superb fighting skills, Draka was highly useful to him as a scout. He had positioned her as one of the lookouts in the first group of warriors. The instant that Velen was visible, she would send word to her mate via a spell cast by Drukthar. Drukthar himself, though, was standing beside Duratan. As the most powerful shaman in the clan, his place was to protect the clan's leader. The two stood on a rock outcropping just above the entrance to the gleaming sacred mountain. Dozens of warriors waited with arrows, hand axes, and javelins at the ready. Others had spent days maneuvering large boulders into position. At a word from Duratan, a simple movement would send death in the form of huge stones crashing down upon the Drenai. The threat of death, in fact, was everywhere on this lovely mountain, on this beautiful sunny day. A breeze stirred Duratan's black hair, and a bird sang brightly. Drekthar looked at his chieftain with concern. My chieftain, you are doing what you have been told to do, Drekthar said earnestly. These beings are our enemies. Duratan nodded and wished he could believe it as easily as every other orc seemed to. The breeze brushed his cheek again, more insistently, and this time he heard words on the wind. Draka's message, borne to him by Drekthar's bond with the elements. They are coming, five of them. None of them is wearing armor or carries any visible weapons. They walk serenely. The wind wafted her words away, and he knew it went to touch the ears of all the orcs assembled. When the time was right, Drekthar would harness the wind to give orders to Duratan's troops. Duratan straightened, and his heart beat more swiftly. His hand gripped his battle axe tightly. There they are, said Drekthar grimly. Duratan followed his gaze. Draka's report had been accurate, right down to her interpretation of the manner in which the Drenai approached. The five Drenai did not wear the strange blue and silvery armor that Duratan remembered from his single encounter with them. They were dressed instead, as they had been for the meal, in robes of beautiful hues that caught the breeze and fluttered behind them like banners. Walking at the very front of the little group was Prophet Velen himself. He was unmistakable. His simple tan robes contrast with those of his entourage, and of course, his strange white skin was unique. Duratan grinned a little despite the direness of the situation. The Drenai were so garishly clad that only a blind orc would have failed to spot them from a great distance. The smile faded at what that had to represent. They wanted to be spotted immediately. They wanted the orcs to be confident that they carried no weapons and were on what Mother Kashur would have called a pilgrimage. Or was it all just an elaborate trick? Shaman needed no spears to destroy. Neither did the Drenai. Duratan remembered the magical nets that scarred and blackened flesh on contact. Nets of energy, alien to the orcs, that had to come from nowhere. No, even unarmed, the Drenai were far from harmless. He had briefed his warriors and knew they would obey. 
they understood they were not to fire a warning shot, not to utter even an insult, without Duratan's express command. But they knew how the Drenai fought, and would not be taken unawares. Duratan could smell the tension emanating from those warriors closest to him. He wondered if the Drenai could too. Duratan watched as the groups he had set farthest away came out of hiding to close the ranks behind the Drenai. They were far enough back so that Duratan hoped the Drenai would not notice. If they did, they gave no sign, but merely continued with that steady, confident, serene pace. Duratan and Drek'thar made no attempt to disguise themselves. After several long minutes, Valen lifted his head and looked up, right into Duratan's eyes. Duratan did not break the gaze, but stood waiting for his enemies to continue their approach. They reached the base of the mountain, but before they could continue farther, dozens of orcs moved purposefully out of hiding to surround them. Velen did not look in the least bit surprised. He glanced around, smiling a little, and then returned his gaze to Duratan. Slowly, Duratan descended until he stood face to face with the Drenai Prophet. Long has it been since you and I last stood so, Velen, Duratan said in a calm voice. He deliberately did not use the Drenai's title. Long indeed, Duratan, son of Garad, chieftain of the Frostwolf clan, Velen said in that rich, smooth voice that Duratan remembered. Are you friends with Ogrim still? Indeed I am, Duratan replied. He carries the Doomhammer now, and is second in his own clan. Sorrow flitted across the pale face, a sorrow that was deep and unquestionably genuine. Again, Duratan remembered that night so long ago, when this being had sat with them and talked of orcish ways, of the Doomhammer and the cost at which Ogrim would buy it. I hope his father and yours pass away with great honor, Felon said. We are not here today to speak of the past, Duratan said, more forcefully than he intended. He did not like to remember that night. We are here because you have informed us that you dare trespass on our most sacred place. There it is, then, he thought. Let us not mince words. Velen held Duratan's gaze and nodded. I had sent a missive to Nerzul, not to you, Duratan. He has declined to meet with me. I wonder, did he share this missive with you? There is no need for me to read it, Duratan replied. I was asked to come in his stead, and I have done so. Duratan saw the broad shoulder slump a little. Velen sighed deeply. I see, he said. He may not have told you why I wish to come today. I do not need to know your purpose, Drenai, Duratan said. But you do, or this conversation will be for nothing. The voice was clear and crisp, and there was nothing old or frail about it, despite Velen's obviously ancient age. Duratan raised an eyebrow. That Velen was a wise elder was immediately apparent, but now, for the first time, Duratan caught a glimpse of the sheer strength of will that had buoyed Velen for countless years. This mountain is sacred to your people. We know this, and we have respected it, but it is also sacred to us. Velen took a step forward, his gaze locked on Duratan's. The orc warriors around him shifted, murmured, but otherwise did not move. Deep inside the mountain is a being that has long cared for the Drenai people, Velen continued. It is older by far than anything either of our minds can grasp, and more powerful, but even old and powerful things can die, and it is dying now. There is wisdom and grace and reconciliation we can have from it. Your people and mine, we, Blasphemir. Duratan startled. The bitter cry had sprung from the throat, not of some short-tempered warrior in the crowd, but from the orc who stood beside him. Drek'thar's eyes were wide, and his body trembled with outrage. The veins stood out on his neck, and he shook his fist at Velen. Duratan was so shocked by the outburst that he did not silence it as quickly as he should have, and Drek'thar continued. Ashugan belongs to us. It is the home of the beloved dead, cradler of their spirits, and your hideous cloven feet are not fit to take one step up in its blessed sides. Velen too seemed surprised at the outburst. He turned his attention to the shaman and stretched out a hand imploringly. Your spirits are housed within these walls, it is true, and I would never say it was not so, Velen cried. 
but they are drawn there because of this being. It seeks to. It was exactly the wrong thing to say. Drek'thar bellowed in outrage. Other cries went up, and before Duratan realized quite what was happening, he saw his warriors surge forward. Draka moved toward them, trying to stop the attack, but she might as well have been trying to hold back the incoming tide. Duratan spun and struck Drek'thar hard across the face. The shaman whirled, snarling. Protect them, Duratan cried. You will obey my orders, and we must take them alive. Protect them, curse you. Drek'thar's eyes flashed in fury, but only for an instant. He lifted his hands and closed his eyes, and suddenly a huge circle of flame sprang up around the five Drenai. A wind sprang up, whipping the fire even higher and physically buffeting the orcs. The warriors stepped back, and to Duratan's horror, some of the archers began knocking arrows on their bowstrings. Hold, bellowed Duratan, the wind taking his order and bearing it to his warrior's ears. I will slay anyone who fires. Between his command and Drek'thar's powerful, if reluctant abilities, the Drenai were unharmed. Duratan raced down the mountainside to his prisoners, for such they now were. Drek'thar was at his heels. Dismiss fire, Duratan told Drek'thar. At once, the sheets of flame that almost singed Duratan's eyebrows dissipated. He stood face to face now with Velen, and a wave of emotion he could not properly name rose inside him as he realized that the Drenai Elder was still as calm and serene as he had been when they had simply been talking. Velen, you and your people are now prisoners of the Frostwolf clan, Duratan said in a soft, dangerous voice. Velen smiled, sweetly, sadly. I expected nothing less, he said. He and the other four somehow maintained their composure while Duratan ordered them stripped and searched. Their glorious robes were taken and given to Duratan's top warriors, and the Drenai were clad now in sweat-stiff tunics. His stomach turned at the jeers, insults, and spits that came their way at the humiliation, but he did not stop it. As long as no physical harm came to the prisoners, and Duratan watched closely to ensure that none would, he would let his warriors have their sport. Beside him, Draka looked angry at the behavior of her fellow Frostwolves and whispered, My mate, can you not silence them? He shook his head. I want to see how the Drenai react. And the warriors have stayed their hands when they might have been expected to kill. I will not silence their tongues as well. Draka looked at him searchingly, then nodded and withdrew. He knew she did not approve, and he did not like what he was seeing either. But he was walking a delicate line, and he knew it. My chieftain, cried Rokar, Duratan's second in command. Come see what they have brought us. Duratan went to Rokar's side and peered into the sack he had opened. His eyes widened. Nestled inside, swathed in soft fabric, were two exquisitely beautiful stones. One was red, the other was yellow. Duratan ached to touch them, but did not. He looked up and met Velen's gaze. Long ago, Restlon showed us a crystal similar to this one, he said. That one protected a city. What do these do? Each has its own strength. They are a part of our legacy. They were bequeathed to us by the being that dwells in the sacred mountain. Duratan growled softly. You would do well not to mention that again, he said. To Rokar, he said. Feed them, bind their hands, and put them on wolves. With shaman to guard them. Give the stones to Drek'thar. We will take the Drenai back with us and deliver them to Ner'zhul. He should have been there in my stead today. He turned and stalked off, not wanting to look at Velen's odd glowing blue eyes, not wanting to see the disapproval in Draka's. During the long ride back, Duratan wrestled with his emotions. On the one hand, he shared Drek'thar's offense. Ashugan was sacred to the orcs. The idea that something other than the ancestors dwelt inside it, indeed, as Velen claimed, was so powerful that it lured the ancestors to it, struck him to the core. He could only imagine how the shaman felt about such a declaration. Everything seemed to point to Ner'zhul being correct, that the Drenai were a blight upon the world and should be eliminated. What nagged at him was why. He would get an answer to that question tonight. With everyone, including the five captives, mounted, they made good time. The sun was only starting to set when they returned. Duratan had sent outriders ahead with the good news, and the clan was waiting eagerly for their arrival. On his right were Drek'thar and Rokar, 
who shared the sentiments of the Frost Wolves. On his left was Draka, who had been uncharacteristically silent through the entire event. Duratan knew that he did not want to hear what she had to say. He was already being pulled in too many directions as it was. The prisoners were ungraciously shoved into two tents, and an immediate guard was set up around them. Four seasoned warriors and Drek'thar's most trusted shaman stood proudly, pleased with the duty entrusted to them. Duratan had ordered Velen isolated. He wanted to speak with the Drenai prophet alone. After the excitement had settled down somewhat, Duratan took a deep breath. He was not looking forward to this conversation, but it had to be done. He nodded to the guards and entered the small tent that hosted Prophet Velen. Since he had ordered Velen bound, he expected to see the elder with his hands tied. Instead, he saw that whoever carried out his order had done with excessive zeal. The tent had been erected a sturdy tree, and Velen was bound to the trunk. His arms had been yanked back at an awkward angle. The ropes around the white flesh of his wrists tied so tightly that even in the dim light of the twilight, Duratan could see that they were turning a darker shade. A rope tied, thankfully loosely, around his neck forced him to keep his head up or risk choking. A dirty cloth had been shoved in his mouth. He was on his knees, and his hoofs too were bound behind him. Duratan uttered a deep oath and drew a dagger. Velen gazed at him with no sign of fear in those deep blue eyes. But Duratan did notice that the Draenei looked surprised when the orc used the weapon to cut the bonds rather than his throat. Velen made no sound, but a flicker of pain passed over his ghostly white face and his blood returned to his limbs. I told them to bind you, not truss you up like a talbuck, Duratan muttered. Your people are very eager, it would seem. Duratan passed the elder a water skin and watched him closely while he drank. Sitting before him in filthy clothing, gulping at tepid water, his white flesh raw from the bonds, Velen did not look like much of a threat. How would he feel, he wondered, if he had gotten word of the Drenai treating Mother Kashur so? Everything about this felt so wrong. Yet Mother Kashur herself had assured Drek'thar that the Drenai were a threat so dire as to be almost unimaginable. There was a bowl of cold porridge on the ground. With his right foot, Duratan shoved it toward the prisoner. Velen eyed it, but did not eat. Not quite the feast you served Ogrim and me when we dined in Telmore, Duratan said, but it is nourishing. Velen's lip curved in a smile. That was a memorable evening. Did you get what you wanted from us that night? Duratan demanded. He was angry, but not with Velen. He was angry that it had come to this, and the one who had showed him nothing but courtesy was now his captive and so we took it out on the prophet. I do not understand. We merely wish to be good hosts to two adventuresome boys. Duratan got to his feet and kicked over the bowl. Congealed porridge oozed onto the earth. Do you expect me to believe this? Velen did not rise to the bait. He replied calmly, It is the truth. It is your choice as to whether you believe it. Duratan dropped to his knees and shoved his face into Velen's. Why are you trying to destroy us? What have we ever done to you? I might ask you the same thing, said Velen. A flush had come to his white face. We have never lifted a finger to harm you, and now over two dozen Drenai are dead from your attacks. The truth of the comment made Duratan even angrier. The ancestors do not lie to us, he snarled. We have been warned that you are not what you would seem, that you are our enemies. Why did you bring those crystals, if not to attack us? We thought it might help us better communicate with the being in the mountain, Velen spoke quickly, as if trying to get the words out before Duratan could silence him. It is not an enemy to the orcs, nor are we. Duratan, you are intelligent and wise. I saw this in you that night so long ago. You are not one to blindly follow like an animal to slaughter. I know not why your leaders lie to you, but they do. We have ever sought to interact peaceably with you. You are better than this, son of Garad. You are not like the others. Duratan's dark brown eyes narrowed. You are wrong, Duranai, he spat. I am proud to be an orc. I embrace my heritage. Velen looked exasperated. You misunderstand. I do not malign your people. I merely... Merely what? Merely tell us that the only reason we are seeing the beloved dead is because of your... your god trapped in the mountain. 
It is not a god. It is an ally, and would be to your people as well, if you would permit it to be. Duratan swore and rose, stalking about the tent, his hands clenching and unclenching. Then he uttered a deep, long sigh, the anger in him burning down to ashes. Velen, your words are but wood on the fire of our wrath, he said quietly. Your claim is arrogant and offensive. It will support those who already prepared to slay your people on the word of our ancestors. I do not understand myself, but you are asking to choose between people I trust, traditions I have been raised on, and your word. He turned and faced the Drenai. I will choose my people. You need to know this. If you and I come face to face on the field of battle, I will not stay my hand. Velen looked only curious. You will not take me to Ner'zhul then? Duratan shook his head. No. If he wanted you, he should have come for you himself. He appointed me to treat with you, and I have carried out my duties as I saw fit. You were supposed to deliver a prisoner to him, Velen said. I was to meet with you, and listen to your words, Duratan said. Had I captured you in battle, stricken a weapon from your hands, and wrestled you to the earth, then yes, you would be a prisoner. But there is no honor in binding a foe who extends his hands willingly for the rope. We are at an impasse, you and I. You insist that you have no ill will toward the orcs. My leaders and the ghosts of my ancestors tell me otherwise. Again, Duratan knelt before the Drenai. They call you a prophet. Do you know the future, then? If so, then tell me what you and I can do to avert what I fear will unfold. I would not shed innocent life, Velen. Give me something, anything I can take to Ner'zhul that will prove that what you say is true. He realized he was pleading, but the fact did not distress him. He loved his wife, his clan, his people. He hated what he was seeing, an entire generation rushing headlong to adulthood with only blind hate in their hearts. If begging before this strange being could change this, then beg he would. The strange blue eyes held an unspeakable empathy. Velen extended a pale hand and placed it on Duratan's shoulder. The future is not like a book one can read, he said quietly. It is ever-changing, like the rush of water or the swirl of sand. I am granted certain insights, but nothing more. I felt very strongly that I needed to come unarmed, and behold, I am greeted not by the orc's greatest shaman, but by the one who has slept safely under my roof. I do not think this is an accident, Duratan. And if anything can be done to avert this, it lies with the orcs, not with the Drenai. All I can do is tell you what I have already said. The river's course can be changed, but you are the ones who must change it. That is all I know, and I pray it is enough to save my people. The look on his ancient, oddly cracked face and the tone of his voice told Duratan what his words did not, that Valen did not, indeed, think it would be enough to save his people. Duratan closed his eyes for a moment, then stepped back. We will keep the stones, he said. Whatever power they have, the shaman will learn how to harness. Velen nodded sadly. Such I assumed, he said. But I had to bring them. I had to trust that we could find a way past all of this. Why was it, Duratan wondered, that he felt closer at this moment to one he had been told was an enemy than to the spiritual leader of his own people? Draka might know. She had known all along. She said nothing, understanding with a wisdom he could not comprehend, that he had to come to this moment on his own. But he would speak to her tonight, alone in the tent. Get up, he said, speaking roughly to hide his emotions. You and your companions may leave safely, he grinned suddenly. As safely as you might in the darkness, with no weapons. If you come to your deaths this night, when you are past our territory, it will not be on my head. That would be convenient for you, agreed Valen, getting to his feet. But somehow, I think it is not what you want. Duratan did not reply. He marched out of the tent and told the waiting guards. Velen and his four companions are to be safely escorted to the borders of our lands. Then, they will be released to return to their city. No harm is to befall them, is that clear? The guard looked as if he was about to protest, but another, wiser warrior shot him a fierce glance. Very clear, my chieftain, the first guard murmured. As they went to fetch the other Drenai, Drek'thar hurried up to Duratan. Duratan, what are you doing? 
Nerzul expects prisoners. Nerzul can take his prisoners himself, Duratan snarled. I was in command, and this is my decision. Do you question it? Shrekthar looked around and walked Duratan away from prying ears. I do, he hissed. He heard what he said. He claims the ancestors are, are like moths to a torch around this god of his. The arrogance, and Nerzul is right, they must be eliminated. We have been told so. If it is to be, then it will be, said Duratan. But not this night, Drekthar. Not this night. As he and his companions walked slowly over the dew-drenched grasses of Dye Meadows, past the towering black silhouettes of the trees of the Terracar Forest, toward the nearest city, Valen's heart was heavy. Two of the Adamal crystals were now in the possession of the orcs. He had no doubt but that of Duratan's words were correct, and that their shaman would shortly unlock their secrets, but they had missed one. They had missed it because it did not wish to be found, and when it came to the crystals, light obeyed its wishes and bent itself so that the violet crystals remained hidden from the view of the searching orcs. He held it close to his heart now, feeling its warmth seep into his ancient flesh. He had gambled and failed, not completely. That he and his friends were alive and walking towards safety was testimony to that. But he had hoped the orcs would listen, that they would at least accompany him to the heart of their own sacred mountain and behold something that did not negate their faith, not in the slightest, but had in fact given birth to it. The outlook was grim. As he had walked into the camp, he had observed what was happening. Younglings were being trained so hard they were dropping from exhaustion. Forges were going, even so late at night. For all that he was walking freely now, Velen knew that the incidents of today had done nothing to avert what would come. The orcs, even the ones led by the insightful, slow to anger Duratan, were not just preparing for the possibility of war, they were convinced of the certainty of it. When the sun showed her yellow head tomorrow morning, she would look upon the inevitable. The crystal yelled so close to his heart pulsed, sensing his thoughts. Velen turned to his companions and looked upon them sorrowfully. The orcs will not be dissuaded from this path, he said, and therefore, if we are to survive, we too must walk the path to war. Far in the distance, broken, dying, resting as peacefully as possible below the waters of the sacred pool, the being known as Kaor uttered a deep, agonizing cry. Velen startled, recognizing the voice, and bowed his head. The frostwolf orcs gasped at the sound and turned to regard the perfect triangle of Ashuga. The ancestors are angry with us, a young shaman cried, angry for letting Velen go. Duratan shook his head. He ought to rebuke the youngster, and on the morrow, if such words were uttered again, he would. But now, his heart was full of sorrow. It was not a cry of anger that came from the sacred mountain. It was the wrenching sound of an ultimate grief. And he shuddered and sighed as he wondered why the ancestors mourned so very, very deeply. Chapter 11 Nerzul Galdan two of the darkest names ever to sully the history of my people. And yet, Drikthar tells me that once Nerzul was admired, even beloved, and truly cared for the people whose spiritual leader he was. It is hard to reconcile those words with what Nerzul has become, but I try. I try because I want to understand. And yet, try as I might, I do not. What? Nerzul's shriek of outrage made his apprentice Goldan wince. Duratin did not bat an eye. I released the prophet Velen, the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan said calmly. Your orders were to take him and the others prisoner. Nerzul's voice climbed with each word. It had been so plain, so easy. What had Duratin been thinking? To toss away this opportunity like bones when the meat had been devoured. How much information could they have extracted from Velen? What kind of bargaining power over the Drenai would he have bought them? But that thought was dwarfed by the overwhelming horror of how Kil'jaeden would react. What would he do when he learned that Velen had not been captured? The beautiful being had been seemingly well pleased at the prospect when Nerzul told him of the plan. Flushed with pride at his cleverness, thinking victory already assured, Nerzul had even dared to offer Velen to Kil'jaeden as a sort of present. Now what would happen? The realization that he felt fear rather than chagrin at bringing disappointing news 
was not lost on the shaman. You put me in charge of the capture, and capture them I did, Duratan replied. But there is no honor in a prisoner taken willingly. You want us to be strong as a people, rather than as individual clans. But we cannot do that without a code that is inviolable, that is... Duratan continued speaking in his gruff, deep voice, but Ner'zhul was no longer listening. At that instant, that frozen space and time, Ner'zhul had a sudden realization that Kill Jaden might not be the benevolent spirit he presented himself as. Duratan, lost in his own voice, speaking words to explain his decision, did not notice the shaman shift in attention. But Ner'zhul felt Gul'dan's gaze upon him, and another fear welled up inside him that Gul'dan was bearing witness to his master's first hints of doubt. What was the right thing to do? How can I best serve? Why is Rolkan no longer coming to me? He blinked and came back to himself when he realized that Duratan had ceased speaking. The large chieftain was regarding Ner'zhul intently, waiting for the shaman to speak. How best to handle this? Duratan was well regarded among the clans. If Ner'zhul punished Duratan for his decision, there would be many who would respond with sympathy to the Frostwolf clan. It could cause a rift in the fabric Ner'zhul was trying to weave. The tightly knit fabric of a united orc nation, a horde if you will. On the other hand, if he condoned Duratan's actions, it would be a severe and insulting blow to those who had fervently supported his previous position that the Drenai must die. He could not decide. He stared at Duratan, who began to frown slightly. My master is so overcome with rage that he cannot speak, came Gul'dan's smooth voice. Both Duratan and Ner'zhul turned to look at the younger shaman. You have disobeyed a direct order from your spiritual leader. Return to your camp, Duratan, son of Garad. My master will send you a letter shortly conveying his decision. Duratan glanced back at Ner'zhul, his dislikes of Gul'dan plain on his broad face. Ner'zhul gathered himself and stood tall, and this time, when he reached for words, he found them. Be gone, Duratan. You have displeased me, and worse. You have displeased the being who has shown us such favor. You will hear from me soon enough. Duratan bowed, but did not leave immediately. There is one thing I do bring you, he said. He extended a small bundle to Ner'zhul. The shaman accepted it with hands that shook, in hope desperately that both Duratan and Gul'dan would interpret the trembling as fury and not fear. We took these off the prisoners, Duratan continued. Our shaman believe that they may hold power that we can use against the Drenai. He hesitated a moment longer, as if waiting for further word from Ner'zhul. When the silence stretched long and uncomfortably between them, he bowed again and left. For a long moment, neither master or apprentice spoke. My master, please forgive me for interrupting. I saw you were so overcome that you could not speak, and I feared that the Frostwolf boy would misinterpret your anger as hesitancy. Ner'zhul shot him a searching look. The words sounded sincere. Gul'dan's face looked sincere. And yet, there was once a time when Ner'zhul would have confessed his doubts to his apprentice. He had trusted and trained him for years. But now, at this moment, although battered by uncertainties, as if by opposing winds, Ner'zhul knew one thing very clearly. He did not want Gul'dan to see any weakness in him. I was indeed overcome with rage, Ner'zhul lied. Honor serves nothing if it hurts your people. He realized he was clutching the bundle Duratan had given him. Gul'dan was staring at it almost hungrily. What did Duratan give you to offset your anger with him? Gul'dan inquired. Ner'zhul looked at him with a superior air. I will examine it first. And share it with Kil Jaden, apprentice, he said coolly. He was looking for a reaction and dreaded seeing it. For the briefest of moments, anger flitted across Gul'dan's face. Then the younger orc bowed deeply and said contritely, Of course, my master. It was arrogant of me to expect. I am merely curious, that is all, to see if the Frostwolf chieftain has contributed anything of worth. Ner'zhul softened somewhat. Gul'dan had served him well and loyally for many years now, and indeed, 
would succeed Ner'zhul when the time came. He was jumping at shadows. Of course, Ner'zhul said more gently. I will let you know if I learn anything. After all, you are my apprentice, are you not? Gul'dan brightened. I serve you in all things, my master. Looking happier, he bowed again and left Ner'zhul alone. Ner'zhul sat heavily on the skins that served him for a bed. He cradled the bundle in his lap and said a prayer to the ancestors that if Duritan had failed to deliver the leader of the Drenai, perhaps at least the Frostwolf chieftain had managed to obtain something of value. He took a deep breath, unwrapped the bundle, and gasped. Nestled against soft fur were two glowing gems. Gingerly, Ner'zhul touched the red one and gasped again. Energy, excitement, and a sense of power flowed through him. His hands wanted to grip a weapon, although he had had no need for one for years. He yearned to swing it. Somehow, he knew that if this crystal were on his person, his aim would be true. What a gift this was to the orcs. He would have to see how he could turn this hot, red passion for fighting that lurked in the center of the stone to his purposes. The yellow one next. Ner'zhul grasped it. This time, he had some idea of what to expect. Again, he felt it emanating warmth and a sensation of power. But this time, there was no excitement, no urgency. As he held the yellow crystal, his mind cleared and he realized that he had hitherto been seeing things as if in a fog-dense valley. He could not find the words to describe it, but there was a purity, a clarity, a precision to everything. It was, in fact, so keen, so clear that Ner'zhul began to perceive this opening of his mind as pain. He dropped the crystal back into his lap. The brilliant clarity, knife sharp, faded somewhat. Ner'zhul smiled. If he did not have Velen himself to present to kill Jaden, at least he had these precious items to offer to appease the magnificent being. Kill Jaden was furious. Ner'zhul quaked before that anger, prostrating himself on the earth, murmuring, Forgive me, as Kill Jaden raged. He squeezed his eyes shut, anticipating pain such as he had never experienced to suddenly start shooting along his body, when abruptly the raging ceased. Cautiously, Ner'zhul risked a glance to his benefactor. Kill Jaden was once more looking serene, poised, and calm and bathed in radiance. They are of little use to me, said Kill Jaden. Ner'zhul winced. But I think your people might find them helpful in your battle to crush the Drenai. That is your battle, is it not? Fear again clenched at Ner'zhul's heart. Of course, Lord, it is the ancestor's will. Kil'jaden looked at him for a moment, his brilliant eyes emanating flames. It is my will, he said simply, and Ner'zhul nodded frantically. Of course, of course, it is your will, and I obey you in all things. Kil'jaden seemed satisfied by the response and nodded. Then he was gone, and Ner'zhul sank back, wiping a face greasy with the sweat of terror. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a flash of something white. Gul'dan had seen everything. We have been planning an attack for some time now, and last night, when the pale lady did not shine, we descended in force upon the sleeping little town. Not a one was left alive, not even the few children we found. Their supplies, food, armor, weapons, some strange items we know nothing of and shun. This bounty is now shared between the two ununified clans. Their blood, blue and thick, dries now upon our faces and we dance in celebration. There was more to the missive, but Ner'zhul did not read it. He did not have to. Although the details might be different, the essence of the letters was always the same. A successful attack, glory in the killing, the ecstasy of blood spilled. Ner'zhul glanced at a pile of letters he had received just that morning, seven of them. With each month that passed, even throughout the long, hard winter months, the orcs grew more skilled at killing Drenai. They had learned much about their foe with each victory. The stones that Duritan had given Ner'zhul proved to be valuable indeed. Ner'zhul worked with them, alone at first, and then in the company of other shaman. The red stone they dubbed the Heart of Fury, and they found that when the leader of a raid carried it, not only did he fight with more energy and skill, but everyone under his command benefited as well. The stone was passed from clan to clan at each new moon, 
and was highly coveted. Yet Nerzul knew no one would dare to steal it for himself. The second stone he called the Brilliant Star, and he found that when a shaman carried the crystal, he or she experienced a profound focus and clarity. While the Heart of Fury roused the emotions, the Brilliant Star calmed them. The thought process was swifter and more precise, and concentration was not easily broken. The result was powerful magic, precisely controlled, another key to orcish victory. The delicious irony that they were using the Drenai's own magic against them further improved the morale among the orcs. But all these things did not hearten Erzul. The sudden flash of doubt that had shuddered through him when he had spoken with Durtan had shaken him to the bone. He fought back the suspicions, terrified that somehow Kil'jaeden was able to read his thoughts, but they came, like maggots writhing from a corpse, to haunt his sleeping and waking thoughts. Kil'jaeden looked very, very similar to the Drenai. Was it possible that they were somehow the same? It was he, Ner'zhul, being used in some sort of civil war. One night, he found he could no longer bear it. Silently, he dressed and roused his wolf sky chaser, who stretched and blinked at him sleepily. Come, my friend, Ner'zhul said affectionately as he settled on the gray creature's back. He had never before ridden to the sacred mountain. Always he had walked, as was tradition. But he needed to return before he was missed, and he was certain that the urgency of this mission would mitigate his offense with the ancestors. It was almost spring, almost time for the Koshark festival, but spring seemed far away as the cold wind bit at Nerzul's ears and nose. He huddled down, grateful for the warmth of the massive wolf, and shielded himself as best he could from the wind and now snow. The wolf pressed on through the drifts, making steady, if not swift, progress. At last, Nerzul looked up and saw the perfect triangle of the mountainous spirits, and a great weight suddenly lifted from his heart. For the first time in months, he truly felt as if he was doing the right thing. Sky Chaser would have difficulty climbing, so with the command to stay, he settled down, burrowing into a drift and curling up tightly. Nerzul did not imagine he would be more than a few hours, and hurried to climb the mountain with more alacrity than he had felt in a long time, his sack heavy with water skins and his heart full of anticipation. He should have done this long ago. He should have gone right to the source of wisdom, as Shaman before him had done. He had no idea why he had never thought of this before. At last he came to the entrance and paused before the perfect oval. As anxious as he was to reach the ancestors, he knew the ritual must be honored. He lit the bundle of dry grasses he carried, and let its sweet scent calm and purify his thoughts. Then he stepped forward, murmuring a spell to light the torches that lined the walk. Nerzul had walked this path more times than he could recall, and his feet moved steadily, as if of their own accord. Down twined the smooth path, and Nerzul's heart raced with hope as he stepped forward into the darkness. It seemed to take longer than usual for him to become aware of the increase in light. Nerzul stepped into the cavern, and thought that somehow, the light emanating from the sacred pool seemed dimmer than it had been in the past. The thought unsettled him. He took a deep breath and chided himself. He was bringing his own external fears into the sacred space, nothing more. He stepped to the pool, removed the water skins from his pack, and poured out the contents. The soft splashing of water was the only sound, and it seemed to echo. His offering complete, Nerzul sat by the water's edge and waited, gazing into the radiant depths. Nothing happened. He did not panic. Sometimes the ancestors took their time about responding. But when more time had passed, Uncase began to stir in Erzul's heart. Moved, he spoke aloud. Ancestors, beloved dead, I, Nerzul, shaman of the Shadowmoon clan, leader to your children, have come seeking, no, begging wisdom. I, I have lost my way to your light. The times are dark and fearful even as we grow stronger more united as a people. I question the path I am on, and I beseech your guidance. Please, if ever you loved and cared for those who have followed in your footsteps, come to me now and advise me, that I may lead them well. His voice quavered. He knew he sounded lost and pathetic, and for a moment stubborn pride made him flush with shame. 
but then that feeling was chased away by the knowledge that he did care for his people, and he did want to do what was right for them, and at this moment he had no idea what that might be. The pool began to glow, and Erzul leaned forward eagerly, his eyes roaming the surface, and in the water he saw a face looking back at him. Ralkan, he breathed. For a moment quick tears mercifully blurred her image. He blinked and his heart lurched with pain as he saw the look in her ghostly eyes. It was hatred. Nerzul recoiled as if struck. Other faces began to appear in the water, dozens of them. All of them had the same expression. Nausea welled in him and he cried out, Please, help me. Grant me your wisdom that I may win favor again in your eyes. Rokhan's severe features softened somewhat, and it was with a trace of compassion in her voice that she spoke. There is nothing you can do, not now, not in a hundred years, to win favor in our eyes. You are not a savior of your people, but their betrayer. No, he shrieked. No. Tell me what to do, and I will do it. It is not too late. Surely it is not too late. You are not strong enough, said another rumbling voice, this one male. If you were, you would never walk so far down this path. You would have not been so easily gulled into doing the will of one who bears no love for our people. But I do not understand, Merzul murmured. Ralkan, you came to me. I heard you. You, Grekshar, you advised me. Kiljaden was the one you wanted me to embrace. The great friend to all the orcs. She said nothing in response to this. She did not have to. Even as the words tumbled from his lips, he understood now how profoundly he had been misled. The ancestors had never appeared to him at all. It had all been a trick concocted by Kiljaden, whoever, whatever he was. They were right not to trust Nerzul now. Any shaman who would be so easily deceived could never be trusted to put things right again. All was an elaborate web of lies and deceit and manipulation, and he, Nerzul, had been the first foolish insect to become inextricably trapped in it. Nearly a hundred Drenai were dead. There was no turning back, no requesting aid from the ancestors. He could not trust any of his visions ever again, except to understand that they were likely to be lies. Worst of all, he had delivered his people into the hands of one who, despite his fair appearance and honeyed words, did not have their best interests in whatever passed for his heart. Even as he stared into the ghostly eyes of his beloved, she turned away from him. One by one, the myriad faces reflected in the water followed suit. Nerzul trembled with the horror of what he had done. There was nothing he could do to make it right. Nothing he could do except continue on this path that Kiljaden had so carefully contrived for him to walk, and prayed to ancestors, who no longer listened to him, that somehow some way, things would turn out all right. He buried his face in his hands and wept. Crouching in the darkness in a bend in the tunnel, Gul'dan listened to the sound of his master sobbing and smiled to himself. Kil'jaden would be grateful for the information. Chapter 12 We are all weak in one way or another. It does not matter the species. Sometimes that weakness is a strength in disguise. Sometimes... It is our utter undoing. Sometimes it is both. The wise man understands his weakness and seeks to find a lesson from it. The fool lets it control and destroy him. And sometimes the wise man is a fool. As he rode back atop Sky Chaser, hands so cold that he wondered if he would ever be able to unclench them and twine them thick black fur, Nerzul wished for the dark night to swallow him. How could he return to his people? knowing what he had done to them. On the other hand, how could he flee, and where would he possibly go that Kiljaden would not find him? He longed bitterly for the courage to take the ritual knife he carried at all times and drive it into his heart, but he knew he could not. Suicide was not regarded with honor among his people. It was a coward's answer to the problems that came to him. He would not be permitted to live on as a spirit if he took that seductive way to escape the horrors that confronted him. He could continue to pretend that he suspected nothing, and even perhaps subtly undercut Kiljaden. Despite his massive powers, there had been no evidence that the so-called Beautiful One had the ability to read thoughts. The thought brightened Nerzul somewhat. 
Yes, he could mitigate the damage this interloper was trying to do to his people. That was how he could continue to serve. Exhausted both physically and emotionally, Nerzul stumbled into his tent in that faint hour before dawn, looking forward to simply collapsing on the skins and sleeping in an effort to forget, for at least a brief while, the agony of what he had brought about. Instead, a bright light nearly blinded him and he fell to his knees. You would betray me then, said the beautiful one. Nerzul threw up his hands, trying vainly to protect his eyes from the awesome radiance. His stomach roiled and he feared he was about to be sick in his terror. The light dimmed somewhat, and he lowered his hands. Standing beside Kil'jaeden was Ner'zhul's apprentice, grinning darkly. Gul'dan, whispered Ner'zhul sickly, what have you done? I have informed Kil'jaeden of a rodent, Gul'dan said calmly. That dreadful smile never left his face, and he will decide what to do with the vermin who would so turn against him. There was still snow on Gul'dan's shoulders. Dully, Ner'zhul realized what had happened. His apprentice, hungry for power, how was it Ner'zhul had closed his eyes to the obvious for so long, had followed him, had heard the ancestor's words, and still he clung to kill Jaden after hearing the same things Ner'zhul had heard. For a moment, his own fear and selfishness went away, and Ner'zhul felt only a wave of pity for an orc who had fallen so far. It wounds me, kill Jaden said. Ner'zhul looked at him, startled. I chose you, Ner'zhul. I gave you my powers. I showed you what you needed to do to advance your people and ensure that they are never second in this world. Ner'zhul spoke without thinking. You have deceived me. You have sent me false visions. You have maligned the ancestors and all they stood for. I don't know why you are doing this, but I know that it is not out of love for my people, and yet they flourish. They are united for the first time in many centuries. United under a lie, Ner'zhul said. He was giddy in his rebellion. It felt good. Perhaps if he continued, Kil'jaeden would lose patience with him and slay him, and Ner'zhul's problem would be solved. But Kil'jaeden did not respond with deadly fury, as Ner'zhul hoped he would. Instead, the being sighed deeply and shook his head, like a parent disappointed in a wayward child. You may yet regain my favor, Ner'zhul, Kil'jaeden said. I have a task for you. If you complete it, your lapse of faith will be overlooked. Ner'zhul's lips moved. He wanted to shout out his rebellion again, but this time the words would not come. He realized that the moment had passed. He did not want to die, any more than any sane, living being wanted to die. And so he remained silent. What happened with the Frostwolf chieftain troubles me, Kil'jaeden continued not least because he is not the only one who has murmured against what is happening. There are others. The one who wields the Doomhammer. Some among the Blackwind and Redwalker clans as well. It would be one thing if these opposing voices belong to those of no consequence, but many of them do not. There must be no risk to the success of my plan. Therefore, I will guarantee their obedience. It is not enough for them to swear loyalty Kil'jaeden continued. He tapped his cheek with one long red finger thoughtfully. Too many seem enamored of changing what honor and oath mean. We must ensure their cooperation for now and for all time. Gul'dan's small eyes glinted. What is it you suggest, Great One? Kil'jaeden smiled at Gul'dan. Already, Ner'zhul could see the bond between them, see how like Kil'jaeden Gul'dan was in a way that Ner'zhul had never been. Kil'jaeden had been forced to use seductive lies and trickery in order to pull Ner'zhul to his cause. With Gul'dan, he could speak openly. There is such a way, Kil'jaeden said, speaking to both Orc Shaman now, a way to make them forever bound to us, forever loyal. Ner'zhul had thought that he had become inured to the horror after what the ancestors had revealed to him, but now he realized that he was capable of experiencing an entirely new level of shock as he listened to kill Jaden's outline for the plan. Forever bound, forever loyal, forever enslaved. He looked up into kill Jaden's blazing eyes, and words would not come. A nod would suffice, he knew, but he could not even bring himself to do that. Instead, he simply stared, transfixed 
like a bird before a snake. Kiljaden heaved a deep sigh. You refuse your chance at redemption in my eyes, then. As he heard Kiljaden speak, it was as if a spell had been removed from Nerzul. The words that had been stuck in his throat came rushing out, and although he knew they would mean his doom, the shaman made no move to stop them. I refuse utterly to forever doom my people to a life of slavery, he cried. Kiljaden listened, then nodded his massive head. This is your choice. You have also chosen the consequences. Know this, shaman. Your choice averts nothing. My desires will still be carried out. Your people will still be slaves. But instead of leading them and lingering in my favor, you will be forced to be a helpless observer. I think that will be sweeter than if I simply slew you. Nerzul opened his mouth to speak, but he could not. Kiljaden narrowed his great eyes, and Nerzul could not even move. Even his heart, slamming wildly in his chest, beat only by the will of Lord Kiljaden, and he knew it. How had he been such a gullible fool? How had he not seen through the lies? How could he have mistaken an illusion sent by this, this monster to be the spirit of his beloved mate? Tears welled in his eyes and slipped down his cheeks, only he knew because Kiljaden permitted it. Kiljaden smiled at him, and slowly, deliberately, turned his attention to Gul'dan. Even in his wretched state, Nerzul took the faintest comfort in the knowledge that he had not turned to Kiljaden with the expression Gul'dan now wore, that of a hungry pup eager for praise. There is no need to trap you with pretty lies, is there, my new tool, said Kiljaden, speaking almost fondly to Gul'dan. You do not shrink from the truth. Indeed, no, Lord. I live to do your bidding. Kiljaden chuckled. If I will do away with lies, so must you. You live for power. You hunger for it. You thirst for it. And over the last few months, your skill has grown to where I can make proper use of you. Ours is not a partnership of adoration or respect, but one of convenience and selfish benefit, which means that it will likely last. Various emotions flitted across Galdan's face. He did not seem to know how to react to the words, and Nerzul took pleasure in his former apprentice's discomforts. As you will, Gul'dan stammered finally, then with more confidence. Tell me what you would have me do, and I swear it will be done. You have no doubt perceived that I wish to exterminate the Drenai. Why I do so is no concern of yours. You need only know that I wish it. The orcs are doing moderately well in this, but they can do better. They shall do better. A warrior is only as good as his weapons, and, Gul'dan, I intend to give you and your people such weapons as you have never conceived. It will take a little time. You must be educated first, before you are fit to teach the others. Are you ready and willing? Gul'dan's eyes shone. Begin the lessons, glorious one, and you will see how apt a pupil of yours I am. Kiljaden laughed. Duratan was covered with blood, much of it his own. What had gone wrong? Everything had progressed as normal. They had found the hunting party, descended upon them, initiated the attack, and waited for the shaman to use their magic to fight the Drenai. They did not do so. Instead, Frostwolf after Frostwolf fell beneath the shining blades and blue-white magics of the Drenai. At one point, fighting for his very life, Duratan saw that Drek'thar was fighting desperately, using nothing but his staff. What had happened? Why had this shaman not come to his aid? What was Drek'thar thinking? He could wield a staff hardly better than a child. Why did he not use his magic? The Drenai fought furiously. Seizing the opportunities the shaman's inexplicable inaction had given them, they pressed their attack harder than Duratan had ever seen, their eyes glinting as for perhaps the first time they sensed victory. The grass was slippery with blood, and Duratan's feet went out from under him. He fell, and his attacker raised his sword. This was the moment, then. He would die in glorious battle, except he did not feel that this was a glorious battle. By instinct, alone, he raised his axe to parry the blow that would come, although his arm had been deeply cut at the joint of the armor, and his limb quivered. He looked up into the eyes of the one who would slay him, and recognized Restalon. At that moment, the Drenai captain of the guard's own glowing blue eyes widened in recognition 
and he stayed his blow. Durdan gasped for breath, trying to summon the energy to rise and continue the fight. Restalon uttered something in his ulgulating tongue, and every Drenai halted almost in mid-swing. As Durtan got to his feet, he realized that there were only a handful of his warriors left alive. Two more moments of the battle, and the Drenai would have slaughtered the entire party, with only two or three casualties on their own side. Restalon whirled on Durtan. Various expressions warred on his ugly face, compassion, disgust, regret, determination. For the act of compassion and honor you showed our prophet, Duratan, son of Garad, you and those of your clan who yet live have been spared. Treat your wounded and return to your homes, but do not think to receive such mercy from us again. Honor has been satisfied. Duratan weaved as if he had too much to drink as blood dripped from the deep wound. He forced himself to stay on his feet by sheer will as the Drenai turned and disappeared over the horizon. Once they were out of sight, he could force his legs to hold him no longer, and he fell to his knees. Several ribs had been cracked or broken, and each inhalation sent a stabbing pain through him. Duratan. It was Draka. She too had been badly injured, but her voice was strong. Relief washed over Duratan. Thank the ancestors she yet lived. Drek'thar hurried up to him and placed his hands on Duratan's heart, murmuring under his breath. Warmth flooded Duratan, and the pain ceased. He took a deep, nourishing breath. At least they will let me heal, said Drek'thar, so softly that Duratan was scarce certain he heard the words. Tend to the others, and then we will speak, Duratan said. Drek'thar nodded, not meeting his chieftain's eyes. He and the other shaman hastened to magically heal what wounds they could, and treat with salves and bandages what they could not. Duratan still had injuries, but nothing life-threatening, and he assisted the shaman. When Duratan had done all that he could, he rose and looked around. No fewer than fifteen bodies were stiffening on the green grass, including Rokar, his second. Duratan shook his head in stunned belief. He would have to return with litters to bear the fallen back to their lands. They would burn on a pyre, their bodies given to fire, their ashes to air, to be consumed by water and earth. Their spirits would go to Ashugan, and the shaman would converse with them on matters of profound importance. Or would they? Something terrible had happened, and it was time he found out what. Sudden anger flooded him at the waist. Despite what the ancestors had told him, something inside Duratan continued to whisper that this attack on the Drenai was a grave mistake. He whirled on Drek'thar, and with a deep growl, seized the smaller orc where he sat gulping water and hauled him to his feet. This was a slaughter, Duratan cried, shaking him furiously. Fifteen of our kin lie dead before us. The earth drinks deeply of their blood, and I never saw you or any of the others lend your skill to the fight. For a moment, Drek'thar could not speak. The meadow was deathly silent as every frostwolf watched the confrontation. Then, in a faint voice, Drek'thar replied, The elements. They would not come this time. Duratan's eyes narrowed, still clutching Drek'thar by the front of his leather jerkin. He demanded of the wide-eyed, silent shaman, Is this true? They would not lend their aid to the battle. Looking stunned and sick, the shaman nodded. One said in a quavering voice, It is true, great chieftain. I asked all of them in turn. They said... They said it was out of balance, and they would no longer permit us to use their powers. Duratan's shock was broken by an angry hiss. He turned to see Draka's scowling face. This is more than a sign. This is a shout, a battle cry, that what we are doing is wrong. Slowly, trying to comprehend the magnitude of what had happened, Duratan nodded. If it were not for the mercy Restalon had shown him, he and every last member of the war party would be lying on the earth, their bodies growing colder by the moment. The elements had refused their assistance. They had condemned what the shaman were asking of them. Duratan took a deep breath and shook his head, as if to physically shake away the dark thoughts. Let us get the injured back to their homes as swiftly as we may, and then, then I will send out letters. If what I fear is true, that is not only the shaman of the Frostwolf clan who are shunned by the elements 
for what we are doing to the Drenai, then we must confront Ner'zhul. Chapter 13 How is it we did not see? It is easy to lay the blame on the charismatic Kil'jaeden, or the weak Ner'zhul, or the power-hungry Gul'dan for our fall. But they asked each individual orc to pretend that hot was cold, that sweet was sour, and even when everything in us screamed against what we were being told, we followed. I was not there. I cannot say why. Perhaps I, too, would have obeyed like a whip cur. Perhaps the fear was so great, or the respect for our leaders was so ingrained, perhaps. Or perhaps I, like my father and others, would start to see the flaws. I would like to think so. Black Hand looked out from under his bushy eyebrows, frowning. He always looked like he was frowning, perhaps because he almost always was. I do not know about this, Galdan, he rumbled. His oversized hand went to the hilt of his sword, fondling it in an uneasy gesture. When Galdan had asked to meet with Black Hand a fortnight ago, and to bring his most promising shaman, but to tell no one of what they were to be doing, he had agreed. Black Hand had always liked Galdan better than Erzul, although he was not sure why. When Galdan sat down with him over a lavish meal and explained the current situation, Black Hand was very glad he had come. Now he knew why he liked Galdan so much. The former apprentice, now master, was like Black Hand himself. He had no use for ideals, only practicalities, and power, good food, lavish armor, and bloodshed were things both orcs craved. Black Hand was chieftain of the Black Rock Orcs. He could rise no higher, at least not until now. When the clans were separate, the greatest glory was to lead one's clan. But now, now they were working together. Now Black Hand could see the glint of greed in Galdan's small eyes. He could almost smell the hunger wafting off the other orc, a hunger he shared. Their Zul is an honored and valued advisor, Galdan said as he chewed a dried fruit, extending a claw to pick a chunk where it had gotten lodged between his teeth. He has great wisdom, but it has been decided that I would be a better choice to lead the orcs from this point on. Black Hand grinned savagely, and Erzul was nowhere to be seen. And a wise leader surrounds himself with trusted allies, Galdan continued, those who are strong and obedient who will fulfill their obligations, and who, for their loyalty, will be held in high regard and richly rewarded. Blackhand had begun to bridle at the description obedient, but was mollified when Galdan mentioned high regard and richly rewarded. He glanced over at the eight shaman he had brought to Galdan. They were sitting huddled over a second fire some distance away, being attended to by Galdan's servants. They looked wretchedly unhappy, and were conveniently out of earshot. Blackhand said, You asked for the shaman. I assume you know what is happening to them. Galdan sighed and reached for a tall buck leg. He bit deeply into it, the juices running down his face. He wiped his jutting jaw absently, chewed, swallowed, and answered, Yes, I have heard. The elements are no longer obeying them. Blackhand watched him intently. Some are beginning to mutter, that it is because what we are doing is wrong. Do you think that? Black Hand shrugged his massive shoulders. I don't know what to think. This is all new territory. The ancestors say one thing, but the elements won't come. He was harboring a growing suspicion about the ancestors as well, but held his tongue. Black Hand knew that many thought him a fool. He preferred to let them think that he was nothing more than a strong arm and a powerful sword. He gave him distinct advantages. Galdan perused him now, and Black Hand wondered if the new spiritual leader of the orcs had sensed that there was more to the orc leader than met the eye. We are a proud race, Galdan said. It is sometimes painful to admit we do not know everything. Kill Jaden and the entities he leads, ah, Black Hand, the mysteries they harbor, the power they wield, power they are willing to share with us. Galdan's eyes sparkled now with excitement. Black Hand's own heart began to race. Galdan leaned forward and continued to speak in an odd whisper. We are as ignorant as children before them, even you, even I, but they are willing to teach us. 
share with us some of their power, power that is not dependent upon the whim of the spirits of air, earth, fire, and water. Gul'dan made a dismissive gesture. Power such as that is feeble. It is not reliable. It can desert you in the middle of a battle and leave you helpless. Blackhand's face hardened. He had witnessed this very thing, and it had taken all the strength of his warriors to snatch victory when the shaman had begun yelping in terror that the elements were no longer working with them. I am listening, he growled softly. Imagine what you could do if you let a group of shaman, who controlled the source of the powers, instead of begging and scraping for it, Gul'dan continued. Imagine if these shaman had servants who could also fight on your side. Servants who could, say, send your enemies fleeing helplessly in terror, suck their magic dry as the insects in the summer suck blood, distract them so that their attention was not on battle. Blackhand lifted a bushy eyebrow. I can imagine success under those conditions. Success almost every time. Gul'dan nodded, grinning. Exactly. But how do you know this is true, and not some false promise whispered in your ear? Gul'dan's grin widened. Because, my friend, I have experienced this, and I will teach your shaman over there everything I know. Impressive, rumbled Blackhand. But that is not all I can offer. The warriors, I know a way to make you, and everyone who fights at your side more powerful, fiercer, deadlier. All this can be ours, if we but claim it. Ours. I cannot continue to waste my time speaking with every single leader of every single clan every time they have a complaint, Gul'dan said, waving his hand imperiously. There are those who are in agreement with what you and I think is the best way to proceed, and those who are not. Go on, said Blackhand. But Gul'dan did not, at least not right away. He was silent, gathering his thoughts. Blackhand grasped a stick and poked at the fire. He knew well that most of the orcs, even those of his own clan, thought him a hothead and impetuous. But he knew the value of patience. I envisioned two groups of leaders of the orcs. One, a simple governing council to make decisions for the whole, its leader elected, its business conducted openly for all to see. The second, a shadow of this group, hidden, secret, powerful, Galdan said quietly. This, this Shadow Council, will be comprised of orcs who share our vision, and who are willing to make the necessary sacrifices to obtain it. Blackhand nodded. Yes, yes, I see. A public leadership, and a private one. Gul'dan's mouth stretched in a slow grin. Blackhand regarded him for a moment, then asked the question, And to which shall I belong? Both, my friend, Gul'dan answered smoothly. You are a born leader. You have charisma, strength, and even your enemies know you are a master strategist. It will be case itself to have you elected as leader of the orcs. Blackhand's eyes flashed. I am no puppet, he growled softly. Of course not, said Gul'dan, which is why I said you would belong to both. You would be the leader of this new breed of orc, this horde, if you will, and you will be on the Shadow Council as well. We cannot work together unless we can trust one another, can we? Blackhand gazed into Gul'dan's glinting, clever eyes and smiled. He did not trust the shaman in the least bit, and he suspected that Gul'dan felt the same about him. It didn't matter. They both wanted power. Blackhand knew he did not possess the talents and skills that would enable him to wield the sort of power for which Gul'dan lusted, and Gul'dan did not want the sort of power Blackhand craved. They were not in competition, but in league. What benefited one would benefit the other not rob him of a thing. Blackhand thought of his family, his mate Urukal, his two sons Rend and Mame, his daughter Grisilda. He did not dote on them the way that the weak Duritan doted on his mate Draka, of course, but he cared for them. He wanted to see his mate bedecked in jewels, his sons and daughters revered, as befitted the children of Blackhand. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught a movement. Turning, he beheld Nerzul, once the powerful, and now the discarded, slipping out of the door of the tent. What about him, Blackhand asked. Gul'dan shrugged. What about him? He means nothing now. The beautiful one wishes to keep him alive for the moment. He seems to have something special in mind for Ner'zhul. He will still be a figurehead. Love of Ner'zhul is too ingrained in the orcs to cast him aside just yet. But do not worry. He is no threat to us. The Blackrock Shaman 
You say you will train them in these new magics, the magics that you yourself have studied, that they will be invincible. I will train them myself, and if they adapt well to the new arts, I will place them first among my new warlocks. Warlock. So that is the name of this new type of magic. It had an interesting sound to it, Warlock. And the Blackrock Warlocks would be the first ones chosen. Blackhand, chieftain of the Blackrock clan, what say you to my proposal? Blackhand slowly turned to Gul'dan. I say, hail to the Horde, and hail to the Shadow Council. It was an angry crowd that showed up at the front door of the Sacred Mountain. Duritan had sent out messages to the others he trusted, and had received confirmation that the elements indeed had shunned the shaman. One particular painful report came from the Bone Chewer clan. Their entire party had fallen to the Drenai, their annihilation remaining a mystery until a few days later when a shaman who had stayed behind tried to heal a sick child. Now they were coming, the clan leaders and their shaman, to meet with Nerzul and demand an explanation. Nerzul came out to greet them, waving his hands and asking for silence. I know why you have come today, he said. Duritan frowned. Nerzul was far away and seemed to be a mere speck, and yet Duritan could hear him perfectly. He knew that usually Nerzul achieved this feat by asking the wind to bear his words so that all could hear him. Yet, if the elements had indeed refused the shaman, how was that possible? He exchanged glances with Draka, but both remained silent. It is indeed true that the elements no longer answer the shaman's call for aid. Nerzul kept speaking, but his words were being drowned by the angry shouts. He looked down for a moment, and Duritan regarded him closely. The spiritual leader of the orcs looked more frail, more downtrodden than Duritan had ever seen. Of course, Duritan thought. After a few moments, the shouting died down. The orcs assembled were angry, but they wanted answers more than they wanted to vent their rage. Some of you have upon discovering this, lead to a conclusion that what we are doing is wrong, but that is incorrect. What we are doing is achieving power, the likes of which we have never seen. My apprentice, the noble Gul'dan, has studied these powers. I will let him answer any questions you have. Erzul turned and, leaning heavily on his staff, stepped aside. Gul'dan bowed deeply to his master. Erzul did not seem to notice. He stood his eyes closed, looking old and frail. In contrast, Duritan had never seen Gul'dan looking better. There was a new energy about the orc, a strong sense of confidence in his bearing and his voice when he spoke. What I am about to tell you may be hard for you to accept, but I have faith that my people are not closed-minded when it comes to the ways to better themselves, he said. His voice was clear and strong. Just as we were surprised and awed to learn that there were more powerful beings other than the ancestors and the elements, we have discovered that there are ways to harness magic other than cooperating with the elements, power that is not predicated on asking or begging or pleading, power that comes because we are strong enough to demand it to come, to control it when it does, to force it to obey us, bend to our will, rather than the other way around. Gul'dan paused to let this sink in looking around at the gathered orcs. Duritan glanced at Drek'thar. Is this possible? he asked his friend. Drek'thar shrugged helplessly. He looked completely startled at Gul'dan's words. I have no idea, he said. But I tell you, after that last battle, Duritan, the shaman were doing the work of the ancestors. How could the elements refuse us under those circumstances? How could the ancestors allow such a thing? His voice turned bitter as he spoke. The shock and shame was still upon him. Duritan understood that the shaman felt like a warrior who had reached confidently for his axe and found it turning to smoke in his hands. An axe a trusted friend had given him, an axe he had been asked to use in a good cause. Yes, yes, I see you understand the value of what I, what the beautiful one who has taken us under his wing is offering, said Gul'dan nodding. I have studied with this great entity, as have these few noble shamans. He stepped back and several shaman, dressed in some of the most beautifully tooled leather armor Duritan had ever seen, stepped forward. They are all black rock orcs, Draka murmured, her brows drawing together in a frown. Duritan had noticed that too. What they have learned, Gul'dan continued, 
will be taught to every single shaman who wishes to be instructed. This I swear to you. Follow me now to the open lands, where our Koshar rituals have been held as far back as anyone can remember. I will have them demonstrate their formidable skills. For some reason he could not fathom, Duratan felt suddenly ill. Draka squeezed his arm reassuringly, noticing his abrupt paleness. My mate, what is it? She asked quietly as, along with everyone else assembled, the two moved toward the Koshark festival grounds. He shook his head. I don't know, he said in an equally soft voice. I just... I feel as though something terrible is about to happen. Draka grunted. I have been feeling that way for a long time now. Duratan kept his face neutral with an effort. He was responsible for the welfare of his people, and his position with Ner'zhul, and likely now Gul'dan, was already precarious. Duratan was well aware that if either shaman sought to discredit him or his clan, it would be easier than it had been in the past. With the clear focus on Union, for the Frostwolf clan to be exiled or in any way cut off would spell extinction for them. Duratan did not like the direction in which things were going, but he could protest only so much. For himself, he did not care, but he could not permit his clan to suffer. And yet, his blood raced, his heart shook, his body trembled with foreboding. He said a quick prayer to the ancestors, that they would continue to guide his people wisely. They reached a flat river valley that for generations had played host to the Koshark festival. As his feet touched the sacred ground, Duratan felt himself relaxing slightly. Memories came back to him, and he smiled as they brushed his mind. He recalled that fateful night when he and Ogram had both decided to fly in the face of tradition and dared to spy on the adults as they spoke, and how disappointed both had been at the mundane conversations. Wiser now, he was sure that he and Ogram, bold though they had thought themselves at the time, had likely not been the first to be so daring, nor were they likely to be the last. He recalled, too, his first real glimpse of the female who would become his life mate, hunting in these lush fields, dancing around the fire to the sound of drums throbbing in his veins, and chanting to the moon. As long as his people still had this, he thought, all would still be well with them, hardened somewhat. He looked over where the dancing was usually held. A small tent was erected, and he wondered what it was for. He and Draka halted a few yards away from the tent, assuming it was part of the demonstration. The others followed suit. The sun shone brightly as more and more orcs gathered. Duratan saw that most of those who had come today were clan chieftains and their shaman, so the site did not have to accommodate quite as many as it did during the festival time. Gul'dan waited until everyone else was assembled before striding purposefully toward the tent. The shaman trained in this mysterious new magic followed him. They all strode with confidence and pride. Coming to a halt in front of the tent, Gul'dan beckoned to a few of the Black Rock warriors who stepped forward and stood at attention. At that moment, the wind shifted. Duratan's eyes widened as a familiar scent was carried to his nostrils. Drenai. Low murmurs around him told him that he was not the only one who had caught the scent. At that moment, Gul'dan nodded to the warriors. They disappeared inside the tent for a brief moment. Eight Drenai, their hands tightly bound, emerged from the tent. Their faces were puffy and swollen from beatings. Rags had been shoved in their mouths. Blood was caked on their blue skin and what remained of their clothing. Duratan stared. When the Black Rock clan fought using the magic I'm about to share with you, their victory was so absolute that they were able to take several prisoners, Gul'dan said proudly. These prisoners will help me show you what these new magical abilities can do. Outrage flooded Duratan. Slaying a foe in armed combat was one thing. Slaughtering helpless prisoners was another. He opened his mouth, but a hand on his arm stayed his words. He glanced up angrily into Ogrim Doomhammer's cool gray eyes. You knew about this, Duratan hissed, his words for his old friend's ears alone. Keep your voice down, Ogram hissed back, glancing about to see if anyone was paying attention to them. No one was. Everyone's attention was riveted on Gul'dan and the Drenai prisoners. Yes, I knew. I was there when we captured them. It is the way of such things, Duratan. It did not used to be the way of the orcs, Duratan replied. It is now, Ogram said. It is a sad necessity. For what it is worth, 
I do not believe that this will become a common practice. The goal is to slay the Drenai, not torture them. Duratan stared at his old friend. Ogrim kept the gaze for a moment, then flushed and looked away. Duratan felt his outrage abate somewhat. At least Ogrim understood what a violation this was, even if he supported it. But what else could Ogrim have done? He was second in command to Blackhand. He was oath-bound to support his chieftain. Like Duratan, he had responsibilities to others he simply could not shirk. For the first time in his life, Duratan wished he were a mere clan member. He looked down into his mate's eyes. She stared, aghast, first at him and then at Ogrim. And then he saw the sorrow and resignation flit across her features and she lowered her head. These beings have worth to us in this moment, Galdan was saying. Duratan, his body feeling heavy as lead, dragged his gaze to the shaman. We will use them to demonstrate these new powers. He nodded to the first Blackrock shaman in line, who bowed. Looking slightly nervous, the female closed her eyes and concentrated. A sound like rushing wind filled Duratan's ears. A strange pattern written in purple light appeared at her feet, encircling her. Above her head, a purple cube turned idly. Then, suddenly, a small squawking creature appeared at her feet. It capered, its eyes blazing red. Its small but sharp teeth bared in what looked like a smile. Duratan heard murmurings and some hisses of fear. Other shaman followed suit, summoning the same eerie purple circles and cubes, manifesting creatures seemingly out of thin air. Some were large, shapeless things in hues of blue and purple, hovering ominously. Other beings were fair to look upon, save for the hooked feet and bat-like wings. Some were large, some small, and all sat or stood quietly beside those who had called them into being. Pretty little pets, to be sure, came the distinctive voice of Grom Hellscream, dripping with sarcasm. But what do they do? Galdan smiled indulgently. Patience, Hellscream, he said, almost condescendingly. It is a strength, not a weakness. Hellscream's brows drew together, but he stayed silent. He was as curious as anyone, Duratan assumed. Blackhand stood, smiling a little, looking like a proud father. Only he seemed unsurprised by what was unfolding here, and Duratan realized that he must have already witnessed the powers of the newly trained shaman. Witnessed, and approved. One of the Drenai was cut loose from the rest and shoved forward. His hands still bound, he stumbled a few steps on his cloven feet, then stood erect. His face was impassive, only his slowly moving tail gave any indication of stress. The first shaman stepped forward, moving her hands and murmuring slightly. The little creature at her side squawked and jumped about, then suddenly fire erupted from its clawed hands to slam into the helpless Drenai. At the same moment, a ball of darkness formed at the shaman's fingertips and rushed toward the prisoner. It grunted in pain as its blue flesh was blackened and burned from the small creature's attack, but it dropped to its knees in obvious agony when the shadow ball struck it. Again the shaman muttered something, and flames erupted from the very flesh of the tortured Drenai. Where before he had been stoic and silent, he now screamed in torment, his cries muffled somewhat by the gag in his throat, but not completely. He jerked and spasmed on the earth, flailing like a fish freshly hooked, his eyes rolling wildly. Then he was still. The wreck of burned flesh filled the air. For a moment, there was silence. Then came a sound that Duratan had never thought to hear. Cries of approval and delight at the sight of a bound foe dying in helpless torment. Duratan stared in horror. Another prisoner was slain for demonstration purposes. This one was beaten with a whip by one of the fair servants of the shaman, standing transfixed while fire rained upon it and darkness pummeled it. A third was brought forward, its magical essence sucked out of it by a monstrous creature that looked like a deformed wolf with tentacles sprouting from its back. Bile rose in Duratan's throat as blue blood and ashes covered what once had been sacred land, land that had been and was even now lush and fertile, though its profound sense of tranquility had been brutally violated. Here he had danced and sung to the moon, had conspired with a boyhood friend, had courted his beloved. Here, generations of orcs had celebrated their unity on a place so holy that any fights that broke out had been halted immediately, the combatants ordered to make peace or to depart. 
Duritan was no shaman. He could not sense the earth or the spirits, but he did not need to in order to feel their pain as his own. Mother Kashur, surely, surely this is not what you wanted, he thought. The cheering filled his ears. The stench of blood and charred flesh assaulted his nostrils. Worst of all was the sight of his brethren, even some among his own clan, who were caught up in the frenzy of inflicting pain and torment upon beings who were rendered incapable of even spitting on their opponents. He was dimly aware of his hand hurting. Somewhat in a daze, he looked down to see that Draco was clenching it so hard she threatened to break the bones. For the shaman, cried someone. No, Galdan's voice carried over the noise of the cheering crowd. No longer are they shaman. They were abandoned by the elements. They will call them no longer and beg for their aid. Behold those who have power, and who are not afraid to wield it. Behold the warlocks. Duritan tore his gaze from his fingers and twined with his mates to look up at the sacred mountain. It jutted serenely skyward as it ever had, its sides catching and reflecting the light. And for a long moment, Duritan wondered why it did not shatter and break, like the heart of a sentient being overcome with horror at what was being done in its once comforting shadow. There were wild celebrations that night. Duritan participated in none of them and forbade members of his clan to do so. As the Frostwolf shaman sat by their small fire, subdued and eating in silence, Drakthar dared ask the question that Duritan knew was in their hearts. My chieftain, Drakthar said quietly, will you permit us to learn the ways of the warlocks? There was a long silence unbroken save by the crackling of the fire. Finally Duratan spoke. I have a question for you first, he said. Do you approve of what was done to the prisoners today? Drekthar looked uncomfortable. It would be better if we had attacked them in honest combat, he admitted. But they are our enemies. They have proven that. Proven that they will fight back when attacked, Duratan retorted. That is all that has been proven. Drekthar started to protest, but Duritan waved him to be silent. I know, this is the will of the ancestors, but today I beheld something that I never thought I would see. I saw the sacred fields where for countless years our people met in peace defiled by the blood of those who couldn't even lift a hand to defend themselves. He saw a movement at the edge of the circle and caught Ogrim's scent. Duritan continued, In the shadow of Ashugun itself, those who slew the Drenai today did not do so in order to protect an immediate threat to our lands. They butchered prisoners in order to show off their new talents. Ogrim now coughed quietly, and Duritan motioned him forward. Ogrim was well known to all present, and he sat down by the fire with the familiarity of one known and welcomed. Ogrim, Draka said, touching her friend's arm gently. The first warlocks are from your clan. What are your thoughts? Ogrim stared into the firelight, his heavy brows knitted together as he sorted through his thoughts. If we are to fight the Drenai, and even you Frostwolves are resigned to the necessity of it, then we should fight to be victorious. The elements have abandoned the Shaman. They are fickle and unpredictable at their best, and were never the most reliable allies, not like one's friends. He glanced at Duritan and smiled a little. Despite the heaviness in his chest, Duritan smiled back. These new creatures, these strange powers, they seem to be more dependable and destructive. There is something about them, Draka's voice trailed off. Drekthar broke in quickly. Draka, I know your concerns. They were definitely not natural powers, at least not natural as we shaman have always known them. But who is to say that is wrong? They exist. They must have some place in the order of things. Fire is fire whether it comes from the fingers of a little dancing being, or with the spirit of fire's blessing, it burns flesh just the same. I agree with our esteemed guest. We have committed to the battle. Surely we do not fight to lose it. Draka still shook her head, her beautiful eyes unhappy. Her hands moved as if she were physically groping for the words. It is more than summoning fire, or even the strange bolts of darkness, she said. I have fought Drenai. I have slain Drenai, and never have I seen them writhe in such pain, nor give voice to such torment. The things who are serving the warlocks seem to enjoy that. We enjoy the hunt, Duritan pointed out. He disliked arguing with his mate, 
but as always, he needed to see all sides of an issue in order to decide what was best for his clan. The wolves enjoy feasting on steaming flesh. Is it wrong to wish to win? Olgrim challenged, his gray eyes narrowing. Is it wrong to take pleasure in the victory? In the hunt? In the victory? No. It is the suffering of which I speak. Drek'thar shrugged. Perhaps the beings who are summoned to serve feed on that. Perhaps it is necessary to their existence. But is it necessary to ours? Draka's eyes glittered in the firelight, and Duratan knew with a pang that it was not from anger, but from tears of frustration. The Drenai have always had superior magics to ours, even with the aid of the elements, Drek'thar said. I have always been a shaman. I was born so. And now I tell you, I will embrace the path of the warlock if my clan leader will permit it, because I understand what those powers can do for us, having dealt with the elements for as long as I have. I would say, Draka, I am sorry, but yes, yes, this is necessary to our existence. If we do not have the powers of the elements to call upon, the Drenai will obliterate us from the face of the earth. Draka sighed and buried her face in her hands. The small group was silent, the only sound the crackling of the fire. Duratan thought something was missing. Now he knew. He did not hear the sounds of the night creatures, the birds and insects, and other living things who formerly filled the air with quiet sounds. They had been driven from this place by what had occurred here earlier. He tried not to think of this as an omen. I will permit the Frostfolk clan to learn these arts, he said heavily. Drek'thar bowed his head. I thank you, Duratan. You will not regret it. Duratan did not reply. Chapter 14 Drek'thar weeps as he tells me of these things, tears falling from eyes that can no longer see the present, but too keenly can see the past. I have no comfort to offer him, that the elements have come again to his call, to mine, indeed to that of any orcish shaman, his testimony to their compassion and forgiveness, their desire to see the balance restored. The spire that still houses darkness is not on this continent. We are well away from its malevolence physically, but not yet out of its shadow. The shadow that was cast so long ago, on the day following the defiling of what had been our most sacred place, the shadow of Black Hand. Sleep did not come easily to Duratan, nor, he realized, to Draka, as she tossed and turned and sighed. Finally, he gave up and lay awake, going over die events of the day. Everything in him screamed that it was wrong to embrace a magical path that so blatantly throve on the suffering of another being. And yet, what else was there to do? The elements had deserted the shaman, even though the ancestors themselves had given the orcs this task. Without magic to use as an additional weapon, the orcs would be wiped out by the superior technology and knowledge of the Drenai. He rose and left the sleeping tent. He started a fire to shake off the pre-drawn chill and silently ate cold raw meat. As he broke his fast and watched the sky lighten, he saw a courier approaching. Without stopping, the rider tossed a scroll to Duratan and rode on. Duratan unfolded it and closed his eyes at the contents. There was to be another meeting in two days. At that time, the chieftains would elect a leader who would speak for them all, make decisions for them all. They would select one who would be called War Chief. A soft hand stroked his hair. He looked up to see Draka reading over his shoulder. You might as well stay home, she said gruffly. The outcome is decided anyway. He smiled sadly at her. You did not used to be so cynical, beloved. I did not used to live in such times, was all she said. In his heart, he knew she was right. There was only one orc who was well known enough, charismatic enough to win sufficient votes to be elected war chief. Grom Hellscream might give Blackhand a bit of a challenge, but Hellscream was too impulsive to be trusted with such a task. Blackhand had been a visible figure from the very start, at first opposing and then supporting Ner'zhul. It was his shaman who had become the first warlocks. He had won more victories in his attacks against the Drenai than anyone else. Draka, as she was so often, was right in this as well. And two days later, Duratan watched with dull eyes as the votes from the clan chieftains were tallied and his Blackhand of the Blackrock clan was chosen. He felt silver glances come his way as Blackhand's name was announced by Gul'dan, 
and as the big orc stood with false modesty, accepted the title. Duritan did not even bother to object. What would be the point? He was already being watched closely for suspicion of disloyalty. No word he could possibly utter would change anything. At one point, he looked over at Ogram. To all other eyes, the second-in-command of the Blackrock clan looked steady and supportive of his leader. But Duritan knew Ogram better than anyone, and he saw the slight frown that furrowed his friend's brow, the tightness around the lips that indicated that Ogram was perhaps as unhappy with the decision as Duritan. But he, too, was in no position to object. Duritan hoped that perhaps Ogram's position, so close to Blackhand, would help mitigate the damage he was certain Blackhand would do. Blackhand now stood in front, waving and smiling at the cheering crowd. Duritan could not object, but neither could he bring himself to cheer for an orc who exemplified everything he despised. Ogram stood behind his leader on Blackhand's right. Galdan, whom Duritan was certain was manipulating things, but was unsure as to how, stood back and gazed at Blackhand respectively. My orcish brothers and sisters, Blackhand cried, you honor me. I will prove a worthy war chief of this vast sea of noble warriors. Day by day, we improve our weapons and our armor, and now, we reject the unpredictable elements and embrace true power, power that our warlocks controlled and wield without groveling or scraping to anyone or anything. This is liberation. This is strength. We are of one purpose, one clear focus. We will wipe the Drenai from our lands. They will be unable to resist this tide of warriors and warlocks, this sweeping horde. We are their worst nightmare. To battle! He lifted his arms and shouted, For the Horde! And thousands of impassioned voices cried, For the Horde! For the Horde! For the Horde! Duritan and Draka returned home shortly after the election of Blackhand, too disgusted to remain longer. The shaman stayed behind for training. When they returned several days later, Duritan saw they stood tall and proud once again. This new magic had given them back their faith in themselves, something that had evaporated like morning mist when the elements deserted them. For that, Duritan was grateful. He loved his clan, and knew them to be good people. He did not like seeing them broken and disheartened. They practiced their skills on beasts at first, joining the hunting parties and sending their strange creatures after Kleftov and Talbuk. Duritan was still troubled at the agony the attacked creatures suffered. As time passed, the creatures suffered less, not because the pain was decreased, but because the warlocks were learning to kill faster and more efficiently. The addition of the strange helpers, or pets as some warlocks fondly referred to the beings firmly under their control, seemed to make all the difference. Blackhand seemed to be enjoying his newfound position. Scrolls came almost daily from the couriers whose wolves and whose selves seemed to wear more ornate adornment each time they rode into camp. Duritan had to admit that knowing what was going on with the other clans was useful information. But one day, someone other than the courier came into the encampment. Duritan recognized the raiment. The approaching orc, mounted on a wolf with a particularly glossy black cloak, was one of Blackhand's personal warlocks, Kirkle. He halted his wolf, dismounted, then bowed before Duritan. Chieftain, a word with you from the war chief, he said in a surprisingly pleasant voice. Duritan nodded and motioned that the warlock walk with him. They strode until he felt certain they would not be overheard. What is it that Blackhand sends one of his most important warlocks to me? He asked. Kirkle smiled around his tusks. I am writing to all the clans, he said, clearly intending for Duritan to be put in his place. The Frostwolves were not being particularly honored, it would seem. Duritan grunted and folded his arms across his chest, waiting. The most important factor in our eventual and glorious victory over the Drenai is numbers, Kirkle continued. They are few, we are many, but we need to be more. So what is it Blackhand wishes, growled Duritan. Shall we leave off fighting for mating? Kirkle did not blink. Not leave off fighting, but yes. Encourage your warriors to procreate. You will receive accolades for each child that is born to your clan. That will help, but unfortunately, we need more warriors right now, not six years from now. Duritan stared, stunned. He had meant the comment as a crude joke. What was going on? Children begin training at age six, Kirkle continued. They are strong enough to fight at age twelve. Summon all your younglings. 
I do not understand, Duratan said. Summon them for what? Herkel sighed as if Duratan were a foolish child. I have the ability to accentuate their growth, he said. We will push them forward a bit. If we take all the children that are between six and twelve now and age them to twelve, we will increase the number of warriors on the field by almost fifty percent. Duratan couldn't believe what he was hearing. Absolutely not. I'm afraid it's not a choice. It's an order. Any clan who refuses will be branded a traitor to the Horde. The clan will be exiled, and their leader and his mate executed. Duratan stared, stunned. Kirkle handed him a scroll. He read it, shaking with anger, and saw that the warlock had spoken truly. He and Draka would be put to death, and the Frostwolf clan exiled. You would rob them of their childhood then, he said stonily. For their future, yes, I will drain a little of their lives, only six years worth. They will come to no harm. The Blackrock children certainly didn't. Blackhand insisted on his own three young ones be the first to be so honored, and in return, they will be able to fight for the glory of the Horde now, when they can make a difference. Duratan was not in the least surprised that Blackhand had permitted this to be done to his own children. For the first time, Duratan was grateful that there were so few children in his clan. There were only five of them older than six and younger than twelve. He again read the missive, feeling furious and sickened at the same time. These children ought to be able to simply be children. The warlock waited calmly. Finally, Duratan said in a voice he made deliberately harsh to hide his pain, Do what you must do. For the horde, said Kirkko. Duratan did not reply. What happened next was barbaric. Duratan forced himself to remain impassive while Kirkko cast a spell on the five frostful children. They writhed in pain, screaming and flailing on the earth as bones were stretched and skin and muscle burst into unnatural growth. A sickly green line linked the children to the warlock, as if he was sucking the very life out of them. The expression on Kirkko's face was ecstatic. If the children were suffering, he most definitely was not. For an awful moment, Duratan feared the warlock would not stop at age twelve, but would continue draining life from the children until they were shriveled and ancient. But thankfully, Herkel did stop. The young orcs, children no longer, lay where they had dropped the instant the draining had begun. For long moments, they could not be roused, and when they did, they wept, softly, breathily, as if they had no strength left for anything else. Duratan turned toward the warlock. You have done what you have came for. Get out. Kirkle looked offended. Chieftain Duratan, you... Duratan seized him by the front of his scarlet robe. Fear flickered across the other orc's face. Get out. Now. Duratan shoved hard, and Kirkle stumbled backward, almost falling. He glowered at Duratan. Blackhand will not be pleased to hear of this, Kirkle growled. Duratan did not dare speak. If any other words came from his mouth, he knew they would doom his clan. Instead he turned away, shaken with rage, and went to the children who were children no longer. For some time after that, nothing was asked of the Frostwolf clan, save more intensive training and reporting back on that training, and Duratan was both relieved and apprehensive. Somehow, he knew that when Blackhand and Gul'dan chose to notice him, the task they would set for him would be a difficult one. He would not be disappointed. Duratan was looking at a new pattern for armor the smith had just drawn up when the wolf rider leapt into the frostwolf encampment. Without breaking stride, the rider tossed Duratan a parchment, wheeled his mount around, and departed. Duratan unrolled it and began to read, his eyes widening. He looked up quickly at the departing figure of the rider. It was not the official courier. Old friend, I am sure it comes as no surprise that you are being watched. They will set a task for you one that they know you can complete. You must do so. I do not know what they will do if you refuse, but I fear the worst. There was no signature. The missive did not need one. Duratan knew Ogram's bold script. He crumpled the parchment and tossed it into the fire, watching it twist and curl in on itself like a living thing as the flames licked and consumed it. Ogram had sent the warning just in time. That very afternoon, a rider wearing the official tabard of a courier approached and handed the Frostwolf chieftain a parchment. Duratan nodded as he accepted it and put it aside. He did not want to see it right now. 
but the courier looked uneasy. She did not dismount, but neither did she turn her wolf and ride back to the Frostwolf lands. I have been instructed to wait for a reply, she said, after an awkward pause. Duratan nodded and unrolled the parchment. The writing was exquisite, and he knew that Black Ant had dictated the missive. The war chief, smart and cunning though he was, was barely literate. It was worse than he had thought. Duratan kept his face carefully neutral, though out of the corner of his eyes, he saw that Draka was watching him carefully. On to Duratan, son of Garad, chieftain of the Frostwolf clan. Blackhand, war chief of the Horde, gives greetings. You have now had time to see the skills of our newly trained warlocks in action. It is time to take the attack to our enemies. The Drenai city of Telmor is close to your borders. You are instructed to form a war party and attack them. Ogram has told me that as boys, the two of you entered that city. That you saw the secret of how the Drenai kept themselves unseen. Ogram also tells me that you have excellent recall and that you would remember how to expose the city to our warriors for an assault. I'm sure I don't have to tell you what destroying this city would mean to the Horde and to the Frostwolf clan. Reply to this letter immediately, and we will begin preparations for the assault. For the Horde, the signature was an imprint of Black Hand's right hand, stained with ink. Duratan was furious. How could Ogram have revealed this information? Did he truly follow Black Hand after all? that he would tell the war chief of this incident, and so put Duratan on the spot. The anger ebbed as he realized that the information to which Blackhand referred, their visit there as boys, the way the city was hidden, Duratan's almost uncanny memory, these were things that could have been dropped in conversation at any point over the last few years. Blackhand was intelligent enough to pick up any crumb of information and hoard it until such a time was necessary. Duratan thought about lying about claiming that he could not recall the words by which Restalon had dispelled the illusion that kept Idrenai City safe and hidden from the eyes of the ogres, and now the eyes of orcs. It had been a long time, and he had only heard the phrase uttered once. Anyone else would have forgotten it, but the threatened die letter was so thinly veiled as to be almost ridiculous. If Duratan agreed to assist with the attack, he would prove his loyalty to the Horde, to Blackhand, and to Gul'dan, at least for the moment. If he refused, even if he claimed to not recall the words Blackhand wanted him to speak, well, like Ogram, Duratan feared the worst. The courier was waiting. Duratan made the only decision he could make. He looked up at the courier, his face impassive. I will do as the war chief bids, of course, for the horde. The courier looked both relieved and a little surprised. The war chief will be pleased to hear this. I am instructed to give you the following. She reached into her leather backpack and retrieved a small sack, which she handed to Duratan. Your warriors and your warlocks will need to train with these. Duratan nodded. He knew what they were. The Heart of Fury and the Brilliant Star that he had ordered taken off Velen. These stones were perhaps the only things that had spared him once before when he had incurred Ner'zhul's anger. Now, he would use them against the very people he had taken them from. The war chief will contact you soon, the courier said inclined her head and turned her wolf. Duratan watched her go. Draka stepped quietly beside him. He handed her the letter and went into their tent. A few moments later she joined him, slipping her arms around him from behind while he buried his face in his hands and grieved over the events that led to the terrible decision he had been forced to make. A few days later the war party gathered at the Frostwolf encampment. Most of the warriors and warlocks were from the Blackrock clan but there were more than a few painted warsong faces in the crowd, and several shattered hand as well. Even the most obtuse among the Frostwolves could sense the mistrust and contempt from the visitors. Duratan knew it was no accident that the other orcs were all from the most martial clans. They were there to make sure the Frostwolves did not falter at any critical point. Duratan idly wondered which among them had the instructions to slit his throat at the first sign of hesitation. He hoped it was not Ogrim. The two old friends exchanged only a few words and Duratan saw regret in Ogram's visage. For that, at least, he was glad. A courier had been sent ahead, so there were plenty of bonfires roaring and food and drink for the hungry guests. Many of the Frostwolves gave up their own lodging for the visitors, so that those who would head into battle the following morning would rest as well as possible. Duratan met with Ogram and the others who led the assault, sketching out a layout of the city as best he and Ogram could recall it. 
By daybreak, the war party, a small army of orcs, was on the move. They passed into the meadows that surrounded the Terracar forest, where so long ago Ogrim and Duritan had raced as youths and been startled by the appearance of an ogre. No lumbering giants troubled the vast wave of orcs as they moved steadily toward their destination this morning. Duritan was in the front, riding beside Ogrim on Nightstalker. They were silent, but Duritan did not miss the fact that Ogrim's gray eyes lingered on the site where the two boys had been rescued by the Drenai warriors. The years have been long since we passed this way, Duritan said. Ogrim nodded. I am not even sure we have the right direction. The forests and fields have changed and grown, and there were precious few landmarks originally, Duritan said heavily. I remember the way. He wished he did not. A pile of stones here, a strange shaped outcropping there, was enough to guide him. It looked like nothing to anyone else. Blackhand had told his troops that the Drenai were able to disguise their city. Even so, Duritan's sharp ears caught slight murmurings of concern. He frowned. We are drawing close, he said. You must be quiet. There is an excellent chance that we will have been seen and reported already. The war party grew silent then. With a few gestures, Ogram dispatched some of his outriders to scout the area. Duritan's mind went back to that twilight, when he, too, was worried about where they were going and what the Drunai had planned for them. He brought his wolf to a halt and dismounted. Nightstalker shook his head and scratched behind his ears absently. It was here, or close to here. Duritan felt the desperate hope that perhaps the Drenai remembered that they had exposed their secret to him, that they had changed the hiding place of the magical stone upon which their protection depended. There was no telltale rock beneath which the green gem was secreted. Duritan's memory would have no aid to him uncovering it. He concentrated, walking slowly, hearing the jangling of tack and the soft clinking of armor as the others watched and waited. He closed his eyes to aid his concentration. Saw again Restalon kneeling on the ground, moving aside leaves and pine needles to uncover. Duritan opened his eyes and moved a few steps to his left. He said a quick prayer to the ancestors. Whether it was asking for help in finding the stone or not finding it, he was not certain. Mailed hands reached down and brushed away layers of detritus and then touched something cool and hard. There was no turning back now. Duritan closed his fingers around the gem and picked it up. Even in his distraught state of mind, he could sense the stone emanating a comforting energy. It nestled in his palm as if it belonged there. Duritan ran his left index finger over it, drawing out this moment before everything would change irrevocably. You found it, breathed Ogram, who had silently stepped up to his friend. Duritan was overcome with emotion and could not speak for a moment. He merely nodded, then tore his gaze from the beautiful, pulsating stone and looked up at the awestruck faces gazing at the treasure he held. Ogram nodded brusquely. Get into position, he said. We have been fortunate that there has been no advance warning. The stone was so calming to hold. Duritan wanted nothing better than to simply stand and look into its depths. But he knew that he had already made his choice. He took a deep breath and spoke the words that Restalon had spoken so long ago in the same place. Kela men Samir, Sole Ama Kal. He wanted to believe that his thick, orcish accent would not activate the stone that he was able to fulfill his obligation to his people without storming a small city full of civilians. But apparently, the words were understood by whatever force controlled the green gem. The illusion was already dissipating, the trees and boulders shimmering into insubstantiality, and before the orcish war party, a wide, paved road stretched as if an invitation. They needed no urging. The glorious city of the Drenai lay before them, with cries torn from over a hundred throats the orcs descended upon it. Chapter 15 Drekthar speaks in a broken voice of glories ruined, of beauty destroyed, of the slaughter of children. Through his tale runs an unspoken excuse. It seemed so right at the time. I imagine it did seem right. It did seem just. I can only pray to the ancestors that I am never placed in the same position as my father. Torn between what I know in my heart is right and the defense of my people. It is why I continue to strive to uphold the tenuous peace between us and the Alliance, because few offenses and insults in this or any other world are sufficient to warrant the slaughter of children. Later, Duritan would wonder how the city of Talmor had received no advance notice of a wave of mounted orcs. 
he would never be able to speak with a Drenai to find out. He could only assume that the Drenai were so certain in their illusionary camouflage that the idea that it could be breached never occurred to them. The quiet air was rent with the sound of war cries and wolf howls as the riders stormed the streets of the city. Several unarmed Drenai were cut down in the first few seconds of the assault. The white pavement was soon blue with spilled blood, but it did not take very long for the city guards to counterattack. Duritan had shoved the stone into his pack the moment he had finished using it. It would join the red and yellow stones he had taken from Velen. He mounted quickly and rode with grim determination, his axe at the ready. While he had made his own private vow that he would not attack an unarmed foe or child, he had also made his choice and was prepared to kill or die for it. The first wave flooded the city. A river of orcs forked into streams, pouring into large, spherical public buildings that branched off to either side of the main street, surging up the wide stone steps. The warlocks brought up the rear. Their creatures were silent and obedient, save the small ones that muttered constantly under their breaths. They waited for the right moments to bring down the rain of fire, the bolts of shadow, the various curses of torment. The warriors emerged covered with blood, their boots tracking it down the wide steps as they continued onto the next building, and the next. The Drenai guards were in the streets now, casting their own magics. Duritan turned in his saddle barely in time to deflect a blow from a sword that blazed with blue energy. The sword clanged against the head of his axe and jarred his arm to the bone, but that was nothing compared to the shock he felt at recognizing his attacker. For the second time, he and Restalon were meeting in battle. Duritan had spared Velen, and in return, Restalon had spared him when he was helpless before the Drenai warrior. Duritan saw recognition in the other's eyes, and those glowing blue orbs narrowed. All debts between them were paid. This time, there would be no quarter given on either side. Restalon cried something in his musical tongue. Instead of attacking again, he hauled Duritan from his saddle. Duritan was taken by surprise, and before he knew what was happening, he lay on the ground before his enemy. He reached for his axe as Restalon swung his sword, thinking even as his fingers closed about the hill that he would not be swift enough. Night Soccer, however, was trained almost as well as the orc who rode him. The instant the wolf felt his rider leave his back, he whirled on Restalon. Huge teeth crunched down on the Drenai's arm. Had it not been for the protective armor Restalon wore, his arm would have been severed instantly. As it was, the pressure was enough to cripple him and make him drop the sword. With a grunt, Duritan swung his axe as hard as he could. It slammed into Restalon's midsection, its keen edge cleaving through his armor to bite deep into his flesh. Restalon fell to his knees, his useless arm still held fast by Nightstalker's teeth. The white wolf bit down harder, growling, and started whirring the Drenai's arm as if it were a small animal. Within moments, the wolf would rip it off. Blood gushed from the wound in Restalon's side. He made no sound despite the agony he must be enduring. Duritan got to his feet and struck again. This time, a killing blow. A mercy blow. Restalon sagged and Night Stalker immediately let go of the arm. The captain of the guards of Telmor was dead. Duritan did not permit himself regret. He mounted Night Stalker quickly and sought out his next target. The city was certainly not the size of Shadrath, their capital but it was big enough. There were Drenai aplenty to slaughter. The air was filled with the cries of bloodlust, of pain and fear, of the clanging of sword on shield and the crackle of spells being cast. Odors assaulted his nostrils of blood and feces and urine and the unmistakable, unique wreck of terror. The rage boiling inside him felt good. His senses had never been higher, and he seemed to move without thinking. Over there, another one of the guards fighting Ogrim. Duritan tensed, thinking to rush to his friend's aid, but the doomhammer swung through the air and crushed the attacker's skull even through his helm. Duritan grinned fiercely. Ogrim needed no aid. He sensed the presence at his side before he heard or smelt it, and turned, bellowing his clan's war cry. He hoisted the gore-covered axe and prepared to bring it down. The child was barely out of puberty, but she screamed in a fury as she tore with bare hands at his armored leg. Tears streamed down her pale blue face and her teeth were bared. Blue blood, too much of it to be her own, saturated her dress so that it clung to her body. She pounded futilely at him, her tear-filled eyes burning with pain and righteous fury. 
For a horrible second, she seemed to be the same girl that Duratan and Ogrim had encountered years ago. That could not be. Surely that girl was a woman now. Or was she? But it did not matter. It was a female child who, both bravely and stupidly, was attempting to attack a mounted orc warrior with her bare hands. It was with an enormous effort that Duratan halted the axe in mid-swing. He would not harm a child. That was not the code. That was not the way of the orcs. Suddenly the girl froze. Her eyes widened. She opened her mouth and blood gushed forth. Duratan's gaze dropped from her face to her chest, and he could see the spear point tenting the blood-soaked fabric. Before Duratan could react, the shattered hand orc who had slain the girl shoved the spear to the side, forcing the body to the earth. He put one booted foot on her shoulder. Grunting, he pulled loose his spear and grinned up at Duratan. You owe me one, Frostwolf, the orc said, then vanished into the close-pressing crowd of slayers and victims. Duratan threw back his head and cried his agony to the ancestors. On surged the orcs, leaving corpses in their wake. The vast majority of the dead were Drenai, but here and there a brown body of a fallen orc could be seen. Some of the orcs who fell yet lived, crying out for aid, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. Shaman could have healed them with spells, but apparently warlock magics did not embrace the healing arts, so they lay where they had fallen some wheezing out their last breaths next to the Draenei they had slain, while the unstoppable tide poured forward. They followed the road through the foothills, entering each building as they went and slaughtering anyone they found. No doubt some Draenei had hidden, Duratan thought, and prayed they would not be found. He did not think that prayer would be answered. Once the first round of slaughter had been completed, there would be the looting and the search for those who had escaped the first assault. He knew it had been planned thus. They had reached the largest building yet, the one that sat highest on the mountain, and Duratan recognized it immediately. It was the Magister's home, where he and Ogrim had had dinner with the Prophet. Bitterly, he thought, that Velen was not much of a prophet if he had not foreseen this black moment. Nightstalker raced up the steps, and Duratan could not help himself. He craned his neck and looked over his shoulder back down toward the city as he had done the first time he had climbed these steps on his own two feet. Then, the Draenei city had been spread out like jewels on a meadow. Now, it looked exactly like what it was, a broken, taken city spattered with blood and gore and death, not just of its citizens, but of any hope of peace or truce or negotiation. Duratan closed his eyes briefly in pain. I am proud of my people and our city, Restalon had said to Duratan. Restalon, who lay dead and stiffening on the white street along with countless other Drenai. We have worked hard here. We love Drenor, and I never thought to have the chance to share it with an orc. The ways of destiny are strange indeed, stranger than either orc youth or Drenai guard could have imagined. The rooms that had made two orc youths feel slightly penned in years ago now seem utterly claustrophobic when crammed with adult orc warriors by the dozen. Most were empty. There had been time for an evacuation of all but those who had sworn to die in service of their city, and die they did, the guards who attacked them now. The beautiful, ornate furniture was used as weapons, brought crashing down upon Draenei heads, the breakage adding to the thrill of the fight. Orcs punched holes in the smooth, curving walls for the sheer pleasure of it. Beds were hacked with swords, bowls of fruit and delicately wrought statuettes swept off furniture that was in turn smashed by axe or hammer. Duratan had had enough. Hold, he cried, but no one listened. The creatures controlled by the warlocks seemed well pleased with this behavior, almost smug, but the time for destruction had passed, and the ruthless savagery would not serve the orcs now that all the inhabitants of Telmor were either slain or had fled. Hold, Duratan yelled again. This time Ogrim heard him and took up the cry. The warsong representative also shook his head as if to clear it of something hazy and obscuring. Then he, too, tried to calm his warriors. Drek'thar, back with the other warlocks, had not become as lost in bloodlust as the others, and he was able to stop the others from casting spells. Listen to me, Duratan roared. Most of them had reached the room where Velen had hosted them at his table. The room was empty, died chairs and tables overturned, the wall hanging shredded and cast to the floor. We have taken the city, it is now time to take what we need from it. 
They were listening now, their breaths coming in pants that filled the room with a raspy sound. But at least they had stopped swinging their weapons at anything that moved, or even anything that didn't. First we attend to the injured, Duratan ordered. We will not leave our brethren to suffer in the streets. Some of them stared guiltily at that. Duratan realized, with disgust, that many of these warriors had completely forgotten that some of their numbers still lay writhing in pain outside while they enjoyed die wanton destruction of the Magister's estate. He pushed his feelings down and nodded to Drek'thar. The warlocks might no longer have healing spells, but they had once been shaman and knew how to tend battle wounds in a more mundane fashion. Drek'thar motioned to several warlocks, and they hurried back the way they had come. Next, this city has supplies, the likes of which we have never seen. There are foodstuffs aplenty, and weapons, and armor, and other things we know not of. Things that will serve the Horde in its quest to... He could not say the words as he had planned. In its quest to wipe out the Drenai. Instead, he added somewhat awkwardly. In its quest, we are an army. An army marches on its stomach. We need to be well fed, well watered, healed, rested, protected. Olgrim, you take a group and start at this end. Guthor, you take a group and head back to the gates. Work your way up the main road until you meet Olgrim's group. Anyone who has any healing knowledge, report to Drek'thar and do exactly as he tells you to do. What if any Drenai we find alive? Ask someone. What indeed? There was no infrastructure to take care of prisoners, and in truth, the only purpose of a prisoner would be for negotiations. Since it had been made quite clear that the sole purpose of the Horde was total extermination of the Drenai race, there was no reason to host prisoners. Kill them, Duratan said hoarsely. He hoped the raggedness of his voice would be interpreted as raw fury, rather than the agonizing pain it was. Kill them all. As the orcs he commanded hurried to obey his orders, Duratan found himself wishing that Nightstalker had not been so quick to protect him. It would have been easier had he perished by Restalon's hand this day than speak the words he had just uttered. With any luck, during this horrific campaign to obliterate a species who had never raised a hand to them, death would find Duratan sooner rather than later. Chapter 16 The Shadow Council Even now, so many years on, we know so little about who they were and what they did. Gul'dan carried many, many secrets to his grave. May he rot there in torment. It is difficult enough for me to understand how one or two may become so corrupt they would doom their descendants for power in their lifetimes. That there were so many, the number is not even known for certain, is beyond the scope of my limited imagination. Yet even these numbers would not have mattered had it not been for the demons who held them in their grasp. Their pain I rejoice in. What they did to others who obeyed them because they trusted them, I condemn with every fiber of my being. That was an excellent test, Kiljaden approved, smiling at his subjects. Galdan bowed, his eyes bright with his master's approval. Nerzul hunkered down, his eyes on the floor, but even so, he was listening. I confess, I was surprised Duratan was able to carry out our orders, Galdan said. I expected him to resist or at least put shackles on what his orcs could and could not do. But the city lies claimed and broken, my lord. All the Drenai who once lived there are gone, most of them dead. Most is not good enough, Gul'dan, you know that. Gul'dan flinched slightly at the criticism. He wondered, not for the first time, about the connection between Kil'jaeden and the Drenai, and why the beautiful ones so despised them. It was our first attempt at taking the battle to them, Rather than attacking lone hunting parties, Great One, the warlock replied, a little surprised at his own daring. Kil'jaeden cocked his horned red head, considered, then nodded. True, and there is yet time. It had been several days since the fall of Telmor. Gul'dan, impressed with the job Duratan had done, had tried to give the city to the Frostwolf clan as a reward, but Duratan had declined the offer. The Frostwolves, he stated, would continue to live in their ancestral lands. The Black Rocks, however, had not been so foolish. Blackhand and his family now slept in the beds where the Magister of the city had once slept. At first, the orcs had not known what to make of the trappings of the Drenai. But now they were beginning to incorporate their victims' way of life into their own. They sat in chairs, 
Eight at tables, analyzed and trained with Draenei weaponry, adapted the armor for bulkier orcish frames. Some of the females, and not a few of the males of the Blackrock clan, had taken to wearing Draenei clothing, incorporating it with traditional orcish tunics, robes, and breeches. Goldan knew that many wondered why he or Ner'zhul had not taken the city for themselves. It was tempting, but Goldan had been well advised by his master. Creature comforts were pleasant, but power was sweeter, and the less Goldan claimed for himself publicly, the greater his reach would be in secret. Kil'jaeden would not let him down, as long as Goldan did his master's work well. A few items were brought to his new place he called home, an enormous, circular table carved of wood inlaid with softly glowing shells and stones, along with several beautiful chairs. Gul'dan stepped forward to the massive table, running his hands over the polished surface, smiling to himself. All that remained was to summon those who Gul'dan had reason to believe would answer. Some names were immediately obvious to him, others came only with extended thought, but he had a list of names now that was long enough to be comprehensive, should enough to be managed. Soon, sooner than he had even hoped, the Shadow Council would form. While on the outside, Gul'dan was advancing the orcs as a race, giving them power and eliminating the enemy that was the Drenai. A handful of orcs almost as corrupt and power-hungry as he would pull the strings. It was not about the orcs as a race. It had never been about the orcs as a race. It was about power, getting it, wielding it, and keeping it. Ner'zhul had never understood that. He liked the power but was not willing to feed it the meat it craved. Deceit, lies, manipulation. Even Blackhand, who thought he was initiated into Gul'dan's ultimate schemes, hadn't grasped the vastness of Gul'dan's ambitions. It was as huge as Kil'jaeden's desire to destroy the Draenei. It was as enormous as the sky, as deep as the oceans, and knife-sharp as hunger. Gul'dan looked at Ner'zhul with contempt, as the older orc, who had once been a mentor, sat huddled in a corner. His gaze traveled to the blazing eyes of Kil'jaeden, and the great being nodded. Summon them, Kil'jaeden said, his lips parted in a smile, showing sharp white teeth. They will come when you call, and they will dance to your tune. I will see to that. Allies. They needed allies. Gul'dan wondered how Kil'jaeden had not foreseen this. The orcs were mighty indeed, especially when controlled and directed properly. The long months, over a year now, that the war had stretched had only made them more so. Their best brains had gotten to work on understanding the technology of the Drenai as best they could. Building had begun on the center fortress, which Gul'dan called the Citadel, where a standing army could be conveniently quartered, trained, and equipped. The orcs had never before attempted anything like this, and Gul'dan was proud that he had suggested the idea. There were warriors. They were shamans. Now, of course, warlocks. There were healers. There were craftsmen. The first three had clear roles and no lack of opportunity to perform their duties. The craftsmen were contributing on a different level, creating the armor and weapons and buildings to support those who had the glory of slaughtering Drenai until their bodies were sticky with spilled blood. Some would call these laborers a lower class of orc. Privately, Gul'dan felt that way himself, but he was wise enough to know that their work while hardly glamorous or likely to gain them recognition, was as necessary as a warrior's willingness to kill or a warlock's mastery of curses. Those who provided food, shelter, weapons, the warriors and warlocks would not get very far without them. So Gul'dan had made a show of praising the craftsmen, the pleasant result being that they were inspired to work harder and continually improve. But even though every member of every clan was working as hard as he could, and Gul'dan had spies in each clan to make certain of it, it was not going to be enough. The taking of Telmor had been surprisingly easy, and the boost to morale was tremendous, but Gul'dan knew that the Horde's victory was largely due to luck. No one in that sheltered city believed for a moment that they would be discovered and overrun in a matter of a few hours. They had thought themselves completely and utterly safe, protected by the magic of the green stone Gul'dan had dubbed Leaf Shadow which shielded them first from ogre eyes and then from orcish. That easy victory would not be repeated. How would... Ogres, he said aloud, thoughtfully. He tapped one sharp nailed finger against his jutting chin. Ogres. Absolutely not, cried Blackhand. 
He dozed the distance between himself and Galdan in two strides, towering over the smaller orc. It took every ounce of bravado that Galdan had not to retreat from that fearsome face shoved to within inches of his. Come now, Black Hand, Galdan soothed. Calm yourself and listen to what I am saying. You will be the one to benefit most from this, after all. That got him. Black Hand growled, snorted, and stepped back. Galdan did his best not to look obviously relieved. They are filth, Black Hand grunted. They have long been enemies of the orcs, longer than the Drenai, and with better reason. How is it that I will benefit? Getting right to the point, Galdan thought with satisfaction. He had judged Black Hand properly. There are some who still mutter that you were not elected fairly, Galdan said. If you succeed in this, it will only add more glory to your name. Black Hand's eyes narrowed. Perhaps, he admitted. But will the orcs agree to this? Galdan permitted himself a smile. They will if we tell them to, he replied. Black Hand threw his head back and roared with laughter. Olgrim shifted uneasily in his saddle as he glanced at his leader. When Black Hand had explained what he wanted to do, Olgrim had erupted in protest. He had joined in countless hunting parties over the years to eliminate the ogre threat. More than most orcs, with him it was personal. He had never ceased hating the fact that years ago he had fled from one of the giant, lumbering, thick-skulled creatures. And now Black Hand proposed this. But Ogrim knew that whatever else his leader was, and he was many things that Ogrim did not like, he was a good strategist. The plan was sound if one could detach oneself emotionally from it, so he had agreed to lend his support. Obtaining information had been tricky. The Black Rocks had captured three of the ogres, and spent many a long night speaking in sufficiently small words to get their point across before the deceptively pudgy things understood what they wanted and began to cooperate. Now every warrior, warlock, and healer from the entire enormous clan stood prepared for battle. The ogres had told them where the masters lurked and led them to this place, an opening at the foot of the Blades Edge mountain chain. They had made no attempt to hide themselves. Refuse littered the area outside, and there were plenty of large bear ogre footprints going in and out. Even as Ogrim watched, he saw a small group of ogres trundling out into the daylight. No doubt, they thought themselves safe, as a Drenai and Telmor had before them. And no doubt, a year ago, they would have been right. But much had changed since then. The orcs were no longer groups of scattered clans, but a unified fighting force willing to put aside an old grudge for a new hatred. Blackhand was in front, flanked by the three ogres. Behind him were his sons, Rend and Mame, who spoke to one another in low voices punctuated by the occasional rough giggle. Olgrim had been against allowing the boys to fight at first, but they had proven to be stronger and better than one might think. They lacked their father's cunning, but they certainly had inherited his bloodthirst. Grisilda, too, had been trained to fight, but she was not a natural the way the boys were. Their names were appropriate. Their father shot them an angry look, and they sobered at once. Olgrim wondered if Blackhand would make a speech. He hoped not. Blackhand was at his best in action, not words, and his clan was more than ready to follow him. To his relief, Blackhand looked over the sea of warriors, nodded once, and then gave the orders to attack. The first wave charged, screaming wildly and pouring down the side of the foothills where they had hidden. At first the ogres were so confused at the sight of three of their own allying with the orcs that they simply stood there and let themselves be slaughtered. Then, as their slow brains began to comprehend that they were under attack, they rallied. They still did not attack their fellow ogres, who lumbered through their ranks to talk to the head of the guard stationed somewhere inside Die Cavern. Ogrim was determined to enjoy the last authorized ogre killing he was likely to taste and swung the doom hammer with a something akin to glee. His wolf was swift, and darted easily between the tree trunk thick legs of the ogres who raged impotently and swung his club as fiercely as he could. He recalled how big they had seemed to him as a child. They were still big, but so was he, now, and he wielded a legendary weapon with control and skill. He fractured the shin bone of the ogre, and it roared in agony. Ogrim's wolf danced out of the way as the huge thing fell, making the earth tremble as it landed. It tried to get up, pushing its bulk off the ground with its large, fat hands. But by then, other black rocks had swarmed upon it. Faster even than Olgrim could reckon, the ogre was dead and bleeding from over two dozen wounds. Olgrim wheeled just in time to see one of the orcish warriors hurtling through the air, dead from a single blow from an ogre's massive club. Growling, Olgrim gathered himself to charge the murdering creature when a cry of hold, hold, 
brought him up short. It was a testament to the power of Black Hand's personality that even now, even when most of the Black Rocks were caught up in the grip of bloodlust and killing an ancient enemy, they stayed their hands. The ogres didn't, at least not at once, and Ogrim found himself riding away from the battle until the slow ogre brains understood what was going on. The thought galled him. It is for the good of all of us, Ogrim, he told himself. He glanced over to see the ogres the Black Rocks had befriended talking to their kind, or rather, bellowing at them and occasionally smacking them. But at least the ogres had been distracted from following the retreating orcs and appeared to be listening. One of them, bigger and wearing something that looked like an official sash of some sort, actually seemed to have a brain. Ogrim could not understand the vile things and used the paws to catch his breath and gulp some water. Can't wait till we can kill them again, Redden said. Ogrim glanced at his chieftain's eldest son. If we succeed, they'll be fighting alongside us, Ogrim replied. You won't be allowed to kill them. Mame spat. Heh, <laughs> right. Kill them on the sly. Ogrim grimaced. He himself would like nothing better, but... Several are dead already, trying to make this plan of your father's work. He wouldn't like you undermining his efforts. Wren sneered at him. Who is going to tell him? I will. If this works, and they listen to us, if any of them turn up dead, yours are the first names I'll mention. Wren glowered. Right now, he was so young that it looked like a childish petulance, but inwardly. Ogrim was touched with foreboding. He had never liked Blackhand, and liked his children, with the exception of little Griselda, even less. He did not know if it was their parentage, or their forced growth that was responsible, but there was a darkness in them that Ogrim mistrusted. One day, if they survived and began using their brains in addition to their powerful muscles, Rend and Mame would grow up to be even more dangerous and deadly than their father. I told you he wouldn't listen, Rend, Mame said petulantly. Old man's forgotten what it's like to have a bloodlust running through him. Let's go. With a final sneer, Rend followed his brother. Ogrim sighed. He had bigger problems than two upstart youngsters right now. He turned his attention back to the negotiations, although he doubted the ogres would have understood a word. The attacks appeared to have stopped. Black Ant, who fled the battlefield as he had told all his clan to do, now directed his wolf down to where the ogres were gathered. Ogrim rode to his chieftain's side, arriving just in time to hear the leader of the guards announce, We know like Gron. Gron hurt us. He beckoned to one of the other ogres, who turned to show his back to Ogrim and Blackhand. Ogrim saw that there were scars crisscrossing the ogre's back. He felt no twinge of pity for the creature. They had done worse to the orcs for decades. Still, it was useful to know. The captured ogres had also spoken of such things, and now they nodded as if they were terribly wise. What will you give us if we join you? demanded the guard. Blackhand grinned up at the thing. Well, for one thing, we won't beat you. Ogrim thought of Blackhand's own sons, but said nothing. We'll see to it that you're fed, and are given appropriate weapons. Ogrim was relieved that Blackhand had him promised armor. Three orcs could be armored out of the materials that would protect a single ogre, and fortunately, the guard, obviously one of the more intelligent of the ogres, still wasn't smart enough to think of armor himself. You'll have food, and shelter, and the delight of smashing Drenai to small wet stains on the grass. The other ogres had been listening intently, and now one of them literally jumped up and down with delight. Me smash, it roared gleefully, and several others took up the simple but apparently highly entertaining phrase. Blackhand waited for their enthusiasm to die down, before continuing. So, are we agreed? The ogre captain nodded. No more hurting of ogres, he growled, and turned to regard those he led. His tiny eyes were shiny with tears, and this time... As he looked upon the ogres whose backs were crawling with scars, Ogrim did feel a little sorry for them, a very little. What is your name? Ogrim asked the captain suddenly. It shifted his gaze to him. Kroll, he said. Kroll, then, said Blackhand quickly before his second could say more. When do you think we should lead our combined assault? Now, Kroll said, and before either Ogrim or Blackhand could protest, he bellowed something in his hideous native tongue. The other ogres jumped up and down and they shook the earth as they landed. Then they all turned and purposefully re-entered the cave mouth. Blackhand casted a glance over at Ogrim, who shrugged. He suspected it was easier to stop the tide than this flood of stupid, single-minded giants. Call them, Blackhand said. Ogrim produced a cleft hoof single horn and blew on it. The orcs cried out in delight and began to again descend in response. 
there was no time to remind the Blackrock clan of the plan. Ogram hoped that they would remember it, especially the overzealous Mame and Rend. Slaughter of ogres aplenty awaited them, but they had damned well better be killing the right ogres. Because if they didn't, if they gave the ogres any reason to question the sudden and very peculiar alliance, then the babes and old males and females who awaited word at the encampment might be all that remained of the Blackrock clan. Ogram was not optimistic. The Blackrock clan had ever been fierce in the hunt. Blackhand was a little more than a cunning savage, and Ogram had not failed to observe that recently a sort of manic fury had begun to creep through all the clans. As he whirled his wolf around to charge into the cave with his fellow clan members, he wondered if perhaps his eyes were playing tricks on him. Surely the greenish tinge on the skins of the orcs next to him was nothing more than a trick of the light. Chapter 17 Home. Whatever race you are, it is a word, a concept, that makes the heart swell with longing. Home can be ancient ancestral lands, or a new place that one has made one's home. Home can even be found in the eyes of the beloved. But we all need it, yearn for it, know that without a home, of some sort, we are incomplete. For many years, each clan had its own home, its own sacred lands, its own spirit of earth, air, water, fire, and spirit of the wilds. The uprooting began and continued, each more shattering than the last, until we came to Kalimdor. Here, I found a home for wandering people, a place of rest and sanctuary, where we could regroup and rebuild. Home for me is now named for my father, the land of Durotar. Duratan lifted his head and sniffed the wind. The scent that filled his nostrils was one of dust and desiccation, a foul and acrid sort of odor. Not the smell of something burning, not quite, but similar. Once, Drek'thar would have been able to catch the scent even better than he, but those days had passed. He was no longer a shaman, but a warlock. The air would not waft to him when asked, bearing information as detailed as if it had been written on a piece of parchment. And worse, Drek'thar, along with the other warlocks of the Frostwolf clan, did not particularly seem to care. There had been no rain for some time now, and the summer seemed hotter than usual. It was the second summer in a row that rains had come scantily, if at all, and on a whim, Duratan knelt and dug his fingers into the soil. Once, it had been fertile loam, dark brown and admitting a rich, earthly scent. Now, his fingers plunged easily into the dust. Its crust crumbled beneath his fingers, yielding instantly to dissolve into sand that would not hold grasses or crops, would not hold anything. It sifted through his fingers like water. He sensed Draka's approach, but did not turn around. Her arm slipped about his waist from behind, and she pressed against him. They stood like that for a long moment, then with a final squeeze she released him and stepped around to face him. Duratan dusted off his hands. We have never relied that much on what we could grow anyway, he said quietly. Draka regarded him with her dark, knowing eyes. His heart ached to look at her. In so many ways, she was better than he. But she was the mate of the chieftain, not the chieftain. And she did not have to make the choices he did. The choices he had. We have depended on what we could hunt, mostly, Draka said. But the animals we hunt survive on what the earth provides. We are all connected. The shaman knew that. She fell sound as one of the younger warlocks hurried by, a small capering thing at its heels. As they passed, the little thing turned to look at Draka and smiled, showing a mouth crammed full of pointed teeth. Draka could not suppress a shudder. Duratan sighed and handed her a scroll. I just received this. We must all prepare for a long march. We are to leave our lands. What? Blackhand's orders. He has relocated to his new citadel that has been made for him, and he wants his army there. It is no longer enough for us to join together to attack. We must all live together and be ready to follow where Black Hand leads us. Draka stared up at him incredulously, then her eyes dropped to the scroll. She read it quickly, then re-rolled it and handed it to him. We had best prepare, she said quietly, then turned and strode back to their tent. He watched her go and wondered exactly what it was that made his heart break at the sight. The citadel was incomplete, but the moment it came into Duratan's sight, he was stopped dead in his tracks. Beside him, there were several odd murmurs. So powerful, so big, 
worthy of a war chief. Had Duratan spoken, he would have said, blasphemous, a blight upon the land, out of harmony with everything we are. The traveling Frostwell clan was still many leagues distant, but the citadel perched upon the horizon like a buzzard. There was nothing in its design that bespoke orcish building. This structure, this architectural nightmare, this offense to eye and spirit was larger even than the Drenai buildings. Of course, Duratan knew its purpose, and it would have to be enormous if it were to constantly house an elite force of orcish warriors. Still, he had expected something else. Instead of the smooth, sleek lines that marked the structures of the Drenai, this fortress was sharp and jagged. Instead of coexisting with the landscape, it dominated it, hewn from black stone and jagged wood and metal. It fairly bristled against the sky. Duritan knew that he could see only the main tower from here, but that was enough. He stood as if rooted to the spot, reluctant to take a single step closer to the monstrosity. A silent look passed between him and Draka. Were they the only ones left who saw? The rest of the Frostwolves moved forward, passing their chieftain. Reluctantly, Duratan squeezed his mount and continued. Proximity to the fortress did nothing to make it seem more attractive. Now Duratan could see other buildings, barracks, storage silos, a flat expanse of training areas that were crowded with large weapons he had never seen before. They too looked dark and dangerous and deadly. Officious members of the Blackrock clan and others greeted Duratan perfunctorily and sent the Frostwolves to a flat area in the western part of the complex to begin setting up tents. It was heading on toward dusk when Duratan received the summons to report to the courtyard of the Citadel, along with several other members of his clan. A group of about twenty walked the distance and waited. He heard the drums first in the distance. Duratan tensed. They had specifically been instructed not to bring any weapons, just to come and wait for. They were not told what. Draka glanced at him uneasily. He had no assurance to offer her. He was as in the dark about what was to unfold as she. The drums came closer. The earth began to vibrate beneath Duratan's feet. Such was not unusual when the drumming started in circle, but so far away. He heard other concerned murmurings and knew that he was not the only one with a twinge of apprehension. The earth continued to shake, the vibrations growing stronger. Two black rock riders approached, looking exultant. Do not fear, proud members of the Horde, one of them cried. Our new allies, brought into our ranks by the mighty Black Hand, are approaching. Welcome them. There was something familiar in the feel of the ground shaking. The only other time Duratan had ever experienced such a thing was when he had been fighting. Ogres, someone screamed. And indeed, now Duratan could see them. Dozens of them, huge and purposeful, were striding toward the gathered groups of orcs. More wolf riders from the Blackrock clan were trotting about, shouting and blowing horns in triumph. The crowd was going insane with delight, yelling and dancing and cheering wildly. These were the new allies. Duratan could scarcely believe it. Even as he stared, unable to find words, the biggest ogre he had ever seen appeared. Blackhand himself strode beside it, his movements as lithe and proud as if the mammoth thing did not make him look like a child's toy. We will crush the Drenai, Blackhand bellowed and as if they had been awaiting the queue, the ogres marching with him cried, Crush! 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 For a sick, dizzying moment, Duratan was a child again, fleeing before such a monster. He blinked, and he again saw in his mind's eye his father's strong frame smashed and broken, blood and life dripping into the ground, Garad's skull crushed like a nut by a single blow from an ogre's club. Orcs were fighting alongside monstrous, feeble brain creatures in an effort to destroy an intelligent, peaceful race. The world had gone mad. Velen shuddered. His assistant was at his elbow, offering a warm, soothing drink, but the prophet waved it away. No comfort would come from a beverage now. No comfort could ever truly come again. He had grieved when word had come that Telmor had fallen, and with the city his dear friend Restalon. It had been even more painful to hear how the attack had occurred. Velen had seen something special in the youth Duratan had been, and his treatment at the orc's hand had only served to confirm his faith in the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan. But now this. Duratan and Ogram had been the only two orcs to ever witness how the green stone had protected the city. 
One of them had even memorized the incantation that would deactivate the stone's protective camouflage. A handful had escaped to flee here, to the temple of Karabor. Their wounds had been dressed, but there was nothing Velen or anyone else could do to heal their shattered spirits. But worse news was to come. The refugees did not tell of simple bows and arrows, or axes or spears or hammers being the sole weapons of destruction. They spoke in low, hushed voices of greenish-black bolts of terrible pain, of torment beyond anything that the shaman had hereto inflicted upon their enemies. They spoke of creatures gibbering and capering at the feet of those who wielded this magic based on suffering and agony. They spoke of Minari. Suddenly, many things fell into place with a dreadful logic. The abrupt, irrational attacks by the orcs, their sudden increase in technology and skill, the fact that they had turned their backs on their shamanism, a religion that, as Velen understood it, required a give-and-take relationship between the elemental powers and those who would wield them. Those who would command the Minari did not seek balance or harmony with their power. They sought dominance, just as Kil'jaeden and Archimon had. The orcs were nothing more than pawns in the hands of the Eridar. Velen knew that he and the rest of the Drenai, the exiles, were the real targets. The orcish horde, augmented now with creatures that were immensely powerful, was the way by which Kil'jaeden sought to destroy him. For a brief moment, Velen wondered if perhaps the new leader of this horde would listen to reason. If he would turn and fight alongside the Drenai to overthrow Kil'jaeden once he learned of how he had been used. He dismissed the thought almost at once. It was probable that those who were being used by Kil'jaeden knew of the Eridar's true nature and purpose, and the offer of power likely seemed believable as well as seductive. So had Archimond and Kil'jaeden succumbed, and they were far older, stronger, and wiser than any orc. And now, this vision, adding insult to injury, a vision of the lumbering ogres allying with the orcs, something that he once would have dismissed as a dream brought on by a too rich meal. Now he knew it to be the truth. Something had changed the inherent nature of the orcs so drastically, so irrevocably, that they had allied with creatures that they had hated for generations against the Drenai, a people they had been tentative friends with for almost as long. If this had happened elsewhere, the response would have been simple. Velen would gather his people and flee, protected by the Naru. But the ship had crashed, and Kaor lay dying, and there was no escape other than fighting against his horde and praying that somehow, some way, they would survive. Ah, Kaor, my old friend, how I miss your wisdom now, and how bitter it is that you be in the hands of the enemy who does not even understand that you exist. He held the stone known as the Spirit Song close to his heart, and felt the faintest flickers of the dying Naru. Velen closed his eyes and bowed his head. Gul'dan looked around the room with utter satisfaction. Everything was going as planned. The Shadow Council had been meeting for some time now, and thus far, Gul'dan felt confident that he had selected them well. They were all prepared, nay, eager, to turn their backs on their people in order to advance their own aspirations to power. They had accomplished so much already acting through their puppet that was foolish enough to believe he was a true part of the council rather than simply their mouthpiece. It had been easy to get him elected war chief, and as long as the council smiled and nodded at him for the few moments that he attended the meetings, he did not question his position. But Blackhand always departed before the real meetings began, sent on some mission or another that made his barrel chest swell with pride. Greetings, Gul'dan said as he slipped into his chair at the head of the table. As always, Ner'zhul lurked in a corner, never invited to sit with the others, but permitted to hear their conversations. Kil'jaeden had so instructed, and why Gul'dan was unsure to as why his benefactor desired this, he wanted nothing more than to stay in Kil'jaeden's good graces and did not demur. The council murmured perfunctory greetings, and Gul'dan got down to business. How are the various clans reacting to the idea of ogres as allies? Kargoth, let's start with you. The chieftain of the Shattered Hand Clan grinned and grunted. They are primed for bloodshed, and they don't care who helps them slit open Drenai throats. Rough laughter filled the cavern as many of the council nodded in agreement. In the dim light provided by the torches, their eyes seemed to Gul'dan to glow orange. A few, however, scowled and did not join in the merriment. I have heard protests from some in the White Claw Clan, one said, and Duratin of the Frostwolves still bears watching, for all that he led the attack on Telmore. Gul'dan held up a hand. Do not fear. I have had Duratan in my mind for some time. 
Why has he not been eliminated? Cargrath growled angrily. It would be easy to replace him with another more in line with our plans. Duratan is becoming well known for disagreeing with Black Hand's position, and yours as well. That is precisely why I still need him alive, Gul'dan said, watching to see who understood without further explanation. He saw comprehension register on a few faces, while others still looked puzzled and angry. Because he is known for a more moderate stance, Gul'dan continued, regretful that he had to spell it out for anyone on the council. When he does finally go along, everyone else who might have doubts goes with him. He speaks for many who do not dare speak for themselves. If Duratan agrees, so goes their logic, then it must be alright. As Cargath mentioned, the Frostwolf clan is not the only one who appears to have the reservations. But what if there comes a time that he does not agree? Some line he is not willing to cross. Gul'dan smiled frostily. Then we will deal with him in a way that best advances our power without placing it at risk, as we always do. Gul'dan decided it was time to change the subject. He leaned forward, placing his hands on the table. Speaking of those who have reservations, I have heard that there are some who continue to attempt to contact the elements and the ancestors. One of the members looked uncomfortable. I have attempted to dissuade them, but I cannot see how I can punish them for it. It was, after all, believed that the ancestors wanted us to attack the Drenai that made this even possible. He sounded a bit defiant. Gul'dan smiled reassuringly. Yes, indeed. That was the bait that hooked him so deeply. He glanced over at Ner'zhul. The older shaman met his eyes and then glanced down quickly. Such had been the bait that hooked Ner'zhul as well. Bait that did not hold the same appeal for Gul'dan. But that is no longer necessary, Gul'dan continued. We must make sure that there is no turning back to the old ways. We have been lucky indeed in our campaign, and with the ogres, success is likely to continue. But if there are any setbacks, any battles that go poorly, then those who still hold shamanism close to their hearts may find an appreciative ear. That won't do at all. He tapped his chin thoughtfully. We must do more than simply encourage warlock practices. We must actively discourage shamanism. It would be unfortunate if for some reason the ancestors actually were able to communicate with their descendants. Again he glanced at Ner'zhul. It had only been when Ner'zhul had traveled to the Sacred Mountain that he had been able to speak with the ancestors and discover what had really been going on. Until that point, even as powerful a shaman as he was, Ner'zhul had been tricked by illusions. The answer, therefore, seemed simple. Deep in the despotic dreaming, floated the beings that were made of light. They had the memories of what had gone before, and they had glimpses into the future. Long had they dwelt here, fed by the other, who was like them, but not like them, and who they sensed was well into the heart of soul passing. Until recently, they had dwelt in the state of being not being, in peace and tranquility. But now, defilement and hatred and danger had come. They could not reach the sleeping, but loved it living any longer, and the beloved living did not come as they used to, to replenish the sacred pool and unintentionally keep the other alive. Only the greatly deceived one had come, weeping and begging, but too far lost in the deception to be aided. Suddenly, their deep dreaming was disrupted, a tremor went through them. Pain savaged them, and they cried out for aid from the other, who could not help them, who could not help itself. The dark unholy things that had once been beings of beauty were coming. The ancestors sensed their approach. They came inexorably, joining their powers, creating a ring of darkness and severance around the base of the mountain. Darkness visible danced from the twisted things who had followed Sargeras, lured by the promise of power, fed now at the promise of the obliteration of everything. The ancestors felt the seething, focused hatred coalesce into a manifestation of greenish-black energy whipping around like severed tentacles, seeking a dreadful union. Slowly, inexorably, their stranglehold increased until a rope of shadow power choked the mountain, sealed it shut, preventing any lost orc from entering, any frantic soul from departing. And now, the other two cried out in grief as the circle was sealed shut, for without the shaman to bring it water, it could not even continue to attempt to heal itself, and without the other, there would eventually be no ancestors. Far away in their sleep, the few orcs who still secretly thought themselves as shaman trembled and wept. Their 
dreams corrupted into nightmares of endless torment and an inescapable doom. Chapter 18 I am one of the second wave of shaman, just as I am the leader of the second, and I pray for a better and wiser incarnation of the horde. I have spoken with the elements and spirits, and I have felt them working in harmony with me many times, and refusing their aid almost as often. But I have never seen the spirits of the ancestors, not even in my dreams. My soul yearns for such a connection. Until very recently, those who once walked the path of the shaman did not even dream of being able to walk it again. And yet they do. Perhaps one day, the barriers between us and the beloved dead too will be lifted. Perhaps. But I wonder, if they truly knew how far we wandered from their loving teachings, if they saw what we had done in Drenor, done to Drenor, perhaps even now they would turn their backs on us and leave us to our fates. And if they so chose, I cannot say that I would blame them. I don't understand, Gunn said. He was the youngest of the clan's warlocks, and still, Duratan mused with bitterness, an idealist. He had seen Gunn's nose wrinkle at the strange creatures he was forced to utilize in the battle against the Drenai. He had seen the youth's face filled with regret as his enemy writhed in agony before him. Drek'thar had brought the boy to Duratan's attention after the declaration from Gul'dan had been issued. What is wrong in hoping that the elements will one day work with us again? And why can I not go to Ashugan? Duratan had no real answers for him. The decree that no one must ever again practice the shamanic arts on pain of severe punishment or exile or death for repeated violations had seemingly come out of nowhere. True, most of those who had walked the shamanic path had turned from it when die elements abandoned them. But what about the ancestors? Why in the world, in this time of crisis and need, did Gul'dan forbid the orcs their most sacred place? And because he had no answers for a youth who deserved them, Duratan grew angry. His voice was gruff and deep. In order to triumph over the Drenai, our war chief has made certain allies. These allies have given us the warlock powers you control. Do not lie to me. I know you are pleased with the results. Gun sharp nailed long fingers had been working in the dead earth and had dislodged a stone. He tossed it up and down in his palm. Duratan frowned, looking at the boy's skin. The dryness of this place and the harsh conditions under which they had been laboring for nearly two years were now taking a toll. Normally smooth brown skin, stretched tight over toned muscle, was dry and flaky. Absently Gunn scratched at a patch of rough skin. Duratan glanced at the new skin underneath. It had a greenish tint. For a moment, mindless, animal panic washed over Duratan. Duratan forced himself to be calm and look again. There was no mistaking it. The skin was indeed slightly green. He had no idea what it meant, but it was new, and it was strange, and he instinctively did not like it. Gunn seemed not to have noticed. He hurled the rock with a grunt, watching it sail into the distance. Had Gunn been older, he would have noticed the warning in the tone of voice his clan chieftain used earlier, but he was young and wrapped up in his own concerns, and did not heed the warning. The spells, the creatures who obey me, I am pleased with the efficiency, but not with how it is efficient. It feels, it feels wrong, my chieftain. Killing is killing, and the elements used to give me powers that killed my foe just as dead, but I never felt this way about it when they gave me the power. We are in this war because the ancestors told us we needed to kill the Drenai, Gunn continued. So why is Gul'dan saying now we cannot go talk to them? Something inside Duratan snapped. He let out a furious bellow and hauled the boy to his fret. He gripped the fabric of Gunn's shirt and brought his face to within an inch of the shocked young warlocks. It doesn't matter, he cried. I will do what is best for the Frostwolves, and now that means doing what Gul'dan and Blackhand tell us to do. Obey this new order. Gunn stared up at him. As abruptly as it came, the white-hot fury departed, leaving sorrow in its wake. Duratan added in a harsh whisper meant for the boy's ears alone, I won't be able to protect you if you don't. Gunn looked up at him, an odd, orange gleam in his eyes for an instant. Then he looked down and sighed. I understand, my chieftain. I will not bring dishonor upon the Frostwolf clan. Duratan let him go. Gunn stepped back, straightened his clothes, bowed, and departed. Duratan watched him go, conflicted. Gunn, too, 
sense the wrongness in the way things were unfolding, but a single youth attempting to contact the elements could not stand against it, nor, Duratan thought bitterly, could a single chieftain. A sacred sight was the next to fall beneath the might of the Horde. Hard on the heels of the proclamation banning shamanism was the order to march on a place the Drenai called the Temple of Karabor. Although it lay close to the Shadowmoon Valley, the ancestral lands of Ner'zhul's own clan, who had taken the name Shadowmoon from that same valley, no orc had ever seen it before. It was a sacred place, and as such had been respected by the orcs. At least it had been respected until now. When Blackhand stood before his assembled army and ranted against the so-called spirituality of the Drenai, the cities we have taken so far were mere practice, Blackhand declared. One day soon, their capital will be destroyed, but before we shatter their most important city, we will shatter them as a people. We will storm this site, smash their statues, destroy everything that means anything to them, slaughter their spiritual leaders. They will lose heart and then, then claiming their city will be as easy as killing a blind wolf pup. Duratan, who stood with the other armed and mounted warriors, glanced at Ogrim. As was almost always the case, his old friend stood at Blackhand's side. Ogrim had become a master at keeping his face impassive, but he could not completely hide his feelings from Duratan. He, too, knew what this meant. The temple was Velen's home. The prophet had only been visiting Telmor that day when Ogrim and Duratan had met him. His place was in the temple where he prayed and meditated, and served as a prophet and guide to his people. They would very well slay him this day if he was there too. It had been hard enough to kill Restalon. Duratan would have prayed that he would not be forced to kill Velen too, had there been anyone to pray to. Six hours later, as he stood atop the stairs to the great home of the Temple of the Drenai, he almost choked from the smells that assaulted his nostrils. The now familiar wreck of Drenai blood the stench of urine and feces and the thick odor of fear, the sweet, cloying smell of incense. Blood covered the soles of his boots as they crunched on strewn rushes, releasing a clean fragrance that somehow made all the other scents so much worse. Duratan doubled over and vomited, the taste sour in his mouth. He heaved and choked until his stomach was utterly empty, then with trembling hands rinsed his mouth with water and spat. Harsh laughter greeted his ears, and he flushed. He turned to see Blackhand's two male brats, Rend and Mame, laughing at him. That's a spirit, Rend said, chuckling still. That's all they deserve, our vomit and spit. Yeah, said Mame, unoriginally. Our vomit and spit. Mame kicked the corpse of a nearby priest clad in pale purple vestments and spat on it. Duratan turned away in disgust and horror, but there was no respite. Everywhere he looked, he saw orcs doing the same thing to corpses, defiling them, looting them, putting on their bloody, rent robes and parading about mockingly. Others were methodically filling sacks with beautifully carved bowls and plates and candlesticks, while they crunched on sweet fruits that had been left as offerings to deities that the orcs didn't begin to understand and didn't want to. Blackhand, with another victory to his credit, had found some kind of alcoholic beverage and was chugging it down so quickly some of the green fluid spilled and dripped onto his armor. Is this what we have become? Murderers of unarmed priests, looters of things holy to them, defilers of their very bodies. Mother Kashur, in a way I am glad you are forbidden to us. I would not want you to see this. They have taken the temple, said Kiljaden, but they have not found me my prize. Kiljaden's voice was as honey-smooth as ever, but his tail lashed agitatedly. Gul'dan's stomach clenched in fear. Belen the traitor must have known somehow, Gul'dan said. He is called Prophet, after all. Kiljaden's massive head whipped around, and Gul'dan had to force himself not to quail. Then Kiljaden nodded slowly. You are right, he said. If he were an easy and stupid enemy, I would have found him here now. Gul'dan began to breathe again. Part of him burned to ask what Velen had done to one who was, he was certain, his own kind in order to earn himself such a single-minded hatred. But Gul'dan was wise enough to keep silent. He could live with his curiosity, unsatisfied on this particular issue. With their temple taken for our own purposes, 
great one, surely those that remain will have all fled to the city. They will be there, thinking themselves safe, but they will be trapped instead. Kiljaden steepled his scarlet fingers and smiled. Yes, he said. Yes, the temple shall be yours. Blackhand is quite comfortably ensconced in the citadel. But before you order your little puppets to attack the Drenai stronghold, I have a little gift for them. Nerzul waited until Galdan was finished. He watched beneath half-closed lids as Galdan wrote letter after letter, getting ink stains on his stubby fingers, using those same stubby fingers to pop a piece of fruit or a chunk of meat into his mouth. These were important letters, then. Normally, Galdan would have one of the unctuous scribes send out missives. The temple had been purged, was the word Galdan had used. The priests that lingered to bravely and foolishly stand against the wave of orcs had been killed with ruthless speed and efficiency. Nerzul heard that their bodies had been violated, and found that part of them still held on to enough compassion that the thought sickened him. Those violated bodies were long gone, as were their sacred items. Much of the temple had been closed off. The council and its servants did not require that much room. Some furnishings had been taken and used for the council's needs. Others had been torn down or removed, replaced with the dark, ominously spiky decorations that were rapidly becoming inextricably associated with the Horde. The entire structure had been renamed the Black Temple, and instead of priests and prophets, it now played host to liars and traitors. And Nerzul mused bitterly. He was certainly among that number. At last, Galdan was finished. He dusted the ink with powder to prevent smears and sat back. He looked up at his former master with thinly veiled disgust. Address them and take them to the couriers. See that you do it quickly. Nerzul inclined his head. He still could not bring himself to bow before his erstwhile apprentice, and Galdan, knowing full well just how broken Nerzul was, did not press it. He sat down in the chair Galdan vacated, and the moment Galdan's heavy stride could no longer be heard, he immediately began to read. Galdan expected him to read the letters, of course, and indeed, there was nothing contained in them that Nerzul did not know. He was privy to all meetings of the Shadow Council, though he was forced to sit on the cold stone floor of the Black Temple, and not at the huge stone table with those who had the real power. He was not certain just why he was allowed, only that for some reason Kiljaden wanted him there. Otherwise, he was certain Galdan would have dispatched him here now. His eyes flew over the words, and he was sickened by them. He felt utterly impotent, like a fly trapped in the sticky sap that flowed down the barks of the alimba tree, or that used to. From what he had heard, the trees that provided the sweet nectar had either been cut down, their wood used for weapons, or were dying. Nerzul shook off the imagery and began to roll up the missives, his eyes falling on the unused pieces of parchment and still filled inkwell and pen. The thought was so audacious, his heart stopped for an instant. Quickly, he looked around. He was completely alone, and there was no reason to expect Galdan back. Galdan killed Jaden, the council. They thought him broken, as harmless as an ancient, toothless wolf that warmed its old bones by the fire until at last it slipped into the sleep of death. And they were mostly right. Mostly. Nerzul had reconciled himself to the fact that he had had his power taken away from him. His power, but not his will. If that too had been taken from him, he would have been unable to resist Kiljain at all. Nerzul could not act directly, but he might be able to contact someone who could. His fingers trembled as he took another piece of parchment. He was forced to pause for a long moment and calm himself before he could write anything legible. Finally, he scribbled a brief message, blotted the ink, and rolled it up. The wolf was toothless but the wolf had not forgotten what it was like to fight. More orders to march. Duratan was growing heartily sick of it. There was no respite anymore, just battle, repairing armor, eating increasingly tough and stringy meat, sleeping on the earth, and another battle. Gone were the times of drumming and feasting and laughing and ritual. The perfect triangle of the mountain of spirits on the horizon had been replaced by the dark, forbidding image of a spire that occasionally emitted black smoke. Some said a creature slept deep inside the mountain, and that one day it would awaken. Duratan did not know what to believe anymore. When the courier rode up, Duratan took the missive and began to read it with dull eyes. Those eyes widened as he read, 
and by the time he had finished it, he was sweating and trembling. He looked up, wondering madly if someone had been able to glean the contents of the letter just by watching him read it. Orc strode past him, dust clinging to the rough, flaky skins and battered armor. No one gave him so much as a disinterested glance. He hurried to Draka, the one person in the world he dared to share this information with. Her eyes widened as she read. Who else knows of this, she said quietly, fighting to keep her face impassive. Only you, he said, equally softly. Will you tell Ogrim? Duratan shook his head. Pain laced his heart. I dare not. He is oath-bound to tell Blackhand. Do you think Blackhand knows about this? Duratan shrugged. I have no idea who knows what. I only know that I must protect my people, and I will do so. Draka looked at him long and hard. If we as an entire clan do not do this thing, we will attract attention. You risk punishment, maybe even exile, or death. Duratan stabbed a finger at the letter. Any one of those things is better than what will happen if we obey. No, I have sworn to protect my clan. I will not give them over to... He realized belatedly that his voice had risen and some heads were starting to turn. I will not give them over to this. Draka's eyes filled with quick tears and she gripped his arm hard. Her nails dug into his flesh. That, she said fiercely, is why I became your mate. I am so proud of you. Chapter 19 I am proud of my heritage. I am proud that I can name Duratan and Draka as my parents. I am proud that Ogrim Doomhammer called me friend and trusted me with the leadership of the people he loved. I am proud of my parents' courage, and at the same time, I wish there had been more they could do, but I am not in their place. It is easy to sit back, secure in my position and comforts in this life, decades after the fact, and say, you should have done this, or you should have said that. I offer no judgment on anyone save a handful of individuals who knew full well what they were doing, knew that they were trading the lives and destiny of their people for gratification in the moment, and did so gleefully. For the others, I can only shake my head and be grateful that I was not forced to make the choices they did. Galdan was so excited he could hardly contain himself. He had looked forward to this moment ever since Kill Jaden had first spoken of it. He had wanted to move forward even faster than his master did, but Kil'jaeden had chuckled and counseled patience. I have seen them, and they are not quite ready yet. Timing is everything, Galdan. The same blow delivered too early or too late does not kill, only wounds. Galdan thought it an odd metaphor, but understood what Kil'jaeden meant by it. But now, at last, Kil'jaeden thought the orcs ready for the final step. The Black Temple had a central courtyard open to the night sky. When the temple belonged to the Drenai, this area had been a lush garden with a rectangular pool at the center. The conquerors had drunk their fill of the sweet, pure water over the last few weeks with no care about replenishing it, and now the pool was nothing more than an empty space of stone and tiles. The trees and flowering plants that had surrounded it had long since died, withering with astonishing speed. At Kil'jaeden's request, Ner'zhul and Gul'dan now stood beside that empty pool. Neither of them knew what to expect. For long hours they stood in utter silence. Gul'dan wondered if perhaps he had displeased his lord in some way. The thought made him break out in a cold sweat, and he glanced nervously at Ner'zhul. He wondered if perhaps tonight the defiant shaman was going to be slain for his disobedience, and he perked up a bit at the thought. His mind was wandering considering various torments that might be imposed upon Ner'zhul, when a sudden loud crack of thunder made them both gasp aloud. Gul'dan looked up at the sky, where there had hitherto been a host of stars. Now there was only black emptiness. He swallowed hard, his eyes riveted on the darkness. Suddenly the darkness began to churn. It looked like a thunderhead, black and pulsing, and it began to swirl in a spiral. The spiraling picked up speed, a wind lifted Gul'dan's hair and stirred his robes, gently at first, then more fiercely, until he felt the wind scouring his skin. The earth beneath his feet rumbled. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Ner'zhul's lips move, but he could not hear what, if anything, was said. 
The wind was too loud. The trembling of the earth beneath his increasingly unsteady feet too intense. The sky cracked open. Something bright and blazing screamed to earth directly in front of Galdan and Ner'zhul. It struck the ground so hard that Galdan was knocked off his feet. For a long, terrifying minute, he could not breathe. He simply lay on the earth and gasped like a fish until finally his lungs remembered how to function and he inhaled a great surge of air. He got to his feet, his body shaking uncontrollably, and lost his breath again at what he beheld. It towered over him. Chunks of earth flew as it shook four legs that ended in hooves and flat large, leathery wings in annoyance. Its hair was more of a mane, flowing in green tendrils over its neck and down its back. Green eyes glittering like fiery stars, and its swooping tusks caught the dim light as it opened its mouth. It seemed to have row after row of sharp teeth, and its bellow made Galdan want to drop to the earth and weep in utter terror. Somehow, he remained standing and silent before the monstrosity. It raised its clenched fists and shook them fiercely, then lowered its head and looked around at the huddled, quaking orcs. What is that thing? Galdan screamed silently. Suddenly, Kiljaden appeared, looking down at Galdan and grinning fiercely. Behold, my lieutenant, Manorok. Well as he served me, and well shall he continue to serve. On other worlds, they call him the Destructor, but here, he is the Savior. Galdan, purred Kiljaden, and suddenly Galdan felt weak and sick again. You know what I am offering your people. Galdan swallowed hard. He did not dare glance at Erzul, whose gaze he felt boring into his back. Yes, he knew well what Kiljaden was offering, power beyond imagining, and slavery for eternity. Kiljaden had offered the former to Ner'zhul in exchange for the latter, and Ner'zhul, the coward, had balked. He had not wanted to doom his people. Gul'dan was untroubled by such scruples. All he could think of was the reward Kiljaden had promised. I do know, great one, Gul'dan said, surprised by the strength and steadiness of his voice. I know, and I accept my lord's most generous offer. Kiljaden smiled. Excellent, he said. You are wiser than your predecessor. Confident and elated, Galdan turned to gloat at Ner'zhul. The elder shaman stared at his former apprentice imploringly. He did not dare to speak, of course, but he did not need to. Even in the dim light of the stars, his expression was plain to read. Galdan's lips curled around his tusks, and he turned back to regard Manoroth. He was terribly imposing, but Galdan's fear had retreated in the face of his overwhelming desire for power. He gazed at the being, knowing that it, like he himself, was highly regarded by the one they both served. They were brothers in arms. Only a special blade can do what I ask of you, Galdan, rumbled Kiljaden. He extended his hand. The dagger seemed tiny in comparison to the huge palm upon which it rested, but it was quite large when Galdan curled his own fingers around it. This has been forged in the fires of the mountain in the distance, Kiljaden said, pointing to the smoking mountain. My servants have worked long and hard to craft it. You know what to do, Manoroth. The creature nodded its huge head, its tail moving to balance its bulk. It knelt on its two front feet and extended an arm. It turned its hand upward, exposing the comparatively softer flesh of its wrist. For a harpy, Galdan hesitated. What if this was some sort of trick, or a test? What if Kiljaden really didn't want him to do it? What if he failed? What if Ner'zhul was right? Galdan, said Kiljaden, Manoroth is known for many things. Patience is not among them. Manoroth growled softly, and his green eyes glinted. I am eager to see what will happen. All of your people, do it. Galdan swallowed hard, lifted the blade, aimed its gleaming edge toward the flesh of Manoroth's exposed wrist, and brought the knife down as hard as he could, and flew backward from the force of Manoroth's blow as the creature bellowed in pain. Dazed, he lifted his head and blinked, trying to clear his vision. Liquid fire spouted from the wound, glowing a sickly greenish yellow as it pumped into the pool of the Drenai priests. The energy was tiny compared to the vastness of Manoroth's body, but the blood flowed steadily, as if from a waterfall. Faintly, Galdan was aware that Ner'zhul, the weakling, was crying. Galdan could not tear his eyes from the sight of the unholy blood pouring pouring without ceasing, from the creature who continued to roar and thrash in pain. 
he got to his feet and walked over to the edge of the pool, being very, very careful not to come in contact with the fluid spewing from the wound he himself had made. Behold the blood of the destructor, glow to kill Jaden. It burns away all that will not serve you, Gul'dan. It cleanses all thoughts of hesitation, confusion, or uncertainty. It creates a hunger that can be directed any way you choose. Your little puppet thinks he rules the Horde, but he is wrong. The Shadow Council thinks they rule the Horde, but they are wrong. Gul'dan lifted his eyes from the pool of glowing green liquid that continued to pump from Anaroth's injured arm to gaze rapidly at Kill Jaden. Gul'dan, it will soon be you who rules the Horde. They are ready. They thirst for what you will give them. Gul'dan again turned to look at the flowing liquid. Call them to you. Quench that thirst. And their hunger. The now familiar horn, awakening the horde and summoning them to the courtyard, blew before dawn. Duratan had not been sleeping. He did not sleep much anymore. He and Draka rose without a word and began to dress. Suddenly, he heard her inhale swiftly. He turned at once to see that she was staring at him, her eyes wide. What is it? he asked. Your, your skin, she said quietly. He looked down at his bare chest. His skin was dry and flaky, and as he scratched at it, the skin beneath it looked green. He remembered seeing the same tint on young Gun's skin not so long ago. It's just the light, he said, trying to reassure them both. She would not be so easily placated. Draka lifted her own arm and scratched. Her skin, too, was green. She lifted dark eyes to him. They both saw it. It was no trick of the light. What is happening to us? Draka asked. Duratan had no answer. They continued to dress in silence, and as he went outside to the courtyard to wait, Duratan's eyes kept traveling to his arm, the strange green hue of his skin hidden beneath dented metal armor. The announcement about the assembly had come yesterday afternoon, during a training session with some of the younger orcs. Duratan still could not get used to seeing children who, a few months earlier, had been barely able to walk, now wielding swords and axes with extraordinary power. They seemed content with their new status, even pleased, but Duratan fought the urge to shake his head every time he saw them. Duratan found he could not even summon curiosity about their next target. It would be the same as before, slaughter, rage, defilement of corpses. Recently, even the bodies of slain horde had been left where they had fallen, their weapons and armor taken to be used on a living body. Sometimes a friend or family member bowed over the corpse for a moment but even that was happening less frequently. Gone were the days of bringing home the honored dead and placing them with deep ritual upon a funeral pyre, their spirits sent with all ceremony to join the ancestors. Now, there is no time for rituals, or pyres, or the ancestors. There is no time for the dead. There is no time for anything, it would seem, but slaughtering Drenai and mending weapons and armor so the horde could go out again to continue the task. He stood with dull eyes in the courtyard, awaiting his orders. Blackhand rode to the gates of the citadel, where they could see him clearly. There was a wind today, with nothing to block it in this desolate place. It caused the banners of the various clans to snap fiercely. We have a long march ahead of us, Blackhand cried. You were told to pack supplies. I hope you listened. Warriors, your weapons must be ready and your armor sound. Healers, have your ointments, potions, and bandages at hand. But before we march to war, we will march to glory. He lifted a hand and pointed off in the distance, where the sullen mountain that jutted against the sky puffed black smoke. That is our first destination. We will stand on the mountain, and what happens there will be remembered for a thousand years. It will begin a time in which the orcs will know power that we have never before tasted. He paused to let this sink in and nodded visibly pleased at the murmur that ran through the crowd. Duratan tensed, so, it would be today. Never one to talk more than he needed to, Blackhand ended this rallying speech with, let us go. The horde surged forward eagerly, curious and excited by Blackhand's words. Duratan looked quickly at Draka, who merely nodded her support of his plan. Then, forcing his heavy feet to move, he followed, caught up in the tide. There was a narrow, steep path that led part way off the Smoky Mountain to a large plateau. It looked to Duratan as if a chunk of the mountainside had been cut away with a clean sword strike, so unnaturally perfect.
perfect, was it? His skin crawled at the thought. Very little that came into his life these days was natural, it seemed. Three large slabs of black, polished stone lay in a row, partially embedded in the soil. They were beautiful, but sinister at the same time. The orcs were where, after the long climb in the hot sun, wearing full armor and carrying weapons and supplies, and Duratan wondered what the logic was behind this. There seemed little point in exhausting the warriors before the battle. Perhaps the attack would come later, on the morrow when they were rested. To Duratan's surprise, once everyone had gathered and quieted, it was not Blackhand who addressed them, but Galdan. It was not so very long ago, Galdan said, that we were a scattered people. We came together only twice a year, and then only to sing and dance, and drum and hunt. He said the words in a voice dripping with contempt. Duratan looked down. For centuries, the clans had come together at the Koshark Festival. It was not something foolish, as Gul'dan's tone of voice implied, but something sacred and powerful. It was what had kept the clans from attacking one another, but it might have been a lifetime ago, by the way the orcs around him reacted. They too grunted in disapproval, shook their weapons fiercely, and looked ashamed, even those among them who had been the shaman. Now, look at us. We stand shoulder to shoulder, clan by clan, Laughing Skull next to Dragon Maw, Thunderlord next to Warsong, all under the strong, insightful leadership provided by Blackhand, whom you have chosen to unify you, for Blackhand. A cheer went up. Duritan and Draka did not participate. Under his shrewd guidance, and with the blessing of the beings who have chosen to ally with us, we have grown strong. We have grown proud. We have advanced further in skill and technology in the last two years than we have in two centuries. The threat that once loomed over us has been broken, and it will take only a final push to see it forever crushed. But first, first, we will pledge ourselves to this cause and receive blessings in return. He bent and held up a strange chalice. It looked to be carved from the horn of some creature, but Duratan had never seen a cleft of sport so large a horn. Two. It was curved and yellowed. Strange glyphs had been inscribed on it, and as the night closed in around them, the inscription seemed to glow faintly. Whatever the cup contained glowed as well. As Gul'dan held it before him, an eerie yellow-green light lit up his face from beneath, casting grotesque shadows. This is the cup of unity, Gul'dan said in a reverent voice. This is the chalice of rebirth. I offer this to the leader of every clan and he in turn may offer it to anyone in his clan whom he wishes to be particularly blessed by the beings who have been so very, very good to us. Who will come forth first to pledge his loyalty and receive his blessings? Gul'dan turned a little to his right toward Blackhand. The other orc grinned and opened his mouth to speak when a savage, familiar voice rent the night air. No, Duratan thought. No, not him. Draka's hand clamped down hard on Duratan's arm. Will you warn him? Duratan's throat worked, but he could not speak. He shook his head. No. Once, he had counted the slender but imposing orc who strolled boldly forward as a friend. But he could not risk revealing that he knew what was going on. Not even for Grom Hellscream. The chieftain of the Warsong clan had made his way through the crowd to stand in front of Gul'dan. Blackhand looked up a bit put out at Hellscream. Clearly, both Gul'dan and Blackhand had anticipated that the war chief would drink first. Gul'dan's mouth quirked in a smile. Ever want to seize the moment, dear Grom, he said, bowing a little as he handed the cup filled with a swirling green fluid to Grom. Waves of heat and light rose up from the chalice, and Grom's face, already decorated to inspire fear in his enemies and respect from his allies, looked even more alarming. Grom did not hesitate. He brought the cup to his lips and drank deeply. Duratan watched, straining to see the reaction. Perhaps after all, the letter had not been sent by someone who wished him good. Perhaps it had been a trap. Gul'dan barely had time to take the chalice from Grom before the other orc stiffed and shuddered. He doubled over for a moment, and the crowd murmured in worry. Duratan stared, horrified, as Grom's hunched over body pulsated and quivered. Before his eyes, Grom's shoulders, slender for an orcs, broadened. His armor creaked as it settled over his newly powerful body. Slowly, Grom straightened. Tall as ever he had been, 
reshaped by the green liquid to be stronger and thickly muscled. He looked out over the crowd. What Duratan could see of his face was smooth and healthy and, save for the tattooed jaw, completely green. Grom threw his head back and shrieked again. The cry was louder than Duratan had ever heard it. It was almost like a knife made of sound that ripped through one's body and left one shattered and bleeding. Duratan covered his ears, as did nearly everyone else, but he could not tear his gaze from Grom's face. Grom's eyes now glowed red. How do you feel, Grom Hellscream, of the Warsong clan, asked Gul'dan with a peculiar mildness. Grom's expression of ecstasy was so keen it was almost pain, and he seemed to grope for the words. I feel magnificent. I feel, he broke off and screamed a third time, as if only the primal cry would do. Give me Drenai flesh to tear and rip. Drenai blood on my face. I will drink it down until I can hold no more. Give me their blood. His chest heaved with the passion of his emotions, his fists clenching and unclenching. He looked prepared to attack an entire city with nothing but his bare hands, and Duratan thought he would win that battle. Hellscream motioned to his clan. Voices of the war song, come forth. Not a one of you will be denied this ecstasy. The Warsong warriors rushed forward, all eager to feel what their chieftain was feeling. The cup was passed around, and one by one they drank. Each one shuddered for a moment in deep pain. Each one passed through that pain to apparent delight and obviously increased strength. And the eyes of every one who drank turned a blazing red. Blackhand watched, his frown increasing. When the last of the Warsongs had drunk from the cup, he grunted. I will drink, he demanded seizing the cup and swigging down with a great gulp. Black Hand clutched his throat for a moment, but stayed completely silent while whatever dark magic was in the cup did its hellish duty. He had removed his armor, and the muscles rippling and growing beneath his taut green skin were clearly visible. Red eyes glowed when he finally looked up. He motioned to his sons, and Mame and Ren shoved other orcs perfunctorily out of their way as they rushed forward. Duratan saw Griselda, Black Hand's only daughter, hesitate before she, too, stepped up to drink. Blackhand sneered at her. Not you, he snarled. Grisilda drew back as if struck. Duratan, who had always been fond of the girl, breathed a sigh of relief. Blackhand intended to shame her. Instead, he was unwittingly giving her a great gift. Blackhand motioned to Ogrim. Come, friend Ogrim, drink with me. Even now, as his best and oldest friend was being summoned to drink the dark liquid, Duratan could not speak, but thankfully he did not need to. Ogrim bowed his head. My chieftain, I will not take that glory from you. I am your second, not chieftain, and I do not seek that position. Duratan sagged with relief. Ogrim saw what Duratan had seen, even though he was not privy to the information Duratan had been given. He was not a fool. He owned his own soul and he would not surrender it for the sort of power that racked the body and made the eyes burn with such a sinister gleam. Now the other clan chieftains lined up, anxious for this blessing that had so excited two of their most famous and respected chieftains. Duratan did not move. Drek'thar leaned in and whispered, My chieftain, do you not wish the blessing? Duratan shook his head. No. Nor will I permit any of my clan to drink. Drek'thar blinked shocked. But, Duratan, it is obvious that this drink grants great power and passion. You would be a fool not to drink it. Duratan shook his head, recalling the contents of the letter. He had been skeptical at first. Now he was certain. I would be a fool if I did, he said quietly, and when Drek'thar tried to protest, he silenced the former shaman with a look. Unbidden and unexpected, Words from the Drenai prophet Velen floated back to Duratan. We chose not to sell our people into slavery, and for that we were exiled. Duratan knew in his bones that once the orcs had drunk from this chalice, their will was no longer theirs. Gul'dan was doing exactly what the leaders on the Drenai's home world had done. He had sold his people into slavery. History was repeating itself. Now it was Duratan who defied his leaders for the sake of his people. Perhaps he and his clan like the Drenai, would soon be exiled ones. It did not matter. What he was doing was right. He realized that now all the chieftains save he had drunk, 
and the moment he had dreaded was upon him. Gul'dan waved him forward. The mighty Duratan, the hero of Telmor. Duratan forced his face to remain still. Come and join with the other chieftains. Drink your fill from the chalice. Nay, Gul'dan, I will not do so. In the light of the torches, Duratan could see that muscle twitch near Gul'dan's right eye. You refuse. Do you think you are better than the others? Do you think that you do not need the blessing? The other chieftains were frowning now. Their breathing labored as if they had been running, their brows glistening with sweat. Duratan did not rise to the bait. It is my choice. Perhaps others in your clan feel differently, Gul'dan said, sweeping his arms to include the Frostwolf clan in his expansiveness. Will you let them drink then? No. I am the chieftain of the Frostwolf clan, and this is what I have chose. Gul'dan stepped down from the obsidian slab and strode to Duratan. He leaned in and whispered in the chieftain's ears, What do you know, and how do you know it? It was no doubt meant to be an intimidating gesture, but instead Duratan was filled with new hope. Gul'dan felt threatened, but instead of sending an assassin in the night to dispatch someone he regarded as an inconvenience, he was trying to bully Duratan into submission. He had just confirmed the truth of the contents of the mysterious letter, and revealed that he had no idea who its author was. Duratan realized he could survive this and still protect his clan. He said, equally quiet, I know enough, and you will never discover how I learned it. Gul'dan pulled back and forced a smile. It is indeed your choice, Duratan, son of Garad, and if you choose to deny yourself such a blessing, then you must bear the consequences. The words were double-edged, but Duratan did not care. Another day, he might need to worry about what Gul'dan had planned for him, but not tonight. Gul'dan returned to his position and cried out to the crowd. All who wish the blessing of the mighty Kil'jaeden, our benefactor, have received it. Think of this place as hallowed ground, for here the orcs took steps to becoming something far greater than what we are born as. Think of this mighty mountain as Kil'jaeden's throne, where he sits and watches and blesses us as we do work that will purge us still further of anything other than the best of which we are capable. He stepped back and nodded to Blackhand, his eyes glowing red, his armor catching the flickering of torches. Blackhand lifted his arms and cried, Tonight we make history. Tonight we attack the last remaining stronghold of our enemy. We will tear limbs from bodies. We will bathe in blood. We will storm through the streets of their capital like their worst nightmare. Blood and thunder. Victory to the Horde. Duratan stared. Tonight, there had been no strategy discussed. This was not some little hamlet or village Black Hand was talking about, but the Drenai capital. This was their place of last refuge, and he was certain they would fight more fiercely than they had ever before, like cornered animals. He recalled the huge engines of war that had been built, and knew that Black Hand had ordered them moved, where neither Duratan nor the others knew. Madness. This was madness. And as he looked at the screaming bodies surrounding him, their eyes all twin pinpricks of crimson light, he realized that the word was truer than he thought. Those who had drunk from the tainted cup had indeed gone mad. Grom Hellscream danced closer to the fire, waving his newly muscular arms and throwing his head back, the firelight dancing on the once brown skin that had now turned green. Duratan, sick and dazed with horror, looked into glowing red eyes that were so akin to those of the enslaved creatures the warlocks commanded. That green skin, the same green hue that was already tainting the skins of the warlocks, like gun, was even starting to taint Duratan's own skin, and that of the one he loved with all his heart. He thought of the contents of the letter, written in an archaic tongue that few but the highly educated, the shaman and the clan leaders, would know. You will be asked to drink. Refuse. It is the blood of twisted souls, and it will twist yours and those of all who imbibe. It will enslave you forever. By the love of all we once held dear, refuse. The ancient language had a single word for twisted souls. These were the things that were held in check by the warlock's will, but just barely. The fluid that had passed the lips of those Duratan had called both friend and foe had been the blood of one such. 
and Duratan watched as the twisted souls, that the orcs now were somehow bound to, danced insanely in the torchlight before racing down the mountain to run, fueled with unnatural rage and energy, to attack the most fortified city this world had ever seen. Twisted souls. Daemons. Demons. Chapter 20 I have spoken to many who were there at the destruction of the city of Shatrath. When I ask them about the events, their minds are clouded and their recall is poor. Even Drekthar, who remembers so much with astonishing clarity, stammers and hesitates when asked to recall the details. It is as though with demonic blood fresh in their mouths, those who drank can remember only the fury they felt and not what they did in its grasp. And even those who did not drink, that small handful of which Drekthar is a member, even they cannot summon the details to mind. It is as if such an atrocity was so horrific that it wants to be forgotten. That some Drenai survived the assault is not in doubt. I have seen the sad, pathetic things that were once the glorious Drenai with my own eyes, wandering forlornly here in Azeroth, soft and shattered, crying for home. These lost ones are to be pitied. So it is that this account is vague, and I regret it. Such a moment, dark though it may be, should not be forgotten or glossed over. But such is the chronicler's challenge. The orcs charged down the trail, burning with a feral need to destroy. Some were so overflowing with rage and hatred that they took swipes at the very rocks as they passed them. Sonic bellowed their fury. Others were grimly, deathly silent, all their energies contained and simmering, ready to be released at the proper moment. During that long run, Duritan was more afraid of his own people, of individuals that he had once called friend, than of any ogre wielding a club, or any herd of Talvox, or any enraged, attacking Drenai. He was cold with sweat, shaking in his boots, but not from any fear for himself. His fear was for what would happen next, not to the Drenai, for their destiny was surely already written, but to the orcs. He could not bring himself in those moments as they are running to Shatterath to call them the Horde. At one point, a horrible rumbling knocked them all off their feet. As they clambered upright, they turned and looked back to where they had come. It looked as if the mountain had exploded. Liquid fire was belched into the night sky, hurtling upward, then falling and splattering down the jagged peak. It radiated and glowed like the demon blood that the orcs had just drunk. Though its hue was orange-yellow and not an eerie green, more and more molten stone was spewed from the mountain. It was a glorious, mesmerizing, and horrific sight. The orcs took it as a sign, and a cheer erupted from their ranks. After a few moments of celebrating at the very mountain, the throne of Kil'jaeden blessing their endeavor, they turned and continued their race towards slaughter. A mile outside the city, they slowed. An area had been cleared, and recently too, and for a moment, the first orcs to arrive at this site simply stared in confusion. This was where they had been told to assemble. This was where their war engines were supposed to have been quartered. Then, with no warning, something materialized right in front of their eyes. The orcs drew back, hissing. Then in the face of all sanity and logic, they started snarling at the huge being. It towered over them, three times taller than the tallest ogre, red from its cloven hooves to the tip of its lashing tail, from its jutting horns to its sharp black nails. Its size was nothing like they had ever seen, but its shape. Duratan stared at it, thinking that it looked like nothing so much as a gigantic, crimson-skinned Drenai. The sudden realization that the orcs had been plunged into a personal conflict that should never have concerned them crashed over him like a tidal wave. You have nothing to fear and everything to celebrate you who have sworn your allegiance to me. It cried, its voice penetrating to the very bone. I am Kil'jaeden, the beautiful one, the one who has been with you since the beginning. And I am with you now as you head to the most glorious battle yet. Once, the wicked Drenai plotted against you, hiding an entire city from your eyes. But you have destroyed that city and others and vanquished their temple. All that remains is this one final battle, and then the threat will be eliminated. 
the green stone that once hid the city of Telmor from you now hides their doom from them. Kela, Men, Samir, Sole, Ama, Kal. And the illusion was dispelled. Before them were dozens of catapults, battering rams, siege weapons of all varieties. Standing beside the engines of war were the ogres, still and silent, their stupid faces filled with determination. They bore weapons suited to their size, and Duratan realized that there were at least three dozen of them ready to fight. They made the huge weapons look like toys. There is more, Kiljaden said, and waved his hands. The warlocks all cried out and grasped their heads for a moment, then blinked and grinned. New spells have flooded your minds. Use them well. Take the Drenai, now. As if he had opened a gate, the bloodthirsty orcs leaped into motion. Some of them made for the weapons by which a walled city would fall, pushing them forward with a strength which Duratan had never before seen them display. The ogres immediately went to the others, moving the enormously heavy weapons at a brisk pace. Other orcs were too far sunk in bloodlust, and simply raced forward in the direction of the city. What they would do when they got there, Duratan did not know, but he and his clan followed dutifully. The war machines propelled by the ogres and the orcs rumbled steadily on, but even before they were maneuvered into position, the walls that protected the city were under attack. Enormous, green glowing rocks fell from the sky to slam into the city. Towers and citadels that had risen above the wall level cracked and shattered, and the wall itself was starting to crumble in several places. But it was not just boulders falling from the sky that comprised the attack. It was what rose from them once they had landed. Moving deliberately, but with sickening speed, creatures that appeared made of the same glowing green stone got to their feet and charged. They hammered at the wall, joined now by more mundane stones hurled by the catapults and huge tree trunks rammed into the great gate door. Two ogres were pounding on the door with their clubs, and the timber shuddered. From within, Duratan could hear cries of fury and horror as the Drenai tried to battle the creatures, infernals, as he heard one warlock refer to them. Most of the warlocks were using these new servants, but a few still had the smaller, more familiar creatures obeying their commands. The city could not last long under such an assault. With a mighty crash, an entire section of stone wall crumbled. The tide of crazed orcs and bellowing ogres swarmed through the breach thus created, shrieking and swinging weapons. Duratan remained where he was, rooted to the earth, watching as the orcs fought and killed and died. The rage and fury he had seen them display before in the thick of battle was nothing compared to what he saw now. There was no strategy, no attempt at defense, no calls for retreat when retreat was necessary. This was nothing more than murder and slaughter, dealing death and receiving it, stupidly rushing into dead ends where traps had been laid. Such was to be expected from the ogres, and as they fell heavily, blood streaming from their bodies, Duratan did not mourn them. But the orcs, they were beyond caring about anything but the sensation of their own blood singing in their veins and the battle cries pouring from their throats. Dozens, no, no hundreds, would die this night. The casualties would render the city unlivable. Come sunrise, blue and green bodies would litter the streets. But for now, it was carnage and chaos in the very depths of insanity. Duratan swung his axe because it was fight or die. And even now, even though he knew his people were on a dark road, he did not wish death. Kiljaden and Manoroth stood together, watching the green meteors that housed infernals crashing to the earth. They swarm like insects, grunted Manoroth. Kiljaden nodded, pleased. Indeed, it is beautiful to watch. I am well pleased. What next? Kiljaden turned eyes of mild surprise on his lieutenant. Next. There is no next, at least not here. The orcs have fulfilled my purpose. They burn with your blood, my friend. It will consume them eventually unless they have an outlet for it, and that outlet is only to be found in slaughtering every last Drenai on the face of this world. He watched as fire join the glowing green hue in the distance. It is well that you are done here, Manoroth said. Archimon mutters that you are wasting time, and our master wishes us elsewhere. Kiljaden sighed. You speak the truth. Sargeras hungers, and he has been very patient with me. 
I do regret one thing, that I won't be watching as they gut Felon. Oh well, enough to know that it happened. Let us leave this place. He gestured, and both he and his lieutenant disappeared. What do you mean he was not there? Galdan shrieked. This could not be. What I said, Blackhand growled. We scoured the city. Velen was nowhere to be found. Perhaps an overeager grunt found him first and mutilated the body, Galdan said nervously. This was not good news. He had instructed Blackhand to find the corpse of the prophet Velen and bring the Drenai's head to Galdan. It was to be a present to kill Jaden. Possible, even likely, Blackhand said. But from what you told me, even if his body had been hacked into pieces, he could not have been mistaken for an ordinary Drenai. Galdan shook his head, feeling worried and slightly sick. The Drenai had blue skin and black hair. Velen, their prophet, had pale white skin and white hair. As long as a piece of his skin remained whole, he could be identified. You scoured the city. Blackhand's brows drew together. I told you we did, he said darkly. His breath started to quicken, and his eyes turned even redder as anger rose in him. Galdan nodded. Besotted though the orcs were by bloodlust, they would not have failed to search for the body most coveted by their leader. The reward would be too great. The anger, if it were overlooked and discovered later, too lurious. Somehow, Valen had escaped. That meant that there were probably other Drenai out there. In a sudden panic that made his heart race, he wondered just how many he had let slip through his fingers, and where in this wide, wide world they had gone. Once, Velen had had an entire temple, filled with acolytes and priests and servants, in which to meditate and pray. Now, he was in a small room, one of only a handful who even had their own room. He held the violet crystal in his hand, and tears poured silent and unheeded down his face. He watched the fall of the city. He had wanted to stay, to lend his own not inconsiderable magic to the fray, but that path would have meant death. Not merely his own, but that of his people. They did not need a marshal now. The orcs, their systems permeated with demonic blood, burned with a lust for killing that would not be sated even if they slew every last Drenai and Drenor, would never be sated until death stiffened their corpses. Kill Jaden and Sargeras' burning legion of demonic forces owned them now. The orcs had numbers, ogres, warlocks, and a fury that would take them physically and emotionally to places where no rational mind would dare travel. There was nothing Valen could do but let the city fall, for there was nothing he could do that could possibly save it. Nor could he save the orcs. The only flicker of hope for the eventual redemption of the Horde lay in a single clan who had not drunk the blood, had not made the pact, whose minds and hearts were still their own. Some eighty orcs, and that was all. Eighty to stand against over a dozen other clans, most much larger. The orcs would be treated as maddened beasts now, whenever any Drenai chanced upon them. Things to be put down quickly and mercifully, with the understanding that while the orcs did not fully know what they did, they must die regardless. Valen had wanted to abandon the city, to have it standing empty when the orcs descended, wanted to save as many Drenai lives as he could, but Laro here, the quick-speaking, intelligent general who had succeeded Restalon after his murder had convinced him it would not work. If there is an insufficient number of Drenai to slaughter, Laura here had said, his voice soft and compassionate but yet hard as steel, then the lust that consumes them will not even be sated temporarily. They will still hunger and catch our scent while it is still new and track us down. Those who flee will die. They must believe that they have slain most of us, and in order for them to believe that, it must be true. Velen had stared in horror. You would have me send my people to knowingly be slaughtered. All but a handful of us know what we fled on Argus, said Laura here. We remember it. We remember what Kiljaden did, what happened to our people. We would, we will happily die to preserve you and a handful of our race uncorrupted. Velen had looked down then, his heart aching. If the orcs believe they have slain us, except for a trivial handful, then Kiljaden will be satisfied. He will depart. The orcs will suffer greatly, 
said Laura here, and did not look displeased. After what the orcs had done to the Drenai recently, Velen could not blame him. They will, and they have no doubt that they will continue to track us down. But the methods they use to track a few dozen will be different than if they suspect there are a few hundred of us remaining, said Laura here. It is to our advantage to appear as scattered and helpless as possible. Velen had looked up at Laura here, haunted. It is easy for you to speak so, but the decision is not yours, it is mine. I must be the one to say, you, you and your family will come with me and live, but you, and you, and you, you will stay behind and let demon crazed orcs tear you to pieces and anoint themselves with your blood. Laro here said nothing, there was nothing to say. Velen had spoken with each of his people he had chosen to send to die. He had embraced them and blessed them. He had taken items that meant something to them and promised to see these things survived. He had watched as, stoic and dried-eyed, these walking dead had repaired their armor and sharpened their swords, as if the outcome was actually in question. And he had watched them as they marched off, singing the ancient songs, to enclose themselves behind a walled city and wait for a mace or an axe or a spear to end their lives. Velen could not go with them. He had unique abilities, and if the Drenai were to survive, he needed to as well. But he had used the crystal to watch every moment of the battle, and the pain he felt was scarring and yet purifying. Not one of these people would have died in vain. The orcs did not know about the Zangar Marsh. They had not yet sniffed out this hiding place, and if Velen had anything to say about it, they never would. Here, the best Drenai minds would continue to devise ways to harness energies and direct them, to keep safe the handful who had survived. Here, they would regroup and recover, heal and wait and pray they had at last tricked kill Jaden the Deceiver and escaped his terrible gaze. The orcs had captured three of the stones, but Velen still had four. Fortune's Smile, Eye of the Storm, Shield of the Naru, and, of course, Spirit Song. And although his link with the Naru was tenuous, Kayor yet lived. Even as tears spilled down his white face to drop on the surface of the violet crystal, even as he grieved the utterly tragic loss of so many lives, Velen, prophet of the Drenai, felt hope stirring inside him. Chapter 21 We had lost everything by this point. We had abandoned balance and harmony in our world, and thus the elements had abandoned us. Demons guarded the entrance to Ashugan, cutting us off from the ancestors. Our physical bodies and our very souls had become corrupted from the blood that, in their eagerness for power and strength, most of the orcs had gladly imbibed. And then, when we had done all this to ourselves under the guidance of Gul'dan, Kil'jaeden abandoned us. Thus came what has been called the Dying Time. May its like never visit us again. What do I do? Veldan could not believe the words were coming from his own lips, but he was so terrified that advice, any advice, seemed better than this sick fear he lived with. Nerzul regarded him with contempt. You made this choice. It's not if you are blameless yourself, Galdan snapped. Of course not. I made choices for myself, for my own advancement. But I never threw away the future of my people, my world, for it. Where is the power you were promised now, Gul'dan? The power that you bartered our people for? Gul'dan turned away, trembling. There was no power, and Ner'zhul knew it, which was why his words bit so deeply. Far from rewarding his loyal servant with glories and godhood, Kil'jaeden had simply vanished. All that was left of his presence in this world were the warlocks and their demons a maddened horde, and a ravaged land. No, he thought. No, that was not all that was left. There was still the Shadow Council. There was still Blackhand, the ideal puppet precisely because he did not realize he was one such. And while the horde was now infused with the blood of demons, and craved violence and destruction more than meat and drink, they had not gotten out of control, at least not yet. He would summon the council to meet in their beautiful black temple. Doubtless they, too, 
would be searching for ways to salvage what power was left. Yes, there was still the Shadow Council. The land is dead, Duratan said quietly as he stood with his old friend surveying what had once been verdant meadows and foothills. Duratan scuffed at the dirt with his boot. Powdery sand and rock were revealed as he kicked away the dead yellow grass. Wind, no longer blocked by trees, whistled past them. Ogrim said nothing for a long time. His eyes told him Duratan was right. He looked to the riverbed where he and Duratan had swum in one of their many challenges and saw no hint that water had ever flowed in it. What water remained in the land was filthy, clogged with animal corpses and sediment. To drink it was to risk illness. Not to drink was to die. No water, no grasses. Here and there were places that still managed to survive, such as the Terracar Forest, ancestors knew how. The orcs were growing thin, for no grasses meant no herd animals. The last three years had seen more orcish deaths from starvation and disease than from the battles against the Drenai. More than the land is dead, Ogrim said at last. His voice was thick and heavy. He turned to face Duratan. How is the Frost Wolf's grain supply? To his eyes, he and Duratan looked green. Next to others, such as Grom and Blackhand, they still were more brown than green, but the damage was being done. Duratan had theorized that it was the warlock powers that were doing this to them and their world. Certainly those who had directly drunk whatever potion Gul'dan had concocted for them were a more vivid hue than others. Strange, Ogrim thought. There was irony in that while the land turned brown when it should be green, the orcs turned green when they should be brown. Duratan grimaced. Several barrels were stolen in the attacks. Which clan? Shattered Hand. Ogrim nodded. The Frostwolf clan was bearing the brunt of the recent flurry of attacks. After the Horde had taken Shadrath, sightings of the Drenai had dwindled. It had been a full six months since anyone had reported even glimpsing one of the elusive, blue-skinned beings let alone killing one. Duratan had made the Frostwolf clan a clear target when he refused to drink from the chalice the night Shatrath fell. And even before then, his reluctance to attack the Drenai had not gone unnoticed. Now that the Drenai, the only focus the orcs had as an outlet for their vastly increased bloodlust, were becoming scarce, many felt that somehow Duratan was responsible. Never mind that it was quite likely that the Drenai had simply been hunted to extinction, that the initial goal of wiping them off the face of the earth had been achieved. I will bring some next time I see you, Ogrim said. I will not take charity. If my clan were in your position, you would beat me nearly senseless and shove the food down my throat rather than let me refuse it, Ogrim said. Duratan laughed and seemed surprised that he did so. Ogrim let himself grin. For a moment, if he could ignore the dead land around them, the unnatural hue of their skins, it was as if the horrors of the intervening years had not happened. Then Duratan's laughter faded, and the present returned. For the sake of the children, I will accept it. He turned his head, again looking out over the wasteland. New names were cropping up, harsher names, darker names. The Citadel was becoming known as the Hellfire Citadel, the entire area, the Hellfire Peninsula. The destruction of the Drenai will lead to that of the Orcs as well, if something is not done, Duratan said. We are turning against each other, stooping to stealing food from the mouths of children because the land is so wounded it can no longer nourish us. The demons capering at the heels of the warlocks can destroy and torment, but they cannot heal or feed the starving. Ogrim asked in a low voice, as anyone tried to work with the elements. Such activities were still forbidden, but Ogrim knew that desperation was causing some to rethink the old ways. Duratan nodded. It was a failure. We have been met with stony silence. Demons guard Ashugan. We can find no hope there. Then we are finished, Ogrim said quietly. He glanced down at his hammer, its shaft leaning against his leg as they stood. He wondered if the prophecy of the Doomhammer was being fulfilled even now, if he was the last of his line. Had he already brought salvation and then doom by using this weapon to drive the Drenai to extinction? And how could it possibly be used now to bring justice? 
when all was dying, how could everything change again? The will to survive was powerful, Gul'dan thought as he readied himself for sleep. He had taken to sleeping in the Black Temple, in a room he had had redesigned specifically for him. In it, he placed in a ritualized fashion all the trinkets and tools he needed to properly command the demons he summoned, shards from the Drenai souls, certain stones for the larger creatures, potions to help him keep his energy up when it flagged. There were skulls, too, and bones, and other signs of dominance. Certain herbs were burned in containers, their pungent or sweet aroma inducing visions. It was to a jar of such that he turned to now. He had lit a small fire in a cauldron and permitted the wood to burn down to glowing embers. Chanting softly, Gul'dan tossed the dried leaves on the fire and forced himself not to cough as the scent filled the air. He went to his bed. He liked to think that perhaps this was the same bed upon which the loathed Balan slept when he was in the temple and quickly fell asleep. Gul'dan dreamed, as he had not done since Kil'jaeden's departure, and even while in the strange, dark place that was the vision, he knew it to be true. The vision was that of a vaguely orc-shaped being, dressed in a long cloak that obscured his face. He was slender, even more slender than an orc female, but somehow Gul'dan immediately sensed that it was a male. Delicately built as he seemed to Gul'dan's eyes, the sense of power that radiated from the stranger all but buffeted Gul'dan. A shiver shook him. When the stranger spoke in his mind, the voice was masculine, oddly pleasant, and profoundly compelling. You are feeling adrift, and alone, said the stranger. Gul'dan nodded, cautious and eager at the same time. Kill Jaden promise you power, strength, godhood. Things that your world has never even seen, continued the smooth voice from a mouth that remained hidden in the shadow of the cloak's hood. The words caressed Gul'dan, lulled him, and frightened him at the same time. But he felt more angry than frightened as he spoke. He abandoned me, Gul'dan said. He caused us to ruin our world, and then left us to die with it. If you come from him, then... Nay, nay, soothed the stranger in that oddly compelling voice. I come from one even greater. His eyes glittered, deep within the shadow of the hooded cloak. I come from his master. Gul'dan's skin prickled, his master, and he fell back as his mind was assaulted with images, images of Kil Jaden and Valen and Archimond, as they were so long ago. He saw the transformation of beings known as Eridar into monsters and demigods, and he sensed, though never saw, a great presence behind it all. Sargeras. He still could not see the stranger's face, but Gul'dan knew that he smiled. Yes the one who rules over all, the one we serve. You will soon understand, Gul'dan, that destruction and oblivion are beautiful and pure, that it is the direction in which all things must go. You can resist it and be destroyed, or aid it and be rewarded. Cautiously, still worried about this cloaked figure and his honeyed words, Gul'dan asked, What is being asked of me? Your people are dying, the figure said bluntly. There is nothing left in this world for them to destroy. There is nothing left for them to survive on. They must go elsewhere, where there is ample food and drink, and worthy prey to slaughter. The orcs hunger now for so, so much more than food. Give them the blood they crave. Gul'dan narrowed his eyes. That sounds like a reward, not a task to which I am set, he said. It is both, but that is not the only reward my master offers. You rule the Shadow Council, and you have tasted power. You are the greatest warlock that exists among your people, and you know how that fills you. Imagine if you were a god. Gul'dan trembled. Such had been promised before, but somehow, he knew that this Sargeras was much better able to fulfill such extravagant vows. He thought of extending a hand and making the earth tremble, of clenching it hard and stopping a heart. He thought of the eyes of thousands trained upon him, their voices raw from shouting his name. He thought of tastes and sensations he could not yet even imagine, and his mouth watered. We have a mutual foe, the stranger continued. I would see them dead, and you would see your people sated with slaughter and killing. 
and now Galdan could make out just the barest of hint of features, of pale skin and a thin-lipped mouth framed by black hair that curved in a smile. It is a partnership that would benefit us both. Indeed, Galdan breathed. He realized that he was moving toward the stranger as if drawn, then stopped and added, but I cannot believe that this is all you would ask of me. The stranger sighed. Sargeras will give you all this and more, only. He lies imprisoned. He needs assistance to escape. His body is trapped in an ancient tomb, lost beneath a rolling ocean of darkness. He hungers for his freedom, the power that once was his to express, and your orcs hunger for bloodshed as you hunger for power. Bring your orcs to this verdant, unspoiled new world. Give them soft flesh into which their axes can bite. Defeat the denizens of this place. Strengthen your people. And with this vast green tide of warriors, join me in liberating our master. His gratitude. Again the sly smile. The glint of white teeth in the beard. And again that powerful buffet of power. Mitigated only by the stranger's will. Well, it is likely beyond even your imaginings, Galdan. Goldan considered. As he thought, the image of the stranger shifted and faded. Goldan gasped as he stood in a beautiful meadow, the wind tussling his braided hair. Beasts he had never seen before grazed their fill. Strange beings, similar to orcs but with pinkish skin, as slender as a stranger, tended fields and livestock. Perfect. The image shifted again. Suddenly he was underwater, swimming down, his lungs not burning for air despite the depth. Kelp swayed in the current, obscuring but not entirely hiding tumbled columns and a slab that bore strange writing, eroded somewhat by time and the ceaseless, gentle caress of water. A shudder passed through him as he realized that this was where Sargeras lay, release him from this prison, and then, and then. It seemed like a good partnership. Anything would be better than staying here in this world which would mean a slow death. A beautiful, ripe land, ready for plunder, but all by itself make this bargain worthwhile. And there was so, so much more to come. He gazed at the stranger raptly. Tell me what to do. Galdan awoke sprawled on the floor. Beside him on the cold stone was a parchment covered with instructions, written in his own hand. He scanned it quickly. Portal. Azeroth. Humans. Mediv. Goldan began to smile. Chapter 22 Can a thing be at once a blessing and a curse, a salvation and a doom? For such I hold what happened next in the history of my people. From every account, the demonic energies, used so freely and with no heed given as to their cost, leached all that was wholesome and life-giving from the world of Drenor. Kil'jean had wanted to increase the number of orcs, so that we would become a formidable army, and he had done so, forcing the growth of our younglings and robbing them of their childhood. Now, the orc population was larger than it had ever been, and there was no way to feed the hungry. It is clear to me, as it must have been clear to those living through those terrible times, that if we had remained on Drenor, our race likely would have died out. But how we left? And why we left this world still bleeds from the wound of that. I do what I can to heal while still safeguarding the interests of this new horde I have made, but I wonder if these wounds will ever really close. Life for my people, a blessing. How we obtained it, a curse. The Shadow Council had been nervous, almost as worried sick as Gul'dan had been at Kil'jaden's departure, but now they had a direction. He called the council and shared with them the words of the mysterious stranger who called himself Mediv. He spoke of the fertile fields, clean water, healthy, glossy-coated prey animals, and he spoke even more glowingly of the beings called humans, who would fight enough to be a challenge, but who would inevitably fall to the superiority of the horde. Water, food, killing, empower to those who agreed to help bring it about, Galdan said his voice seductive, almost purring. He had gauged them correctly, their eyes, some red and glowing, some still brown and intense, were focused on him, and he saw hope and greed on their faces. 
the work began. First, they had to redirect the attention of the starving horde. Gul'dan was well aware that, with decreasing food supplies and a burning thirst for violence that no longer had an outlet, the orcs had started attacking one another. He had Blackhand send out decrees to all the clans, submitting their finest warriors for controlled, one-on-one -on -one or small party fights in public display. The winners would receive food from the losing clan and a supply of pure water as well as honor and fame. Frantic for something, anything, to ease the pain of their dual hunger, for food and for blood. The orcs responded well to the suggestion and Gul'dan was relieved. Mendiv wanted an army to attack the humans. It would not do if all the orcs had slaughtered one another before the invasion. Duratan continued to give him trouble. The leader of the Frostwolf clan, likely emboldened by the fact that Gul'dan did not cut him down the night of the attack on Shatterath, had begun speaking out more publicly. He decried the stage battles as demeaning. He called for a way to try to heal the land, stopping just short of directly blaming the warlocks for it. In other words, he danced as close to the line as was possible, and sometimes crossed it. And, as had always been the case, some were listening. While the Frostwolf clan was the only one whose leader had not drunk the blood of Manoroth, there were other orcs in lower positions who had also refused. The one who worried Gul'dan the most was Ogrim Doomhammer. That one could be trouble. Ogrim had never much liked Blackhand. One day, he might do something about that dislike. But for the moment, he did not side publicly with the Frostwolves, and indeed was one of the regular visitors in the champion battles. The visions continued. Mediv had a very clear idea of what he wanted. A portal between the two worlds. One that could be created with the Shadow Council and his warlocks on one side, and Mediv and whatever magics he was controlling on his side. They could not work in secret. The portal would have to be large enough in order for the armies Mediv wanted to pass through. Besides, the Horde was feeling defeated. The excitement and challenge of the arena battles and constructing this portal with high ceremony would give them something to focus on. Mediv was pleased with the idea. In one vision, he assumed the form of a large black bird, perching on Gul'dan's arms. Claws dug into his flesh, and reddish-black blood trickled across the green skin. But the pain felt good. There was a small piece of paper rolled up around the bird's leg. In his vision, Gul'dan unrolled the paper and saw a design that took his breath away. When he awoke, he sketched it onto a large piece of parchment. He surveyed it, eyes bright with anticipation. Beautiful, he said. I do not understand your displeasure, Ogrim said one day, as he and Duratan sat atop their mounts to survey the building of what Gul'dan called the portal. Everywhere Duratan looked, orcs were working. The males were bare to the waist, the females nearly so, and their green skins glistened with sweat underneath the sun that scorched the land. Some of them chanted rhythmic war cries as they worked. Others were focused and silent. The road to this plateau, running in an almost straight line from what was starting to become known as the Hellfire Citadel, was already paved so that construction equipment could be easily moved. The shapes of the four large platforms were based on Drenai design. The irony did not escape Duratan. The original design had been modified, crowned with the now familiar spikes and sharp edges that were starting to make orc architecture distinctive. But Duratan could remember walking up similar steps as a boy, and walking up those steps again with the intent of killing all he found atop them. Two obelisks pointed to the sky like sharp spears and the statue of Gul'dan sat atop another one. But most forbidding of all was the fourth, set a little way back from the other three. This was to be the framework for the actual portal that Gul'dan kept promising them would manifest. Two huge slabs of stone towered into the air, a third lying across them to make the most primitive of gateways. Shapes were starting to appear out of the rock, looming shapes of cowled figures on either side, and some sort of serpent undulated atop of it. Is this not better than having them ride into your camp and slaughter your clansmen? Ogrim continued. Duratan nodded. Yes, in a way, he said. But we still do not know what this is a portal to. Ogrim gestured at the surrounding landscape. The Hellfire Peninsula was one of the most damaged areas of the world, but far from the only one. 
does it matter? We know what it is a portal from. Duritan grunted with a hint of amusement. I suppose you're right at that. He felt Ogram's gray eyes regarding him steadily. Duritan, I have refrained from asking you this, but why did you refuse your clan the draft Galvan offered? Duritan looked at his friend, answering one question with another. Why did you yourself not drink, he countered. There was something not right, Ogram said at last. I did not like what I saw it doing to the others. Duritan shrugged, hoping his friend would not press the point. You had the same insight as I did. I wonder, said Ogram, but he did not question further. Duritan saw no need to reveal what he knew. He had managed to protect his people from the horrors of what drinking demonic blood would do to them. He had asserted himself to Galdan, and thus far, no repercussions had fallen. And Ogram, ancestors to be praised, had had wisdom enough to realize that there was something amiss, and had also declined. For now, that was enough for Duritan, son of Garad, chieftain of the Frostwolf clan. I fight today, Ogram said, changing the subject. Will you come? I know that you do this not for glory, but for your clan, Duritan said. You fight to win them food and water. But I will not show my face at these displays. Orcs should not be fighting orcs, not even in ritualized combat. Ogram sighed. You have not changed, Duritan. You were ever afraid of me defeating you. There was a hint of mirth in his voice. Duritan turned, and for the first time in many, many long months, grinned with a genuine warmth. The day had come. All night, while a ring of warlocks stood guard, lest a curious onlooker witness the dark ritual. Several stone masons had been hard at work carving the final seal into the portal's base. Once they had finished, wiping their sweaty brows and turning to smile at one another, they had been quickly slain. The blood of those who had created the seal would prime it. Galdan had been informed by Mediv. Galdan had no reason to doubt his new ally's wisdom, but the luckless masons would not be the last to die here. The dawn was a fiery one, crimson and orange, and the air was thick and stale. While the portal was being completed over the last several days, other tasks had been finished as well. The war machines that had so devastated Shatterath several months earlier now were again pressed into service, repaired, oiled, and tested. Armor that had been neglected was polished. Swords were sharpened, dents hammered out of chest pieces and helms. The great orcish army that had so decimated the Drenai was being reformed. Some clans had been requested to remain behind. Gul'dan had done his best to convince the chieftains of the Shattered Hand, Shadowmoon, Thunderlord, Bleeding Hollow, and Laughing Skull clans that they were needed here. Grom and the Warsong had been particularly hard to convince to remain. For a moment, as the chieftain raged at him, Gul'dan wondered if he had done the right thing in letting Hellscream drink the demon blood. More than most, he seemed to have little control over his emotions, despite Gul'dan's flattery about how valuable Grom was to him and how he needed him here. It was Grom's wildness and unpredictability that made Gul'dan want him to stay behind. He could not risk Grom getting some mad idea into his head and defying orders. Mediv would not like that. He would not like that at all. Blackhand had requested that the entire horde gather at the Hellfire Citadel. Over the last few days, several who had returned to their ancestral lands, the Frostwolf clan among them, had trickled in and camped in the area. They had obeyed the order to arm themselves as if they were going into battle, although few of them understood exactly what was going on. They assembled, clan by clan. Each clan wore their traditional colors in the form of a decorative sash or belt over their armor, and on this hot, windy day, their banners snapped proudly. Gul'dan and Ner'zhul watched the assembly. Gul'dan turned to his former mentor. You and your clan will be among those staying behind, he said shortly. Ner'zhul nodded, almost meekly. So I assumed, he said. He did not say much these days, which was just as well with Gul'dan. He had half suspected that the older orc would try to wrest control from him after Kil'jaeden had abandoned them, but apparently Ner'zhul was too crushed to even do that. Gul'dan thought with contempt about the time, not so long ago, when he had idolized, even envied Ner'zhul. 
How foolish he had been then. He had grown and learned, even from the bitterness of deception. Although there were times when he thought he caught the faint glimmer of something in Erzul's eyes, as now. He looked sharply at the other orc, and decided it was just a trick of the light. He returned his attention to the assembling clans and smiled. Even though his designs went far beyond simple bloodletting, he could not help but be stirred at the sight. They were glorious. The scorching sun glinted on their armor, their banners waving in the wind, their green faces shining with anticipation. If all was as Medivh promised, this could be the turning point to greatness. The drums began, deep, primal. They shuddered along the earth, through stone, into the bones of the horde. Many of them threw back their heads and howled as they began to march, falling naturally into step with one another, again a unified people. Gul'dan made no move to hurry. Once they were all assembled at the portal, he would be magically transported there by another warlock. He could enjoy watching the parade of his army march down the wide, paved road to the portal. Standing in front of the portal was a Drenai child. Where had they found it? Duritan had not so much as glimpsed a Drenai in months, nor had anyone else. They must have considered it great good luck to have found any Drenai, let alone a youngling. They were in front of the crowd, standing next to the Thunderlord clan and the Dragonmaw clan. The portal gate had been finished and looked both beautiful and terrifying. Two cloaked figures, whose eyes glowed red either from magic or clever technology, flanked the opening. A carved serpentine creature curled about the top, its maw gaping open, showing pointed, carved teeth. It extended sharp, lizard-like claws that had ridges along its long neck and body. Duritan had never seen anything like this, and briefly wondered how such an image had occurred to the Masons. A nightmare, possibly. He grimaced. All in all, it was a formidable construction. But he barely only registered the skill that had gone into its creation. His eyes were transfixed on the young Drenai. He looked so terribly small next to the enormous arch, small and thin and bruised. He stared vacantly at the sea of orcs who were bellowing at him, so far beyond terror that he obviously felt nothing. What are they going to do with it? Draka wondered aloud. Duritan shook his head. I fear the worst, he said. She stared at him. I saw some killing of children in battle, she said. The bloodlust was upon them. I could not condone it, but I could see how it could happen. But surely they will not make a ritual sacrifice out of this child. I hope you are right, said Duritan. But he could see no other reason for the small figure to be present. If such were the case, he could not stand by. He did not want to risk harm to his clan, so he prayed he was wrong. The warlocks were chanting something now, and to Duritan's amazement, Gul'dan appeared right before their eyes. The horde murmured, and Gul'dan smiled benevolently at them. Today is a glorious day for the orcs, he cried. You have all seen this portal being built, admired the craftsmanship, and how it stands as a monument to the glory of the horde. Now, I will reveal to you the visions I have had. He pointed at the gate, far, far away in a land called Azeroth. I have an ally. He offers us his land. It is green and lush, filled with pure water and fat creatures to hunt. Best of all, we will continue to exult in the glory of bloodshed. A race called humans, the enemy of our ally, will try to stop us from taking their lands. We will destroy them. Their dark blood will flow freely upon our swords. As we have destroyed the Drenai, so now we will destroy the humans. A cheer went up. Draka shook her head in disbelief. How can they still feel this way? Can they not see this new land will suffer as ours has if we continue on this path? Duritan nodded his agreement, but at the same time, there is no choice. We need food, water. We must go through this portal. Draka sighed, seeing the logic, but not liking it. Even now, our ally is working to open the portal on his side, and now we will begin." He gestured to the little Drenai captive. Blood is a pure offering to those who give us these vast powers, and the blood of a child is purer still. With the life fluid of our enemies, we will open the portal and step into a glorious new world, a new page in the history of the Horde. He approached the bound child, who looked up at him with empty eyes. Gul'dan raised a jeweled dagger 
He glinted in the sunlight. No. The word was ripped from Duratan's lips. Everyone turned to stare at him. He surged forward. If this new venture was to be opened by the blood of an innocent child, no good could come of it. He did not make it three steps before he was tackled and went down hard on the sun-baked earth. The instant it happened, he heard Draka utter her war cry and the clang of metal on metal as she charged. Chaos erupted. He struggled to his feet and beheld the crumpled form of the child. Blue blood spurted from his slashed throat. Gul'dan, what have you done to us? Duratan shrieked, but its protest was lost in the roar of the enraged mob of orcs. The frost wolves had sprung into action to defend their chieftain, and the shouts of battle were almost deafening. Duratan's breath was knocked out of his lungs as his attacker, he could not tell from what clan, resumed the fight. In defense, Duratan lifted his axe and swung. The other dodged, moving more swiftly than Duratan had expected, came up, and the tenor of cries abruptly changed as the earth rumbled beneath their feet and a deep, piercing sound shuddered along their bones. The fighting stopped as one of the orcs turned to gaze at the portal. Moments before, one could look into the area outlined by the pillars and simply see more of the Hellfire Peninsula landscape. Now there was a blackness and a swirl of stars, as if one were looking into the night sky gone mad. Even Duratan's eyes were riveted on the sight. As he watched, the blackness shimmered and reformed itself into a scene that both startled and puzzled him. Gul'dan had spoken of a beautiful land, rich with fat prey beasts, fertile fields, and blue skies. Duratan was indeed looking at a place he had never seen before, but it was a far cry from the idyllic realm Gul'dan had described. It was as moist as Drenor was now arid. A thick haze floated above brackish water and swaying marshland grasses. A buzzing, chirping sound filled the air. At least, thought Duratan, there was life in this strange place. Unhappy murmurs ran through the crowd. This was where Gul'dan wanted to send them. It was not much better on first glance than their own land. But then again, Duratan realized water meant life. Orange though the sky was, not blue, and drenched though the land was, not filled with flowers and meadows, it could support life. He turned to look at Gul'dan as the murmuring rose in volume. Gul'dan was obviously trying to cover his own shock. He waved his arms for silence. Azeroth is a large world, as is our own, he cried. You know how different the land can be from place to place. I am certain it is the same here. This place does not look as inviting as I was. His voice trailed off, and he shook himself, visibly recovering. But behold, this is, in truth, another land. It is real. You, Gul'dan pointed at two dozen fully armored orcs who stood beside the portal. They snapped to attention. You have been chosen to be the first to investigate this new land. Go forth in the name of the Horde. The orcs hesitated only an instant, then grimly ran forward into the portal. The scene vanished. Duratan's head whipped around to stare at Gul'dan. The warlock was doing his best to stay composed, but clearly he had been rattled. They are the scouts, Gul'dan said. They will return with news of this world. And before the gathered orcs could truly begin to grow worried, the image of the swamp reappeared and the orcs hurried through. They were grinning from ear to ear. More than half of them carried the carcasses of large animals. One was a reptile of some sort, scaly, long-tailed, with stubby legs and a huge jaw. The other was a four-legged, furry thing, with claws on all four of its feet, a long tail, small rounded ears, and spots on its yellow, glossy coat. Both were obviously healthy specimens. We have slain and eaten both types of creatures, the leader of the scout said. Their flesh is wholesome. The water there is pure. We do not need a beautiful land. We need one that will feed and sustain us. This Azeroth will do so admirably, Gul'dan. A murmur went through the crowd. Despite himself, Duratan felt his gaze drawn to the beast the scouts had brought through and his stomach growled. It had been two days since he had last eaten. Gul'dan visibly relaxed. He looked over at Duratan, and his eyes narrowed. Duratan tasted apprehension, sharp and bitter, in his throat. He and his clan were needed. He knew that. He also knew that his defense of the child, and the reaction it had provoked among the other clans, many of whom 
had come to the defense of the Frost Wolves would not be forgotten. He had half suspected that Gul'dan would order his execution or banishment, but apparently Duratan and the Frost Wolves yet had some use to Gul'dan and Blackhand. So be it. For now, he would fight alongside his brethren. Tomorrow would have to take care of itself. Whatever betided, Duratan knew he would die with his honor intact. Gul'dan looked back over the crowd of expectant orcs and took a deep breath. This is the moment of destiny, he said. On the other side, a new beginning awaits. A new enemy to slaughter. You can feel it, can you not? The bloodlust rising. Follow Blackhand. Listen to his orders, and you will rule this new world, as is your right. It's your world on the other side of the portal. Take it. The cries were deafening. The crowd surged forward. Even Duratan found himself caught up in the thrill of the new world, so lush and ripe and ready for the taking. Perhaps his worry was misplaced. Perhaps this would indeed be a new beginning. Duratan loved his clan, loved his people, and wanted to see them thrive. And he, like all orcs even before this moment, reveled in the kill. Perhaps it would all be well. Axe in hand, hope flourishing in his heart, Duratan joined in the race toward the portal toward this place called Azeroth. He lifted his arms and raised the cry that was on the lips of every orc as they surged forward. For the Horde! Epilogue And so began our people's history in this world of Azeroth. We thundered out of the portal like death incarnate, a torrent of blood-mad killers intent on slaughter. It is little wonder the humans hate us so, many of them even now. But perhaps this history I have chronicled will one day be read by human, elven, gnomish, and dwarven eyes. Perhaps they will understand a little better that we, too, knew suffering and victimization. My father's suspicion that he and his clan were marked for exile proved correct. It was shortly after the Frostwolf clan entered Azeroth that Gul'dan banished them. They were forced to make their homes in the harshness of the mountains of Alterac. The white wolves who still hunt in this place are descended from the frost wolves who followed my clan through the portal, and whose loyalty cannot be swayed by the words of one who bore a grudge. When I was born, my father realized he had to tell the other orcs all he knew about what had been done to them. He approached his old friend, Ogrim Doomhammer, who believed him and would have allied with him had my father not been treacherously slain. When I reached adulthood, I became Ogrim's friend as had my father before, and it is I who have fulfilled the prophecy of the Doomhammer. In their honor, this land is named Duratar, its greatest city, Ogrimmar. It is my hope that, my chieftain, the deep, rough voice belonged to Eterig. Thrall stopped in mid-sentence, moving the pen so it did not drip on the parchment. What is it? he asked the elderly orc, who was one of his most trusted advisors. There is news. News from the Alliance. One of our information gatherers has learned something he insists you must know. Thrall disliked the term spy, but he had spies nonetheless, as he was certain Jaina Proudmore had her spies in his land. It was to be expected, and was often worthwhile. Seldom had one of his gatherers insisted on seeing him like this. Something important must be happening indeed. Show him in, and leave us, he said. Etrig nodded, and a moment later, a small, scrawny, nondescript human male was brought in. He looked exhausted, undernourished, and terrified. Thrall rose to his full imposing height without thinking, then realized he might intimidate the human. Will you take food or drink? he asked, keeping his voice gentle. The spy shook his head, then amended. Water, if you please, in a voice that cracked. The war chief himself poured a goblet and handed it to the man, who gulped thirstily, then wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. My thanks, war chief, the spy said, sounding a bit calmer. Your news, Thrall said. The man paled. Thrall sighed inwardly. He would never be so brutal or so foolish as to kill a messenger for bringing bad news. Such behavior merely resulted in no one's wanting to serve as a messenger. He smiled in what he hoped was a reassuring fashion. Do not fear. Your news, good or ill, is welcome if it aids me in protecting my people, he said. 
The man looked slightly less distressed. He took a deep breath. My lord, he said. He hesitated and continued grimly. The Drenai have come to Azeroth. Thrall was puzzled. He exchanged glances with Ederig, who shrugged. Some Drenai have been in Azeroth for years, he said. They are nicknamed the Lost Ones. We know about them. This is not news, friend. The man looked stricken. You don't understand, he said urgently. Not those pathetic creatures, Drenai. There, there was a ship from the skies. It crashed like an infernal stone two nights ago. Thrawn hailed swiftly. No one had missed seeing that strange object in the night sky, looking like a star crashing to earth. So, it had not been a star, nor even an infernal. It had been a vessel. The man was still talking. Rodmore has agreed to aid them. There is one among them, pale, noble, his presence commanding, though he is not physically strong. They call him Velen. Thrall stared. The Drenai, the Prophet Velen, here. He sank slowly in his chair as a full significance struck him. The worst enemy the orcs had ever known had come to Azeroth, had been welcomed into the Alliance. How could there possibly be peace between the Horde and Alliance now? Ancestors, save us, Thrall whispered. 